The following is a copy of a letter that the NY police found in a house that was raided in Jersey on March 5th, 2002. It reads as follows. So here I am, hiding in the backyard of an abandoned house four suburbs away from anything that even remotely resembles home. Just me and my friend. She's severely wounded, I'm all scratched up, being too afraid to leave out of fear they might find us. I'm hearing the ruckus among the neighboring houses of this street now. The whistling is getting louder and I'm afraid. It's only a matter of time until we are surrounded. We should keep moving but without any resources, and as torn up as we are now, we would never make it. Someone once said that humans fight and try to kill anything they are afraid of. Sadly, it's more of a shoot first. Ask questions later approach with them. Me and my pack of werewolves never considered this when we moved into the big city. We believed most people mind their own business, and if we didn't harm anyone, we could live normal lives and never be disturbed. Raw meat always seemed to curb the lust for flesh and whenever we had a chance, we would go hunting. We'd go camp in the woods for weeks. I am Eric. I lived a fairly normal life. I graduated high school with my friends. I was born a werewolf. It runs in my bloodline. I only realized it when I turned 18 when I started feeling different. That summer I turned the first time. It was horrifying. Upon doing some research, I found out this was a bloodline from my dad's side. He had been killed when I was very young. My mom said it was a car accident. Yet, I still wanted to live a normal life. I couldn't ever hurt anyone. I moved to America to attend college and went to a college in New Jersey. The circumstances aligned and that's where Alicia sniffed me out. She was a werewolf as well, who was part of a pack that lived a normal life. I befriended her and we became inseparably close in a matter of days. Alicia introduced me to the rest of her friends. Derek, April, Keegan, Dwight, Stephanie, and Kevin. There is always a Kevin. Alicia was our alpha. We loved and trusted her. She took great care of us. Alicia spent a lot of time helping me make my transitions easier and adapting to my new life. She was so patient with me. I was so lucky to find a pack that believed what I believed and yet could survive. Life was simple. We never had any problems and went under the radar. This all changed one night in autumn when one of new guys we had befriended, Trent, went wild. He roamed free out of the confines of the campground that was secluded and wound up attacking innocent people near the river 30 miles away. He killed and ate about 10 people that night. Most conspiracy theories arise from witnesses who escape and tell others. First, they seem crazy. Then someone else pops up with a video until, whilst remaining silent about it, the city officials act softly and without hesitation. They never listen to any potential objective points that may prove anyone innocent, and as it happens, most of us innocent get punished for one wicked individual. People stand trial while the beasts get beheaded. Anyway, we needed to continue living our lives and stay in the background to avoid suspicion. We didn't realize the city officials had been through this several times with the more dangerous of our species, and knew how to catch us. We were naive. We thought there was no way a human could find us without us exposing ourselves to them. We also thought that they would be open to reason, but protective instincts have never proven to investigate before attack. All our predecessors have made the rumor of werewolves who don't eat humans a myth. Alicia recons that if we were human, we would have done the same thing, and we need to understand their point of view. It's only to protect themselves rather safe than sorry, rather kill the beast to protect your people than to have regrets. Unbeknownst to us, we continued going to school. The first week was calm. Everything was normal. Everything except for these weird high-pitched whistles we would hear. They were quite far away, but the closer they got, the more we felt them in our bones. Everything went fine until Kevin went missing. I have no idea where he went. We couldn't get hold of his family, but Alicia did not want to jump to any conclusion. She had faith, so we continued our routine to avoid suspicion. Another member of our pack disappeared and she had to face the fact that this was suspicious. We all wanted to run. She didn't believe in running. She believed time would prove we were innocent. She'd always say that if one part of the world didn't like us and we ran, what would stop it from happening again? We had to prove we weren't enemies, whether it was by living normal lives or facing the authorities head on and proving our innocence no matter how long it takes. That's what we all wanted. 
we wanted to be treated as citizens. Humans murder each other too. Every day you hear about serial killers, massacres, robbery, and even cannibalism. Those people get tried within the confines of the government, and the innocent get protected and treated like your model citizen. Why couldn't it be the same for us? None of us knew what the city officials already knew. Maybe knowing that would have changed everything and saved my friends in time. That same week there was a full moon, we needed to go to our camping grounds, and so we did. Our part of the forest was far from the river. Nobody went there because of wild animals. Around 2 a.m. there was a horrible noise that penetrated my organs. I felt it before I even woke up. The police came out of nowhere with their weapons firing. First shot, Stephanie was out. She didn't move, she didn't heal. That's when we knew they had discovered something that could kills us. Derek screamed, he loved Steph. He ran to her and got shot too. He also didn't move. The bullets were so powerful, one shot took his head clean off. I had no idea. I could be so afraid of humans. Alicia looked at me with blood streaming down her eyes and ears screaming, run. That was a difficult task, but the rest of us did and tried not to look back. As we ran, our friends were slowly caught, shot one by one until only me, Alicia, and Dwight were left. We ran until we thought we were safe. We got cornered a few times on the way. Alicia got scraped by a bullet on her leg, and I got hit by a car passing. With all our cuts and bruises, we jumped a few houses, running through the yards and over the fences until we found this abandoned house in the suburbs. We had been hiding for a few hours when we started hearing them in the streets. I could hear the whistling get closer. Without hesitation, Dwight ran out and pulled off a distraction. I heard the gunshots, and I knew he was gone. He had temporarily swayed them, sacrificing his life in the process. This is something we would all have done for Alicia, our Alpha. I'd happily go next. We have to run, said Alicia. I have no strength left. I'm tired and we are hurt. We can't continue much longer. I left this letter so you can understand our story, our journey, and who we are, so that maybe you might empathize with us or at the very least believe that some werewolves are good and won't hurt you. Maybe the next time you would find another way so that not so many innocent beasts would get hurt. We were always willing to cooperate. You don't need to be afraid. We are innocent. We never hurt anyone. If you find this letter, we are either gone or dead. But if you see us, please don't shoot. End of letter. The particular individual responsible for this letter was never found. Back then, there were no cell phones or computers to entertain every kid. They had to use their creativity and more practical games to have fun. Corey was no different. He was a very imaginative kid and spent his days talking about fantasy worlds, movies, and books with his classmates. That and playing ball. My son had an amazing throw. You wouldn't think it was a kid's arm that chucked an object judging by the force. We haven't played ball in a while, but to be honest, I don't think I could keep up with him at my age. Corey grew up to be something of a giant. He got it from his mother's side. I am certainly not that big. Anyhow, at some point the entire town was talking about some ape man lurking around at night with shining bright flashy eyes. Nobody knew what the hell that the thing was. Some people thought it might be Bigfoot or a Yeti or something. I personally never took it seriously. I thought it might be some bear running around looking for food or just some drunk stumbling around. I assumed the flashy eyes were just an invention of some passionate storytelling. At some point, the kids picked up on that thing too, and it was all the rage. Kids spoke about a great human-like shadow walking around their windows at night. Others claimed they've met the creature or had spoken to it. Apparently, Beaton's kid called the thing a talking gorilla. While some people were getting concerned, most of us didn't get too bothered with childish imagination and conspiracy theories. No one was getting hurt, so none of us adults ever bothered checking what was behind the sightings. One morning, Corey came to have breakfast and said that the ape man was actually a werewolf. I asked him why he decided it was a werewolf, so he told me he watched it from his window. The creature showed up at night, and its bright eyes shone at my son, waking him up. Looking at the window, he saw a strange creature covered in hair with its back turned to his window. He said the creature was moving its arms back and forth near its legs before howling and running off into the darkness. 
My wife wasn't too pleased with my son being awake in the middle of the night. I thought it was probably just some local fauna that caught Corey's attention. Corey wouldn't stop talking about the supposed werewolf for months. Werewolf this, werewolf that. He tried to convince his friends that the strange creature was a werewolf, which led to a fight between a few of them. It was getting tiresome to hear constantly about this werewolf, but what could we do? The kid had an active imagination. Some kind of wildlife was roaming around our small town at night. The kid thought it was a mythical beast. What do we do? Catch the animal to prove him otherwise? We let him have his fun. One day he asked me, Dad, what should I do if the werewolf gets too close? I told him, you have a strong arm, just throw something at it and it'll run away from you. He smiled, thanked me and ran off to play with his friends that day. I thought little of it. Three days later, in the middle of the night, Corey comes to our bedroom and nudges me awake. Hey, Dad. Yeah, kiddo? I asked him, still half asleep. I caught the werewolf, he says, the glee obvious in his voice. Buddy, it's the middle of the night, you should go to bed. Just like the werewolf probably went to bed. I groaned, turning in my bed. He's in my room right now. I saw his bright eyes shining through the closet door. It... As he said that, I felt a knife twist itself in my chest. My whole body turned cold, and I bounced out of bed. He's never had his imaginary friends or monsters come over. This werewolf thing, no one ever said it showed up in their houses, just lurked around the windows at night. It began to click for me. Come on, Corey, show me this werewolf, I whispered, attempting to maintain my composure as I walked my son towards his room. My wife woke up and asked what had happened. I told her Corey put the werewolf to sleep. She raised a thumb in approval, smiled her beautiful smile and returned to her slumber. Corey and I walked straight up to his room. The door was wide open, a familiar sight caught my vision, a camera. My mind went into overdrive, his shining eye, singular. Every single time Corey mentioned a shining eye, it was one eye, a single eye, a lens. It wasn't an eye, it was a lens. Everything started making sense and my body tensed up. My stomach nodded and my heart was trying to break through my rib cage. I was so worried something had happened to my Corey. Son of a bitch, I muttered under my breath. The closet door was open ajar and Corey exclaimed pridefully, Look, I told you it's a werewolf. I stood there, confused, angry, and fearful. My mind was racing, my heart was struggling to follow, and my stomach was about to eject its contents through every orifice I had. I was losing touch with reality for a moment there. Corey's triumphant calls urging me to look at the fallen creature refocused my mind, but only for a second. Imagine my shock when I was a freakishly tall hairy man with a gigantic beard lying naked next to my son's bedroom with a pen stuck deep within his eye. I live in a small village called Mileham in Norfolk. It's a nice quiet place, but it doesn't have much going for it. Honestly, I rather I like it this way. I never grow tired of the scenic countryside beauty unblemished by the modern world. Milehem is the kind of place where everyone knows everyone. A one pub town, as they say. The area doesn't attract too many tourists, which again is fine by me. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's the thought of us trying to cater to strangers. No, I'm not xenophobic. If you want to visit Milehem, I'll gladly open my home to you. Hell, I'll even buy you a drink and spend the evening sharing stories. What I don't want are droves of tourists fluting the area and the village trying to remodel itself and build new establishments to accommodate. I live here because it's quiet. If I wanted to navigate through clusters of tourists taking selfies, I'd move to London. But I digress. Milham is and always will be my home. But there's one thing about it that disturbs me. One thing you won't find in the papers or in those little United Kingdom tourist pamphlets. We have a history of people who've exhibited a rather Strange set of behaviors. Aaron Cox. He was the latest victim of the affliction that has quietly plagued my village since the 1700s. No one knows exactly when it started, only that it's as much ingrained in our history as fibers are ingrained in a tapestry. 
It always starts the same way. Chickens go missing, cows are found mutilated, and then someone breaks. This time, Aaron was the one who broke. I found him naked in my field one night, staring up at the sky and howling at the full moon. He had a wild look in his eyes. I dared not approach him. Unsure of what to do, the village hadn't experienced this affliction since my parents' generation. I stood idly by and watched him from beyond an irrigation channel. Then, when the moon became masked behind a mass of clouds, he slowly walked away as though nothing had happened. At the time, I had hoped it was nothing but drunken shenanigans, but I became more concerned the next day when I saw his wife Elizabeth and asked if he'd gotten home all right. When I told her about the encounter, she grew more agitated. She dodged my questions, claimed he'd been out of town, and excused herself. Somehow, I had a feeling she knew more than she let on. That very same night, I heard the howling again. It echoed through the valley, giving the impression of multiple voices from different sources. Aaron was outside, staring up at the sky and waving his arms like a drowning man hailing a ship. He switched between mad laughter and eerie yowls, as though conversing with an unseen presence. I closed my shutters and tried to sleep, ignoring the ruckus outside. It only occurred to me in the morning to call his wife. When I finally did, she sounded flustered. She told me Aaron had come home that afternoon, said he'd acted perfectly normal, they'd gone to bed together, and in bed, they remained until the morning. The hairs at the back of my neck stood. Was she lying to me or was it the truth? If Aaron hadn't been in the field, then who had? That day I asked around town if anyone had gone missing and if anyone had heard or seen the man in my field, no one had. The Williams had lost a few chickens, but they blamed foxes. They'd found a spot in the chicken wire fence where claws or fangs had cut through to allow entry. These things happened. With nothing to go on, I gave up my search and returned to my chores. As I lay my head on my pillow, I heard a commotion coming from my barn. My cows were screaming. Have you ever heard the noise they make when you take their calves away? It's a kind of panicked, higher-pitched yowl you wouldn't ever hear in any other circumstance. Well, that was the sound they were making, only louder and more panicked. I threw on a robe, grabbed a flashlight, and ran out into my barn. One of my cows was sprawled out in the middle of the central aisle, her throat ripped open with a jagged, messy gash. She was still breathing, still trying to emit that scream, but her sounds were muffled and gurgled. I knelt down in front of her and gently caressed her heed to try and ease her pain. I wish it I owned a shotgun so I could have put her out of her misery. Then I heard the crackle of dry straw coming from her stall and a pathetic little whimper. I twisted my head towards her pen and saw the outline of something curled up in the corner. I shone my light towards it. Aaron Cox twitched as the beam of light hit him. His eyes glowed like those of a cat in the night, but he was otherwise normal. There was no fur, no claws, and no fangs. Just a scrawny man in his birthday suit. He let out a howl and bolted out of the pen on all fours, disappearing into the night to do God only knows what. I could hear his howls in the distance as I tended to my cow. Before long, I was pounding on the door of the Cox household. Elizabeth Cox answered. She looked tired, but her hair was still in place. She hadn't gone to bed. What's going on? I barked angrily. She smiled nervously, shifting her weight from foot to foot. I don't know what you're talking about. Are you all right? Like hell you don't. Where's Aaron or are you going to pretend he's in your bed again? I asked. She stiffened and gripped the hem of her shirt. Aaron's fine. It's none of your business. I stomped my foot on the ground. He made it my business when he killed Betsy. Elizabeth winced. I'm so sorry. He hasn't been himself lately. She trailed off, lowering her gaze in shame. Was he even with you yesterday or was that a lie? I asked. She didn't answer. Do you know what's going on with him? I pressed. I, she paused, looking uncomfortable. She moved aside and motioned for me to follow her into the living room. I did. It's the moon, she whispered. The moon? She nodded. He said he can hear it calling to him. I know it sounds mad. Please, I don't want him to get locked up. It'll pass. I'm sure it'll pass. He's just sick. Haven't your parents ever told you about this? It happens here sometimes. They... Her eyebrows came together. She held her breath and tensed. Sometimes they get better on their own.
I leaned against the wall, remembering the stories my parents had told me. Stories of people going mad. Tiny outbreaks of some sort of disease, they thought. It hadn't happened in so long. It was assumed they were cases of mad cow disease of something of the sort. But back then, they hadn't had the tools to test for it yet. Could this be what was happening now? Aaron needs to get help, I told her. She shook her head. It'll pass, I promise. I don't want to risk him getting institutionalized. I promise I'll keep him inside from now on. I relented. As long as he stayed away from my livestock, it didn't really matter to me what he did. Besides, I didn't want to be the one who had one of the village's beloved citizens sent to the loony bin. It would get out, people would talk, I would get shunned, and so would Elizabeth. I didn't want that for her or for me, so I promised to keep quiet. Still, I couldn't help thinking of what she said, or rather, what Aaron told had her. The moon. He said it spoke to him. I'd seen him howl to it twice now. I'd seen him so completely entranced by it that he didn't notice my presence at all. I'm sure you've heard the term lunatic before, right? Do you know the origins of the word? Lunatic comes from the Latin word luna, the moon. They used to think the moon caused mental illnesses. Something about its light keeping people awake at night, making people lose their minds. And when you think about it, is it that impossible? If the moon is strong enough to influence the tides, just imagine what it can do to the human body. Think about it. We're comprised of around 70% water. Really, it's almost silly to think that the moon can't affect us. And in Milam, a little village so far from the bright city lights, the moon seems to glow twice as strong. What I'm trying to say is that when I woke up early this morning with blood and chicken feathers caked on my lips, when I felt how sore my throat was, when I saw the moon shining through the clouds and felt the distant, magnetic hum it emitted, I understood. It's beautiful. The curve of it, the deep craters that scar its silver surface, they leave me with this feeling of admiration welling inside of me. They leave me with a desire, no, a need to go outside and greet it. It shines so bright, it's so beautiful. I understand now, there's nothing wrong with getting a little moonstruck. It has taken me a while to collect my thoughts and be able to recall all of this. By now, at least eight weeks have passed since I last sat down to write in this journal. I only kept keeping this because my therapist, a cute 30-something redhead, insisted I do so. My memory has been slipping away piece by piece. Parts of weeks are gone. Plans I've made suddenly lose their spot at the forefront of my mind. I started considering trying to do dream recollection and other methods to try and help sharpen my memory, but I can't even remember if I dream anymore or not. Had it been summer already? Where had the days gone? I was still experiencing PTSD from the following event that I accounted for in my journal. Here is what I wrote. It was the very end of spring. I remember it like it was yesterday. I moved to Pittsburgh from San Antonio nearly six months prior. Adjusting to the move and my new job as a chemist at the nuclear power facility out in Beaver County, I was still adjusting to things like the time change, the temperatures, although it had been an awfully pleasant spring thus far. That was all about to change, apparently. It was an average day in April, I'm not exactly sure of the date. It had been a Friday. I walked out of the security gates, collected my personal belongings that weren't allowed past security, and said my goodbyes to my co-workers. The sun was not even setting yet, a nice change from the cold, dark winters of the region. However, even today, as I strode along the exposed parking lot, something felt off. It felt like two beady yellow eyes were watching me. It was strange for me to suffer from paranoia, but I guess after bouts of insomnia due to a move, I'd been more worse for wear than usual. As a chemist, my job really wasn't taxing or nerve-wracking. The added bonus of working on nuclear power was more of an excitement than deterrent to me, as these facilities were incredibly safe by now. To top it off, Pittsburgh was in a well-shielded region safe from the Midwest Plains, wrought with tornadoes. As well, the nearest fault line was the New Madrid, and it had been relatively inactive in recent times. So outside of human error, I really did not have much to worry about. And let's face it, 
Humans didn't really even run these plants anymore. They were entirely digital. I unlocked my Ford F-150. I had recently picked it up to contend with the rugged terrain I'd constantly face while hiking in the summer months. As I unlocked it and prepared to open the handle, I thought I heard footsteps somewhere, a few cars behind me shuffling quickly. This, on top of the feeling I was being watched, made me finally turn around to confront whoever was trying to prank me. All right, I half shouted. I hear you back there, who is that? Frank, Monte, Oliver? Frank was a system specialist. He was your typical blue-collared, football and beer-loving 54-year-old. Monte was a Frenchman here to do work as an exchange program with Electricité de France. Oliver was a quiet 20-something soft air engineer, and despite his shy, introverted nature, once you got to know him, you uncovered a remarkable sense of humor and dry sarcasm. A very bright kid. I had been in my field for over 20 years, working on projects ranging from cancer drug trials to less legal chemical concoctions. I laid my first LSD tabs at 19 years old in the dark room of the photography lab at the University of Texas. It was a wild ride, those days, but I had since settled down and had made myself more than I could have hopped for in so far as my career and life. Things had been great. Come on guys, this isn't funny. I snapped back from my thoughts on my co-workers and just realized that nobody had answered me. Strange, I thought. Surely this was some kind of joke. Maybe I had been awake too long. My brain wasn't making the connection that a pile of leaves could have blown across the parking lot. And here I am, standing here, looking like a crazy person, shouting at someone that wasn't there. I chuckled to myself and turned to my truck, climbing in it, but still not able to shake the sense that someone or something was watching me. I turned the keys to the ignition and the roar of the engine helped drown out the nervous silence that surrounded the nearly empty parking lot. I took off, not wanting to look back in fear that I might actually see my phantom pursuer. As I drove away, the feeling intensified, and as it did, the accelerometer needle crept higher and higher as I sped home. The lock to my front door turned, and the door swung open as I walked into the entryway and let out a long sigh of relief. Home. Home was a small ranch house in an outlying township of Allegheny County, the county that Pittsburgh is located in. Directly southwest of the city, I could be to the various entertainment and sporting events in less than 15 minutes. On the other hand, I could escape to wild and wonderful West Virginia in about a half hour. It was a much better balance than the hot streets of San Antonio and the even hotter surrounding deserts. My ranch had three bedrooms, two full baths, a nice sit-down kitchen with an island and a smart fridge, a connected dining room, and adjoining living room. With no upstairs, I slept, worked, ati, and bath it all on the same floor. I had laundry and laundry chuti in the basement, as well as an additional TV and futon for guests, who had maybe had one too many drinks at my place. I hadn't thrown a party yet, but now that I had begun to get to know my co-workers, I was planning on it soon. I checked the back door which lead off my dining room, and looked into my backyard. Nothing, just a white fenced in yard, surrounded by overgrown vines and trees in the connecting yards. Behind the fence and directly behind my house was a vacant lot and on the other side of that woods that stretched all the way down to Washington County. So in essence, nothing. If anything were to happen, it would have probably been traveling for miles, I thought to myself. By the time it gets here from Washington, it's just going to want to take a nap. I plopped down on the sofa in my living room, mouth half ajar as I prepared to slumber off for the night and the weekend to come. The TV turned on as I flipped the remote and turned to one of the local news channels. I had caught the story just in time as the anchor feverishly scoured through the teleprompter. Reports have been sporadic and sketchy from various residents in the area, but one eyewitness had this to say. I gulped, thinking back to the feeling of being watched in the parking lot as a man in a John Deere hat with a beer belly and wife beater took frame in the camera. He began to speak to the off-screen reporter saying, "'Alls I know is it was big. It had these sharp white teeth and when it saw you it would hiss like a rapid wild animal. But it walked upright, you know? Like it was a man, but it definitely ain't no man. 
It was furry, almost like it had a full coat of a beer or a black beer. But it definitely ain't no beer. I gots my shotgun from the porch, but when I came back yonder, thing done up and had split. The reporter interjected, Did you hear it growl or snort or anything? Yes, um, I suppose I did. It was hissing, but it ain't like no hiss I ain't never hear, you know. It showed dem pearly sharp teeth done split up and vanish into thin air. The uneducated response was kind of humorous, but I wasn't really in a laughing mood at this point. How did you know it was out here? Obviously a pre-canned question by the reporter, as it rolled off the tongue perfectly in the next breath. You see, that's the weird thing. I'm not sure what it was you call it some sort of sixth sense or something, but I just felt like there was something out there. I told my wife, Hey wait, there's something out down yonder in the yard. My heart dropped and I changed the channel immediately. Shivers ran up and down my spine as I knew, just knew, that I had been an experiencer of whatever this was. I debated calling into the news story and sharing my experience, but didn't want to even bother. This had been the stuff they wrote about in those kooky UFO books, or the weird Bigfoot books. Someone had just felt it. And if that didn't discredit me, I don't know what would. I'd be 58 trying to sell a copy of a book of the day I got spooked, desperately giving cryptozoological talks at conferences of weirdos and crazy people alike. I dropped that real quick and decided it was time for a movie. I flipped through the Netflix selections, still unimpressed at the streaming service. Nothing new, nothing good, just the same old TV show selections, mostly from the 80s and 90s and C-grade movies. Snap! I jumped up from my sofa, immediately clutching my Galaxy S5 and activating the flashlight switch. It was about 8 p.m. when the twig snapped out my dining room window, which I had opened to let the cool breeze in. A sense of dread and fear overwashed me. I should have called the damn news station and had them send a crew out. I could have got them on camera. I could have been the hero who killed whatever this thing was. Footsteps. One heavy, one softer, one heavy, one softer. They stop. I slowly crept towards the window, keeping low almost like you do in one of those Call of Duty video games, so as not to make any noise in my house and tip off my position. This was it, I thought to myself. I was going to do something heroic finally, I was going to be a part of something extraordinary. The footsteps started again, this time receding back towards the fence, but again they stopped only after a few steps. I heard this hiss the man had described earlier as I slowly crept up to the window. There was a switch to the spotlight to my backyard, just between the door to the patio and my window. I quickly lunged for it, not wasting a second and light flooded the backyard. I gasped in horror as my face squared with the window. Staring straight at me were two sickly yellow eyes with black pupils and no iris I could see. The thing was walking upright, but it was covered in a silky brown fur. It was looking straight at me. Obviously the light was flooding it so it couldn't see too well onto my patio. I doubt it saw me. I doubt it saw me at all. It quickly hopped over the fence, and I heard the footsteps, both now heavy padding into the darkness. I sat by my window for the remainder of the night with the light on. I had nothing but a kitchen knife and baseball bat at my disposal, but it never came back. The sun rose, and I ventured outside to investigate the footprints. Nothing. There was nothing even out here. I walked back inside and turned on the news to get an update. Nothing, no follow-up. I checked the websites, no reports, not even a recap. Wait, what? Had this actually happened? Was this real? When was the last time I slept? I couldn't even recall anymore. I swear there had been something out there. That's where I ended it. Now it's been a long time since this happened, but since then, I swear every night I hear something walking around my backyard. But every time I go to look, there is nothing there. It's been happening more frequently, almost as if it's getting ready for something. I'm still suffering from insomnia, and I can't help but get the feeling now that we're approaching an important event. An important event in my life that is going to define who I am for the remainder of it. I just wish I knew what it was. It all started four days ago. My job had just let me go because I was too slow at putting peppers on a freaking conveyor belt. 
So it was back to the hell that was job searching. Three applications a day, keeping an eye out for responses, and in general just hanging with my parents that I could tolerate some days better than others. I honestly don't know what made me think of applying for that specific gas station. Don't get me wrong, I really do like the place, and I don't blame it for what happened. So, I won't use the real name in this story. Let's call it Swift Pit instead. The gas station was family owned. Let's call them the Laika family. That has a nice ring to it. Mrs. Laika was a kind short lady with gray hair, blue eyes, and a very gentle voice. $13 an hour sure felt like one hell of a deal for just running the register, filling the hot food section, and keeping the shelves stocked. And the other workers were nice, which was more than I could have said for my last job. I don't think I need to describe what it looked like to you, because it's pretty much the same as any other gas station. There were four pumps. The store itself was pretty small, but not so small it felt claustrophobic. During the day they kept the hot food area well stocked, but during the night we kept only the bare minimum there, replacing it only when the initial ones were taken. The evenings were so slow they'd only put one person in the station, though the boss lived perhaps ten minutes away and would be able to show up pretty quickly if I gave her a call. Not sure how the days went, though since they were still in business, I've got to assume quite a bit busier. I heard that they were toying with closing during the night to help save on expenses. It was my first night by myself. Nothing too eventful happened for the first few hours. I could have counted the number of customers that actually entered the station so far on one hand. One was a short old woman with a loud set of pipes. Another was a man who really shouldn't have been driving from how badly he reeked of alcohol. There might have been a few more customers, it's a little fuzzy now. I spent a lot of time just standing at the register and staring out the window. I always grew up near cities where you could only see the brightest stars. It really wasn't until I got this job, a few minutes away from the nearest city, that I really got to see the night sky in all of its glory. That night was no exception. The full moon was just breathtaking. I could have stood there and watched the stars for hours. It was around one o'clock when I heard the gunshot, and it was close, really close. The entire night went into a panic. I heard startled birds flying for safety, watched a single deer sprint past the building. Then it was quiet, the night itself patiently waiting for an explanation. But I didn't have one. There was a huge forest nearby, sure. Perhaps a hunter? I don't know the first thing about hunting. Maybe someone was allowed to hunt on this property. I was straining my ears when there was a loud clunk by the door. Nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. It was an adult wolf who had one paw lightly stuck in the handle to pull it open. All it took was the wolf making a little jump backwards and the door swung open, and for just a moment I realized the wolf had gained entry and I was very possibly in danger. The wolf threw something into the store and took off into the night, all within the span of a few seconds. It was all so fast, but it was what the wolf had just flung into the building that really had me shocked. It was a small bundle of gray fur, looking at me with big brown eyes. I couldn't understand what I had just witnessed. Had an adult wolf just thrown its baby into the gas station and bail? That didn't make any sense. The little wolf looked outside, then hobbled its way towards me without a second thought. I was still thinking about it when someone stormed into view. They were wearing a huge trench coat, a very heavy set of jeans, some steel-toed boots, and a thick pair of gloves, along with a heavy-looking hat. But what really had me scared was the huge gun the man was holding. It was some sort of rifle, and even without knowing anything about guns, I recognized it as a heavy caliber gun. The man was walking towards the entrance to the gas station, and while I couldn't see his eyes, I got the feeling he was looking right at me. By the time he got to the entrance, the young pup was out of sight, and the man's attention was grabbed when the adult wolf howled somewhere off in the distance. The man immediately turned and ran towards the sound, his gun at the ready. I didn't know what to think about the whole situation. I've heard of plenty of people hunting deer, but I didn't even know if it was legal for people to hunt wolves. I also didn't know how smart wolves were, but here was a parent wolf not only playing decoy to protect its cub, it even knew how to work the gas station's pull door with no trouble whatsoever. I've had some dogs that figured out that kind of stuff, sure, 
but that was only after several hundred attempts. And if the wolf was that crafty, I got the feeling the man stood no chance of killing it. My thoughts turned to the cub when I felt it nuzzling against my feet. It only took one look down before I knelt down and began petting it. I've always liked dogs and kids, so a two-in-one package combo was an absolute delight. It took me a second to remember that it was a wild wolf cub. This whole situation was just so... weird. The poor thing was shaking like a leaf. Somewhere in the back of my mind I was wary. Even a fully tamed dog is likely to lash out at a person if it is approached when scared. But that part of my mind wasn't the one in control, as I gently clutched the cub close to my chest. There, there, it's okay, I won't let the mean hunter hurt you. The wolf looked up at my face, then, to my delight, snuggled close to my chest. Good, there was nothing to worry about. But it was strange. As far as I know, most wild animals are scared to be around people. This pup was scared, sure, but had no problem whatsoever with me. Did it realize I wanted to help it? I don't know. Would that be a bit too smart for a wolf cub? It didn't take long before I realized I had to call someone. Even if the poor cub was someone's pet, that meant that someone was missing their pet and probably looking for it. The only person who lived close enough that it even seemed plausible would be the manager. I hated the idea of waking her up at 1 a.m., but I really wasn't sure what to do about the situation. The phone rang three times before someone picked up. Unlike the gentle voice I was expecting to come out from the phone, I heard a gruff and decidedly male voice grumble its way through the receiver. Yeah, uh, uh hi, I'm looking for Mrs. Laika. There's something odd going on at the gas station and my wife's sleeping right now, asshole. I'm going to have to do. Well, this was off to a great start. I've never been the best at conversing with people, and I honestly hadn't realized she was married. Okay, okay. I heard a gunshot nearby. It took the man the longest time to reply, and when he did, I was startled at how nervous he sounded. All of that annoyance was gone, replaced with genuine fear in his voice. I, is that so? Um. Are you in danger? Not that I know of yet. I did see some weirdo in a trench coat carrying a rifle walking around outside, but they left after hearing a wolf howl. Shit, you uh, didn't happen to see if there was a wolf with a cub nearby, did you? Well, that was suspiciously specific. I'm not stupid, and that was setting off red flags in my head. It took nearly 10 seconds before I decided the only rational answer was that the Laika family owned a few tame wolves. Um, yes, actually. The wolf kind of threw the cub into the gas station. I'm currently holding the cub right now. Okay, whoo, I'm going to... Actually, first I'm going to question why the hell you would pick up a wild wolf cub. You do know mother wolves aren't very forgiving if they see you playing with their kids, right? That made me blush. He wasn't wrong, of course, if I was a normal person, Maybe I would have thought through it a little bit harder. I, uh, I like dogs. A lot. Fair enough. Anyways, I've heard about this nutcase on the news recently. Apparently he comes out every full moon and starts shooting at any wolves he sees. I'm going to grab my gun and meet you at the gas station, just in case he decides to do something. As for the cub, well, you seem to have that under control right now. Also, this may be a strange thing to ask, but could you please not call the police? I mean, if the situation gets really bad, then go right ahead, but so long as it's just weird like this. I agreed with him, my throat becoming very dry. More red flags were going off. He knew more than what he was letting on. I could sense it. This whole situation screamed trouble. As I hung up the phone, I looked at the clock. 115. Now before I continue, I want it on record that I'm not always the best when it comes to putting things together. But it doesn't take a fucking genius to figure out the connection between wolves and the full moon. Of course, I thought werewolf at some point during this conversation. It would definitely explain some nut marching around the woods, killing every wolf he came across. At the time, I thought this gunman was probably just some deluded psycho who believed in fairy tales a little too much. As I waited for Mr. Laika to appear, 
I couldn't stop the thoughts gnawing away at my brain. Why on earth had the man asked about a wolf and her cub? My more creative side that likes to ignore reality played with the thought that perhaps this mother wolf and child were in fact not only werewolves, but family members to Mr. Lyta. I've always had an overactive imagination, and it's gotten me in trouble more than once. And tonight, faced with a mystery that the rational side of my brain had no answer to, the creative side was all too willing to spin a fantastical story of lies, murder, and love. Though, of course, the rational side was keeping it in check. The fantasies I was cooking up were nothing more than fantasies. Werewolves were not real. The entire time my brain was, um... Thinking this up, I was playing with the cub. For the first few minutes, I just stood there and petted the cub. But then we got bored of that, and I decided to see if it could play fetch with a nearby pencil. The answer, to my delight, was yes. Somewhere in the middle of this, I started calling the cub Togo, which he seemed to love. Belly rubs were one of his favorite things, so I started rewarding him with a belly rub every time he brought back the pencil. It felt like forever before my mind noticed that there was something heading our way. I could hear it. Some soft, thumping sound. It made me feel uneasy, and I quickly had the cub sit at my feet while I stood up at the register, the cub well hidden from the doorway. It only took a few seconds before I saw the man wearing a trench coat walk into view. The man grunted as he took a step into the store, his large boots producing an audible thump with every step. His eyes checked out the right side of the store, then the left side of the store, before deciding it was safe to walk inside. In his left hand was the gun. Sorry to disturb you, lad. There was no sincerity in his voice, but it was deep, perhaps the deepest sounding voice I had ever heard before. And as he walked in the store, I had the pleasure of realizing the man was taller than me, which, considering I'm 6'3", is actually quite the feat. It wasn't just a little bit either. He could have been seven feet tall. It would have been a lot more intimidating if he didn't look like some secret agent from a kid's cartoon, attempting to blend in with society. But the gun was very real, and it was what I was mostly afraid of. Have you seen a wolf come by here lately? Rather tall, gray fur, blue eyes? I honestly told him no. I didn't get a good look at the adult wolf that came by earlier, and the cub had brown eyes. But the man gave another low grunt as he began sauntering his way over to me, his boots thumping the entire way. Well, what about a tiny wolf cub? Gray fur, brown eyes? I told him no, but even I knew full well it was pointless. I couldn't even maintain eye contact. His boots were getting on my nerves. I'm easily distracted by sound, and the thumping kept messing with my head. Really? Thump, thump, he was heading my way, a crooked smile on his face as he lightly lifted up his gun. I'm not really in the mood for games, kid. Thump, thump. My throat was dry as a desert as I asked him why he wanted to know. Thump, thump. Yeah. The moon's full and there are wolves about. Do I need to spell this out for you? Thump, thump. Are you trying to tell me they are werewolves? The man congratulated me on figuring it out, his voice soaked in sarcasm. I could feel Togo shivering against my feet, doing his best to stay out of sight of this man. And in that instant, I felt a rush of paternal instincts kicking in. He was not getting Togo no matter what he thought. Werewolves don't exist, sir. The thumping stopped because he was now on the other side of the counter and his eyes, a deep shade of blue, were trying to bore a hole right through my skull. I don't really have time to explain the situation to you, so let's just settle with, yes, they are. Give me one reason to believe you. He lifted his gun slightly with a stone cold frown on his face. He didn't aim it at me or anything, but the threat was clear. It was quite the experience. I've never felt a chill down my spine quite like that before. He really was crazy, and he was dead serious. Werewolves do exist. I've seen what they can do, what they are. They cause nothing but pain and misery. Now tell me where the cub is. I didn't want to hand any living thing to this psychopath. The little cub was huddled around my feet, shivering so badly that it almost felt like it was having a seizure. But at the same time, well, he was pretty much telling me he'd shoot me if I didn't tell him. And if he did, Togo would be easy pickings.
There was a moment, a truly horrible moment, where I honestly believed there was no other choice. I was going to have to reach down, pick up the innocent pup, and place it within this monster's hands. Then reality struck me. Mr. and Mrs. Laika lived only 10 minutes away, and a quick glance at the clock told me I had made that call about 12 minutes ago. Help was only a few minutes, maybe even just a few seconds, away. If I could just stall for time? He wouldn't try anything if there was someone with equal firepower on the scene, right? What will you do, kill it? Not immediately, no. You see, its mother is proving to be quite the difficult catch, not letting me get a clear shot. Good, good, he's talking. I just need to keep him talking. Okay. He gives a very irritated grunt as he shakes his head. God, are you really this retarded? I'm going to use it as bait. Retarded. Oh, he just struck a nerve. But it also told me just how agitated he was. Did he know I was stalling for time? Why the hell did I think this was a good idea a few seconds ago? Let's say that werewolves exist. How do you know these two are werewolves? Let's put it this way. Wolves are smart, but they're not this smart. The mother wolf realized I was tracking her after I failed to ambush her. What did she do? She ran up to the gas station and a few minutes later, I realized she must have brought her pup inside. She then tried to lead me away from the gas station. That's quite a bit of thought for a normal wolf. Okay, I had to give him that point. But the more I thought about it, the more this man's plan made me scared of him. He wanted to use a child to lure their mother into a trap, then kill the child. It was disgusting. Did you see the mother doing something wrong? I beg your pardon? Well, I'm assuming you have a reason you want to kill her. She's a werewolf. That was it. He made no other attempt to justify murdering what he fully believed was a sentient being and he said it with such conviction, as if I was out of my mind to even think he needed more of a reason than that. It made my skin crawl. This guy was well on his way to becoming a serial killer. And if I kept attempting to stall him, I was starting to think I would become his first genuinely sentient victim. There was movement in my peripheral. A quick glance outside showed me that my salvation was just pulling into the parking lot. I've never been so happy to see a beat up little Subaru but when I looked back at the man, I realized I had made a horrible mistake. He was following my gaze, and the instant he saw the car outside, his mouth curled up into a nasty sneer. You little shit. He raised the gun and aimed it at my chest. There was no hesitation. The sound was deafening. Pain tore a path through my chest. I staggered backwards while placing a shaking hand to my chest and held my hand up to find it covered in blood. He had actually shot me. I mean, it's one thing to threaten to shoot someone, it's quite another to actually do it. I should have fucking known. It felt like a dream as I looked up at him, to find him aiming the rifle at the doorway. Standing there was a burly man wielding a gun of his own, aiming it directly at the man in the trench coat. My breaths were slow and ragged, and I couldn't stop coughing. A few times I started coughing up blood. Mr. Laika and the man just stood there for the longest time, guns aimed at each other. At some point I fell to the ground. I don't think it had anything to do with the hole in my chest. I think it was just the shock of the entire situation. They started shouting at each other. I only needed to hear the first few sentences to realize they knew each other personally and they despised each other. I tuned them out while reaching into my pocket and grabbing out my phone. It took only a few seconds to punch in the number and bring it to my ear. To my surprise, it hardly began the first ring before they picked up. The welcome sound of a friendly voice came through. 911, what's your email? Bang. The sound was deafening. I heard the man's boots thundering towards the nearest aisle as all hell broke loose. Somewhere in my mind, I finally realized this was really happening. A gunfight was going on right in front of me. I was shaking violently now, one hand clutching at the wound as I brought my knees to my chest and began whispering into the phone. I'm at Swift Pit the gas station, I was just shot. I couldn't hear her response over the gunfire, just the urgency in her voice. The gun sounded really different, with the man's making a loud bang and Mr. Laika's gun making a strange rat-a-tat sound, like it was firing three rounds at a time. Then it stopped. What followed was five minutes of silence 
no one willing to make a single move. I was whispering to the operator, telling her everything I knew about the situation in a desperate hope that she'd have an answer as to what I should do. At some point, I took off my shirt and tightly wrapped it around my chest in an attempt to slow the bleeding. And poor Togo was curled up next to me, crying silently as the world itself stood still. Rat-a-tat. Bang. My heart stopped as I heard a body fall to the floor. The man's gun fired last, not Mr. Laika's. I tried to rationalize it. Maybe it was a dead man trigger finger? Thump, thump. Oh no, th thump, thump. He was... He was heading my way, thump, thump. The young cub began whimpering. There was no point in trying to protect him anymore. I was about to die, and Togo was going to die right after. Thump, thump. Time seemed to slow down as his boot came into view around the counter, landing with another loud thump. I looked up at him to see there were a few holes in his coat, but there was no blood. It took me a second to realize he was wearing a bulletproof vest underneath the trench coat. He had a nasty smile on his face as he rested the barrel of the gun right against my forehead. There was no hesitation, no guilt in his eyes. I could only watch, shaking my head pitifully and crying as I watched him pull the trigger. Click. The smirk vanished off of his face as he looked down at his gun with a raised eyebrow. Rat-a-tat. The sound couldn't have been more unexpected. The man's eyes opened wide in shock as he buckled at the knees, blood flowing freely from three bullet holes in his forehead. His head slammed into the floor with a nasty thunk. I heard pounding footsteps as Mr. Laika ran into view, pointing his gun at the man's head. Rat-a-tat, rat-a-tat. It was only 10 seconds later when it was clear the man was never going to get back up that Mr. Laika turned around and looked at me. There was blood pouring out of a wound on his shoulder, but what really had me scared was the haunted look in his eyes as he got down to eye level with me, putting a hand on my shoulder. He looked me over and gave a huge, relieved sigh. I... I called 911, they're on the way. Good, can you stand? It took a few attempts. My legs were shaking really badly, but I did ultimately stand. It took me a moment to realize Togo was standing in front of me, now nuzzling Mr. Laika's legs. He just reached down and picked Togo up and gently touched his head to Togo's forehead. The front door opened. At first I thought it was the police, but to my surprise I turned around to find the mother wolf now entering the gas station. She trotted up to us and waited for Mr. Laika to set down Togo before gently picking up her cub and looking at me. The instant that her eyes met mine, there was a connection. I don't think I can fully explain how I knew her thoughts, but I knew exactly what she was saying to me, and I couldn't help the smile that came to my face as I scratched the back of her ear, even as the movement sent another wave of agony through my chest. You're welcome. She smiled before turning around. Red and blue lights were shining through the windows, sirens blaring through the quiet night. Before I could say anything more, the wolf sprinted for the back door, knocked it open, and vanished into the night with her baby. The next few hours were a blur. The police asked a lot of questions, of course, but I didn't say much. The ambulance wasn't far behind them, and they put some, uh, endotracheal tube in my lung to help with my current breathing problems. The ambulance called the Lysa family to inform them Mr. Lysa was injured, but they didn't pick up. My family was a different matter. You'd have thought that I really had died from how badly mom was crying, screaming, that I was never to work at a gas station ever again. The doctors performed surgery on me within half an hour of me getting to the hospital. The bullet had gone through my lung and had nearly managed to exit through my back. It took a few stitches to close it all, but all in all I was assured my life wasn't in any danger due to the wound. I'm currently writing this from the hospital bed. This is the first day where I haven't had some damn reporter shoving a microphone down my throat, trying to get my opinion on the whole thing. Apparently the cameras in the station couldn't catch what was actually said. There was just footage of me playing with a wolf pup. Then the man came in and it all went to shit. I told them everything the man had said to me, how he was hunting werewolves, how he wanted to know where the cub was, Right now, the TV in my room is showing the headlines on the werewolf hunter, as they've named my attacker. As of right now, he's a John Doe. 
He didn't have a phone or any form of identification on him. Not a single person is missing from town and not a single abandoned vehicle nearby. Police are awaiting news from a DNA test. But here's what really caught my attention. There are no stories of him from before that night. Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, the actual news. I couldn't find anything and I've had days to search. The closest I got was a man who swore werewolves existed and had killed his wife for thinking she was one, but he was several states away and was predictably in prison. I haven't told the police that Mr. Laika had warned me of this man, that he had heard stories of a man killing wolves during the full moon. As for the wolf and her cub, no one had an explanation for what happened. There were animal experts trying to figure out why a mother wolf would put her baby with a complete stranger, why the baby trusted me with no trouble and why the mother simply took her child back without attempting to maul us. Some are accusing me of having illegally tamed the wolf, saying that it explained why I had refused to hand the pup over even with my life on the line. But others are defending me, saying that perhaps the wolf somehow realized I was protecting the child and pointing out that when the wolf opened the door, I was clearly alarmed until she left. In all honesty, I don't need an explanation. Mrs. Laika has come and visited me since then, looking at me with her piercing blue eyes and apologizing for everything that happened, promising to give me an explanation that I don't really need. She brought her son, not more than a year or two old, and with big brown eyes. I had asked her for the boy's name, and she told me it was Sam. Then the child spoke, and while his mother thought it was just baby noises, it brought a smile to my face. I had everything I needed. Pistol with silver bullets. Silver blade, the only thing that could kill the beast. Sturdy pickup truck that could follow it through the mud if necessary. Adequate food and water that could last me for days. I wanted to kill this thing so badly. I could feel the rage pumping through my veins, corrupting my blood and sending me into a near frenzy. It ripped my father in half right in front of me, remorselessly, with an apparent bloodlust that I'm still trying to process. I lived alone with my father for a few years, taking care of him, helping him do basic things because he had become decrepit in the last several years. We lived in a small shack on the edge of nothing, a bleak and dense wilderness. He often told me stories of the wilderness, of those that went in and never came back out, or if they did, they were forever changed. Many nights I would sit on the back porch, sipping beer and staring out at the thick line of trees. My father and I would go hunting in those woods, but only so far. We could always see the cabin from our stomping grounds. In a weird way, I developed the belief that as long as we were in the shack's sight, that it would protect us, which of course was shattered when my father got brutally murdered in front of me that night. I probably would have been a goner too, except in my desperation and terror, I picked up the Bible and held it in front of my chest. The werewolf howled and its fist froze an inch from the book and promptly pulled back. It then sat on its haunches and whined like a puppy. For a brief second, my gaze turned incredulously to the book, and when I glanced back up again, the beast had gone. I wept for my father, and when the tears were spent, I buried him in the backyard. After my grief somewhat subsided, I collected my thoughts and a new goal formed in my head, that of vengeance. I'd often sit on the back porch and stare at the Bible, thinking about how it saved my life that night. Then I remembered what the priest said happened to his wife many years back. I couldn't believe I didn't think about it before now. I did hesitate, but my dad had been religious, at least vaguely, and had a sort of tenuous friendship with Father George at one point. So I made the trip, about half a mile down the road, the decent-sized house sat right at the end, seeming like a damned thing. I remembered the whispers around town, that the priest veered from his faith and that was why his wife had died. I took a few deep breaths and got out of the car, walking up the gravel road and knocking on the door. The day was fine enough, a bit overcast and just a little chilly, but okay. I stared out at the priest's acres and felt a sense of peace, my very first slice of it since my father died. Father George opened the door and smiled, and not the fake kind of smile my father and I had been given because we were poor. He just saw us as members of his flock. I wasn't necessarily a religious man, 
but I admired his consistency, if nothing else. I came into the living room and he asked if I wanted anything to drink. I said just a bottle of water would be fine, if he had any. Once he emerged from the kitchen, he handed me the bottle of water and sat down. After an uncomfortable silence, which only lasted a couple of seconds, I spoke up. Father George, I won't lie, as I believe you'd frown on that kind of thing, but I came here for a reason. I know you always liked my father and I, and, well, something has happened to him. Something similar to what happened to your wife. What you said happened. Father George cleared his throat, maintaining his silence for a few more seconds. Then he said, I try not to think about that night. But when I do, my heart is filled with a rage that I just can't let go. I am practically a feeble old man. I want to take vengeance on the beast that killed my wife. But two things are stopping me. I am a holy man. Secondly, as I said, physically, I do not think I am up to the task. I told him that I was. The same beast killed my father and would have done the same to me if I hadn't held the Bible in front of me. Father George paused. That is interesting. Since I was wearing something holy, it didn't occur to me that it could have been the reason I wasn't mauled by the beast. All of this seems to suggest that it is an instrument of holy vengeance, and my own sense of right and wrong pales in comparison. But it killed your wife, the woman you loved. Father George's eyes became moist and he looked away. I need your help, Father. You are the only other one who knows about the wolf, and honestly, I can't do this alone. I am not the only one, Father George said. There is one other. Her husband fell victim to it, or so she claims. But I do not know if you can trust the woman in the woods. Father George told me that a woman lived in the woods, not far from the main road. He told me he would consider what I said, but that I should leave for now so that he could collect his thoughts. I got up in my car and left. Even though he told me I couldn't trust the woman, nonetheless, I was compelled to seek her out. I parked my car near the shack my father, and I built with my own hands. Then I went behind the shack and entered the woods. I could have just parked my truck anywhere on the side of the gravel road, but I didn't want anyone in town, especially Father George, to see me entering and exploring the woods. He above all us would know what I was up to. I believed Father George was being authentic and telling how things were from his perspective. But being a priest and everything, his view was restricted to what he currently believed. I had to travel my own path. The woman's tent didn't take long to find, not really. I probably hiked for about a mile all total, combing the woods back and forth until I saw it. My heart skipped a beat as I realized this was the farthest I had ever been into the wilderness. An elderly woman was hanging her clothes on a line, the ends of the line supported by two trees directly opposite each other. The tent looked small, but I spotted a luxurious rug inside, a wooden chair and desk, and smaller items that I thought might have been talismans or something. The old woman saw me. Her eyes grew big and she made to flee. I held up my hands, backing off a little. I just want to talk about your husband, I said. She halted in her tracks. Who told you about that? I hesitated. The priest who lives in town. The woman spat on the ground. That bastard has been spreading rumors about me for years. Well, I haven't heard them. She hesitated for several moments, then offered me to come into her tent and hear the real side of the story, as she put it. The woman introduced herself as Bethany, she said she and her husband had run a small business in town years and years ago, and based on the dates, it happened before I was born. After I said what had happened in the shack on that fateful, horrific day, she told a similar story to mine and to Father George's about how the werewolf broke into the place and slaughtered him right there. Bethany said it was the most traumatic experience of her life, and Father George painted her a liar. No one could corroborate her story, of course, but charges weren't brought. It explained why she fled the town and decided to live in the woods. The town had shamed her. I wasn't sure why I never heard the stories, or maybe my dad did and just didn't tell me. I would have thought one of the other people in town would have told me, but maybe she was the town's dirty secret, or maybe they were afraid of her. 
If you don't believe me, Bethany said, go to the only abandoned building in town. It used to be a dry cleaning service. I do not go inside the buildings anymore because the werewolf only kills inside buildings. It cannot kill you in front of anything you have built with your own two hands. But inside, it has domain. Father George has no doubt told you he thinks the beast is an instrument of holy vengeance. And I believe that's true. This is a weakness of it, however, and for reasons that are unknown to me. Bethany said she wouldn't talk to me further until I had checked out the old one-story building. I remember passing it hundreds of times during my lifetime, never giving it much thought except how creepy it looked. The door to the building opened easily. Large chunks of wood were missing where the doorknob should have been. Clearly, people had broken into it over the years. I opened the door and went inside. Everything was dark, and I turned on my flashlight. Always kept several in the car. Something my dad taught me when I was younger. You do not want to be stranded somewhere, in a strange place, completely in the dark. I shone the bright beam all over the large room near the desk, scanning the rows of empty racks. I didn't see anything of interest at first. Then someone's ghost materialized in front of me, and I let out a scream, almost dropping the flashlight. I was trembling too severely to move or flee. Bethany never should have cursed the beast, it said. I know she did it to avenge my death, but it's only brought pain to her. The ghost's voice was wispy. I could barely hear it, but the whisper sent violent shivers down my spine. The man had clearly been killed in a grisly way, similar to my dad, and I tried to avoid looking at the ghastly wounds. It remained for several seconds before wavering and disappearing. As soon as the trembles ceased and I knew the ghost had gone, I fled the building. I hurriedly opened the truck door, fumbled putting the key in the ignition, finally turning it. I took the car out of park and peeled the hell out of there. I had unfinished business with the woman in the woods. Based on what the ghost of her husband said, it stood to reason that she was responsible for the wolf creature killing my father. After all, it seemed that her cursing the beast resulted in something horrible happening. The ghost disappeared before I could find out what. On the other hand, the woman cursed the wolf creature to avenge the death of her husband, so it killed before that. Me Bethany was still putting her clothes on the line when I came to her little clearing. A pang of sympathy momentarily sliced through me. I was still angry at the prospect that she was responsible for the beast killing my father, but I didn't see it as deliberately murderous, more like blind fury. I met your husband a little while ago, I said, his ghost. You didn't tell me I'd meet a fucking ghost, I said. I can still see the terror in your eyes. You are telling me the truth, Bethany said. He told me that you cursed the beast to take revenge. My husband was a kind man, but only told you part of the story. For some reason, I felt as if his ghost gave me the power to curse the beast, to channel its killing urge to annihilating those that lack faith. Because my study of the occult has led me to belief that the priest is responsible, albeit indirectly, for the origin of the wolf. It came to be because he had faith, then abandoned it. After the death of my husband and its transformation by my hand, the werewolf seems to seek the same in its victims. But his wife, I started. She died, yet he survived. You said that it seeks out those that are like him. He should have died. You mentioned the werewolf didn't attack you when you held the Bible. If Father George was dressed as a priest in that moment, he would have been spared. I found this strange. Sure, it explained why he had been spared that one time, but not all the other times after he could have killed. It didn't seem possible that he'd be dressed like a priest 24-7 or carrying a Bible. There had to be a better explanation. Honestly, I didn't know what to think. This werewolf seemed equal parts mystery and horror. I realized I couldn't rely on the perceptions of Bethany or the Father George. I needed time to think. I knew that each second that passed would give the werewolf another opportunity to kill me. I figured that as long as I held a Bible in my hands, I'd be safe. So much had happened that I couldn't even think straight. That was as much of a danger, if not a higher one, than giving the beast more time to annihilate me. Driving back to my shack, I noticed how deep the night had settled into everything pervading every crevice my eyes could see, and all the hidden ones that people probably wished would just go away. Back at the shack, I sat on the wooden chair and leaned over the desk. 
I lit the lamp on the desk a few moments before, and a soft glow filled the room. I realized I hadn't gone through the trunk since Dad died, and that I probably should. I opened the trunk seeing all the possessions he had accumulated over the years. Most of it was loose leaf papers, or small leather-bound journals. I did my best to go through them all, making sure to keep the Bible close for protection. Once I had read most of the journals and papers, I just sat there, incredulous. My dad had known the wolf, had conversations with it. I remembered he told stories of those who went deep into the woods and never came out. But apparently, he was one of the lucky souls who did and lived to tell the tale. My mind returned to the question of why the werewolf had spared the woman in the woods and the priest while killing the priest's wife and the woman's husband. My rage at wanting the thing dead dissolved into an intense curiosity and then spiked into a constant state of low terror. I hadn't been very deep into the woods. My father had built a kind of vague mysticism around it. The thing he had used to instill such a feeling of terror in me was something I knew I needed to chase after, despite my fear. The woman believed that the werewolf killed her husband for reasons unknown to her and killed the priest's wife because of its lack of faith after she transformed it, channeled it, as she claimed. But Father George had been wearing holy garb equivalent to my Bible, so why had he been spared? She had even said the werewolf had been created from Father George's lack of faith, not just lack of faith, but having abandoned his faith. Of course, the faith might have ebbed and flowed in the man considering he was still a priest, but did the beast really make such distinctions? Underneath all the papers in the trunk was a secret panel. Inside lay a shining pistol. I checked to make sure it was still filled with silver bullets. It was. My father told me that if I ever needed to go into the woods, that I should take this pistol with me. But be warned, son, despite what you might have read, you cannot kill the werewolf with a silver bullet, only seriously wound it for a time. I grabbed the pistol and headed into the woods. The moon seemed suspended in a hammock of clouds, and I swallowed nervously. I know how werewolves are perceived, except my recent experience taught me that werewolves are real, and that they can be vicious killers waiting to pounce from the dark at any moment. As I went deeper into the woods, my fear increased. I could feel my blood pumping in my ears and my left hand shook around the pistol. I didn't even know what I was looking for, but for some reason, I knew that if I went far enough into the woods, I'd find what I was looking for. Eventually, I came across a cave tucked behind a thick line of trees. I barely glimpsed it as I scanned the trees, but then my eyes went back to the blur of gray between the trees. If the werewolf was hiding anywhere, it would be inside, I told myself. I crept closer to the cave, pointing my flashlight closer to the ground so that I wouldn't arouse attention. I jumped several times while approaching the cave, but the sources of the sounds were only harmless critters. Once I was near the mouth of the cave, I had no choice but to shine my flashlight inside. I didn't see anything at first, so I had to venture further into the cave. The beam bounced all over the cavern walls, and I noticed deep scratch marks that upon closer inspection were tally marks. When the beam finally caught a patch of dark brown fur, which seemed to shudder with each long, beastly breath, I screamed. Two red eyes, sleepy and menacing, peered from the bubble of darkness. You are your father's son. I know you, the werewolf said. Stay back, I said. Even though you savagely killed my father, I can't shoot you yet. It wouldn't even do any good, because silver bullets can't kill you. I need to know. Why did you kill my father? Father George's wife, the husband of the woman in the woods. The woman said that she cursed you to attack those that lack faith. Father George lacked faith, according to... That woman is a fool. She does not control me, although she thinks she does. The magic provided by her dead husband, the perfidious soul who deserves to languish, only increased my rage at those that are unfaithful. The pistol shook in my hands again. I tried to keep the beam steady, but it kept bouncing on the cavern walls. Wait, are you saying you annihilate those that have been unfaithful to their partners? The werewolf nodded and bared its teeth. What about my father? My mom died long ago. Are you saying he was with another woman? Your mother isn't dead. She still lives, but a thousand miles away. 
She thinks he is in the ground rotting, and you with him. He led a double life, and you in its shadow. Then the werewolf got on its legs, bared its teeth again, both red eyes radiating a murderous gleam. All of a sudden, the beast lunged. I fired the pistol. Two bullets landed in its chest, another in its right leg. It whimpered and fell to the ground. I emptied the remaining bullets into the beast, and its spasms seemed to roll together before it went entirely still. I cautiously approached the motionless body, then what happened next I'm not quite sure. The werewolf stirred, growled, and its claws barely missed my foot. A billowy cloud of smoke filled the cavern, first a deep and frightening black, then becoming white and ghostly. My feet and arms weren't my own until several minutes later. The white cloud surrounding me dissipated, not slowly, but suddenly. The ghost of Bethany's husband floated before me looking as ghastly as ever. I remember my first posthumous visit to the werewolf. That horrid beast is filled with revelation, isn't he? I couldn't talk for several minutes. The terror needed time to loosen, and my mother was still alive. When I recovered my wits, he took me deeper into the woods, far enough from the cave that eventually I stopped looking over my shoulder. Bethany's husband led me to a great pine tree, which seemed taller than the others. At its base rested a small, ornate box. A bejeweled blade rested inside, the only thing that could kill the beast, according to the ghost. Shortly after, I embarked on the mission to remove the werewolf from this town I lived in most of my life. But I soon found that it wasn't easy to stalk and kill. It always seemed to be one step ahead of me. With the ghost's help, I tracked it to a gas station in the middle of nowhere, an abandoned one at that. I finally thought I had cornered the thing. Part of me didn't want to extinguish it for good because it had known about my mother. It knew about my dad's secrets, that he uprooted me from my childhood home that I didn't even remember, and placed me in this strange isolated town where my life had been reduced to hunting a werewolf that, as far as I was concerned, knew the deepest, darkest secrets of the universe. So I guess you all know about werewolves. I mean, seriously, if you never ever have heard about one, you must be living under a rock, a really big one. I need to confess you guys what I saw because this is crazy. I don't even know if what I saw was real or my imagination, but was it creepy? So me and my wife both agreed to go on a holiday to Romania. We are both from England, and I wanted to know how the country that beat us 4-2 in the U-21 European football looked like. She did some Googling and found out Cluj-Napoca would be nice since we didn't want to go to the capital because she thought it was so cliché. I didn't really care that much. So we left on 24th May and we were both really happy. We got on the plane and we left to Romania. Yay! On our way there, nothing special happened except I'm frightened by planes because I'm scared of heights. I know sometimes I can be a pussy, but I'm just not that plane guy. So it took us four hours to get there and we arrived at the Avram Yanku airport. All nice and good, I helped my wife take the luggage and we went searching for a motel or something. We took an Uber and we went to the west of the city as there were cheaper motels from what I heard from the locals. City was great, nice people, nice buildings and nice everything. My wife was so excited I almost thought she was gonna explode in it. We didn't know Romanian, but we hoped they would know English. Huh. We arrived at the motel and to be honest it was pretty shitty but at least I had a pillow to put my head on and it was actually very cheap so it worked for us. We went to this history museum but I don't think you guys care about that. So one night, I think it was 4 a.m. I just woke up randomly. I don't know why till this day. But I know I just couldn't get myself to sleep again. I said bloody hell and just go outside take a cig. I saw there was a guy at a vending machine and went to him. Maybe chat a little, I figured he probably wouldn't know English but went for it anyways. Hey, what's up? I looked at him. He was wearing a white hoodie and a cap. I'm gonna be honest, I thought he was some drug dealer or something but I wanted to talk to someone and my wife doesn't like it when I wake her up. Hello? I'm good. How about you? He told me as he got his fresh and cold Pepsi from the vending machine. I was surprised he knew English. Most of the people we've come across had a hard time understanding us. Guess these folks from Romania don't speak very good English. Anyways, 
Maybe it's just because we only talked to grown-up men, not with some random teenagers. And this guy looked like 40 plus, so it was nice seeing him he knows how to talk. Oh, finally, I thought nobody knows how to speak properly in this city, haha. Huh? I glanced at his Pepsi. Well, you were probably talking to some old motherfuckers, man. What are you doing up this late? He asked me. Nothing, just thought I can get some fresh air. I took some money from my pocket and got myself a Pepsi too from that vending. Where are you from? He asked me with a grin on his face. I'm from London, mate. I'm on holiday here. I didn't tell him I was with my wife or something. Guy was friendly, but didn't look like he was friendly. Oh, London, London, I know I've been there with work anyways, gotta go. He told me as he rushed into an alley, figured he was some kind of a hobo. I stood there drinking my Pepsi when I heard a loud growl from the alley. I shook. That was no dog growl, it was so loud I think everybody heard it. That hobo couldn't growl like that, I thought to myself. What was he doing? I heard a scream, and I knew shit went off. At first I didn't know what to do, I was scared. What that could be, a bear, a wolf, a lion, a tiger. What the fuck? So I said fuck it and went to the alley. What I saw wasn't human, neither animal. It was some kind of a creature, big and muscular. It had his hand in the dumpster, and it was so dark I didn't see the guy. But I figured that thing must have killed him. It ran away on all fours at supernatural speed. I sat there like an idiot trying to convince myself it wasn't real. It's a hallucination, or it's a dream. I went into the alley, I know. Stupid idea, and I got my phone out. I put on the flashlight and looked into the dumpster. It smelt really, really bad. What I saw will haunt me forever and ever. It was the hobo's head with claw marks on it. The moon shone into the diner, two days past full. I spotted its reflection in the pie cooler's glass door. Spinning my stool so I faced the plate glass window, I saw it hanging above my bearded reflection like a brilliant idea, or a second bald head. Wired from my fourth cup of coffee, I tilted my head back and quietly howled, Aru! Carrie elbowed me. Knock it off, hairball, people are trying to eat. Hey, you got more hair than I do. Down the counter, Sophia frowned. You shouldn't though, Jacob. It's not respectful. That surprised me. Respectful to who? To the people who were killed. Say what? Carrie said. What people? Oh yeah, Rob agreed, the other side of Sophia. For a few years, Drunken Tree had a bigger murder rate than Argenta. Argenta's eight or ten times the size of Drunken Tree Village and has a university besides. See, Sophia said, there was a werewolf here. Carrie laughed. A row. By now, Sophia's frown tightened half her throat. I'm serious. Shut up and listen, would ya? Okay, sorry. There were a bunch of people in here one night and a guy comes in. He orders three hamburgers and sits down. But people hear him growling, and all of a sudden he sprouts hair and claws and shit. What was he taking, I asked, rubbing my smooth scalp. I could use some of it. If I'd had any hair, Sophia's glare would have shriveled it. Y'all think this is a joke. It's not. People died. People die every day, Soph, Carrie said. Just tell your story. Wait, was it a full moon? That's what I heard. Well, first he clawed up the cook because his burgers took too long. Then everybody started trying to run out the door, and they got all jammed up. And the werewolf ripped off a guy's head, and the rest of the people broke the doors out. He chased them into the street and killed a girl there. Wow. Carrie said, subdued. I didn't know. Two people died and the cook was crippled and some other people got sort of trampled. And the werewolf ran off and nobody ever figured out who he was. Carrie picked up a french fry, looked at the ketchup, laid it down again. That's messed up. I had to agree. I'd researched that night for years and never heard a more garbled version. Rob also agreed, it turned out. Geez, Sophia, you got nearly everything wrong. I started to worry the frown would freeze on her face. What do you know about it? She asked. Mourn you, I was here. I heard a snort by the cash register. Sure you were. The counterman, Aldo by his name tag, had gotten interested. Half the university was here that night, if you believe everyone. He stepped closer. No offense, kid, 
but if a tenth the people that say they were here really were, this place would have looked like the biggest phone booth stuffing stunt in history. Rob shrugged. I was, though. So were you and that black cook, Jerome. You used to wear a red apron. Hey, yeah, I did. That thing saved my balls that night. Jerome dropped his flipper, crawling under the counter, and I slipped on the grease and hit the fryer, splashed hot grease all over my front. I shucked that apron faster in Gypsy Rose Lee. If it hadn't been so thick, I'd have probably fried my man bits. He looked at Rob more closely. Where were you? Rob pointed down the counter's length. I'm the one who broke out that window. He leaned forward, elbows on the counter. You see... Sophia cut him off, gaping at Aldo. You saw that night and you still work here? Why shouldn't I? I gotta work somewhere. Well, but what if he came back? Aldo chuckled. What, you think he misses our burnt sugar pie? Her voice low and throaty, Carrie said. That's why I come here. We all laughed. Seriously, though, no reason he should come back here. It's probably just an accident he was here at all, just passing through. But the memories, how can you? Sophia looked at us, baffled. They should have closed this place, she said, a little loudly. Or put up a plaque or something. Oh God, Rob said. I bet you leave flowers at roadside crosses. He struck home with that. Tears flashing, Sophia said, My cousin was killed on Highway 207. My sister and I put up a cross for her. So it's not enough your cousin's dead. You gotta make total strangers feel bad. People die, Soph. You gotta grieve and go on. It's not fair to try and make the whole world grieve. She pulled a 20 out of her purse and shoved it blindly at Carrie. I gotta go. She ran out the door, tears in her eyes. That was pretty shitty, Carrie said. Rob looked abashed. Yeah, well, I really hate those crosses. Come on, Jacob, back me up. I shook my head. I don't like those crosses. I'm not big on grief, but Carrie's right. That was shitty. I didn't mind, though. Sophia had nothing useful for me. Aldo had already cleared away Sophia's dishes and laid her check by Carrie's plate. No rush, he said. I said, so what happened that night? Carrie looked at me and shrugged. Okay, yeah, what happened? Watching for Carrie to object, Rob slid onto Sophia's stool. I was here with a girl, I can't even remember her name anymore. We were sitting over there. He pointed at a short row of two-person booths. I didn't see the guy come in. He was alone at the counter and just starts growling and snarling, and he grows these giant claws like a bear. He stands up, and all of a sudden he's like seven feet tall. People are screaming and running for the door. Aldo nodded. Rob went on. A big guy, biker type, tries to get the guy in a headlock. The guy just reaches behind him and rips the biker guy's belly open, like it was paper. Now, when the bear guy first stood up, he broke his stool right off the floor. Aldo interrupted. The inspector made Cliff replace all the stools after that, said they weren't sturdy enough. Well, I'm lucky that one broke. It fell right by our booth. The bear guy and the biker were fighting and everybody else was pushing at the front door, and I just grabbed that stool and heaved it through the side window. My date and I jumped out and ran like hell, and a bunch of people came after us. That's where the other girl was killed. She tried to jump out the window and fell on broken glass, cut her belly open. I winced. Rob sipped his coffee. Freaky thing is, the bear guy didn't hurt anybody until the biker jumped him. He could have claimed self-defense. Ain't that how it went, Aldo? The counterman said, be right back and went to ring up a family. Staring at Rob, Carrie reached blindly for her soda. I took her hand and guided it. She faced me, pale and quiet, eyes wide. I shrugged. I wasn't here. That really happened? She turned back. Rob, you really saw that? Yeah, never been so shit scared in my life, except for the Ot 9 tornado. Guy was a complete freak. Didn't grow hair though, just got huge and grew claws. That's right, no hair. Aldo was back. I'm gonna tell Darla she ought to rename this place Rashomon. I knew what he meant, but the others looked blank. Say what, Carrie said. Rashomon? The Kurosawa movie? What's Kurosawa? Rob asked. Some kind of anime? 
He's a movie director. Geez, you kids don't watch anything wasn't made this millennium. I didn't bother telling him I preferred Kurosawa's Stray Dog. Anyway, Rashomon's about four people telling the same story, only they all see it different and tell it different. Carrie got the hint. So what's your version? He ticked a finger at Rob. You didn't get so much wrong as that little girl you ran off, but you didn't get it all right either. He came in kind of shaggy haired but nothing freaky. With a girl, same as you. They sat at the counter. I got him both burgers and they started eating and by and by I notice he's looking upset. She's looking real serious and I think, uh oh, she's giving him the dear John. Next thing I know he's out and out crying, not out loud, but just running tears and kind of hiccuping, you know. I think she's gonna walk out now, but instead she puts her arms around him and his face is just like a dam's breaking inside. He lets go this one big sob and then his face just, he stopped at a loss. His face just grows, Sep, that's not really it. There's more behind his face, and then he stands up. I heard the stool break, didn't know what it was, watching him. He was bigger and taller. You're right there, he must have been over seven foot, and he's got claws. No fangs though, not like people said, just the same teeth, and no new hair. Carrie grinned. Sorry, Jacob. Jerome's diving under the sink, that's when I slipped and hit the fryer time I got my apron off he'd already killed the one guy in the place is nuts. I saw a guy throw the stool through the glass. That was you? That guy had black hair, all dressed in black. Rob ran a hand over his sandy hair. I was doing a goth thing then. Even had black nail polish. Dad saw me in black lipstick one day. I thought he'd had a heart attack. Well, you threw the stool and I threw my apron over the guy's head and ducked under the counter with Jerome. We didn't stand up until we heard sirens. A couple years earlier, There'd have been a shotgun under the counter, but Cliff's wife made him take it out. We stand up and the place is empty except for two dead people. The one guy? I guess he did look kind of like a biker, but he worked at the hardware store. The girl? I never knew who she was. Jerome wanted to slide out the back. I made him stay and back me up. Like you'd think, the cops had a million questions. I just told them what I saw and made Jerome do the same. They thought it was nuts but four or five other people had come back after the cops showed up and told the same story, more or less. He poured coffee down the counter, refilled my cup and told Rob, there's another thing where you're wrong. He didn't have bear claws. They were more like a cat. I saw him sheathe them. The girl he'd been sitting with, he pushed her away before the hardware guy jumped him. Then them claws popped back out after he pushed her out of reach. He tried to protect her, but she was the girl got killed in the window. Aldo looked at me. Well? Rashomon's got four stories. What's yours? I wasn't there, I said. I've heard about it, made it kind of a hobby, but never heard so much detail. I never looked for you. I heard you'd quit. Guess somebody mixed up you and Jerome. Yeah, Jerome did quit, moved to Memphis, and Cliff sold the place to Darla a year later, but I'm still here. After that, there didn't seem to be any more to say. Carrie's appetite, even for burnt sugar pie, was gone. She paid her check and Sophia's, left a generous tip, out of her change, not Sophia's, and told us goodnight. I sat sipping coffee while Rob finished his onion rings. When we left, I noticed Rob left only around a 10% tip, about what I expected. We walked out together around the corner to the gravel lot. In the cool air, the moon bright above us, I said, Rosemary and Ginger. What's that? Rosemary and Ginger, the girl you were with and the girl who was killed. An herb and a spice, kind of a coincidence. He looked blank, then thoughtful. Could have been Rosemary. We never went out but that once. Met at a party, split up at a massacre. He frowned, reminding me comically of Sophia. How do you know? I met her about a year after that night. She didn't remember your name either. She never noticed you dyed your hair. I've been looking for a black-haired guy all this time. I looked up Carrie because I heard Sophia knew something. I never expected to luck onto you. What, you've been collecting everybody's story? You some sort of researcher, debunker? He scoffed. You got a blog? No, just trying to find out what happened to Ginger. I leaned against Rob's dodge. She was my best friend in high school, like a kid sister. 
We'd have probably got married, but turned out we were both gay. Rob stiffened and pulled away. Oh, relax, numbnuts. I'm not going to rape you in the parking lot. Geez, the whole world revolves around you, doesn't it? He managed to look a little shamefaced. So she went to college and I went to work, and I didn't see her for a couple of years, just talked on the phone every week or two. I could sense Rob's impatience. What's this got to do with me? Then something really bad happened to me and I needed to talk about it. I called her and we made a date to meet here. I showed up late. You said you weren't here. The first trace of fear was in his voice. I can tell lies too. I saw the two hit him. I'm going bald anyway, but I shaved my head and grew a beard when I started researching, in case anybody remembered me here. In your case, it's wasted effort. You're too self-centered, self-important to remember me. Was it you? He looked up at the moon two days past full. I never hurt you, man. Ginger and I were at the counter. I told her I'd lost a month of my life. I still don't know what happened. One day it was middle of June and I'm at home. The next it's nearly the end of July. And all I remember in between is something like a long restless night with a lot of weird dreams. My phone's gone and I'm miles from home in torn up clothes. N and there was something else wrong, something I couldn't talk to anybody about. So I called Ginger and we're here at the counter and I start crying cause it hurts so much to talk about. And that triggers the change. He swallowed. Not the moon. Nope. Grief. Nobody loves me. Dog ran away. Mom just died. Heartache. I shrugged. Like I said before, I'm not big on grief. I'm more the bottle everything up sort, long as I can remember. But Ginger put her arms around me and... Boom. I could hardly hear him. He'd grown so breathless. Why are you telling me this? Rosemary told a different version of the story. For one thing, you ran off and left her for the monster to eat. And she couldn't remember your name, so she never said anything to the cops about how Ginger died. But when I found her, she told me. She saw me change and saw you throw the stool. She saw me push Ginger back out of harm's way. And she saw you grab Ginger and push her across the window frame, across the broken glass, so you could use her as a stepping stone to get out. He was trembling from head to foot. I smelled where he'd soiled his pants. Okay, Ginger, I thought. I can be sad now. I thought about my friend, about how much we'd shared. I thought about her embracing me that last night and felt tears begin to sting. God, Ginger, I cried out. I miss you so much. Sometimes it's necessary to let the grief out. His face streaked with tears. He writhed in his seat. His legs stretched. Bare ankle appeared below his jeans. His shirt pulled loose, his back hunching, his head pressed to my car's roof. I saw claws, sharp and heavy, slide from beneath his fingernails. Underneath his face, the bones shifted shape. The brow rose and sloped. The lower jaw lengthened front and rear. Muscles bulged in his face, telling of terrible power in his bite. I'd been hunting for the so-called werewolf who killed my sister. Now he was in my passenger seat, and I had only seconds to decide what to do. One August evening four years ago, my sister, Ginger Ames, died at the Square Diner in Drunken Tree. The coroner ruled her death accidental. She fell on broken glass when people were running away in panic. Even if that was true, I still blamed the bastard who started the panic. The man who killed Ginger was described as about five foot 10 to six foot, wavy dark blonde hair loose to his shoulders, clean shaven brown eyes, no scars. 20 people there, but no photos. That's panic for you. Ordinary looking, except when he was seven feet tall and had claws he could sheathe like a cat's. That description's from the man who served his burger and fries, just before he started crying, grew a foot taller and started killing people. This fall, a man named Robert Souter was torn open in the parking lot of the same diner. His friend Carrie White said they'd been discussing Ginger's death. Souter had been a witness that night. Another man, Jacob Evers, had been with Carrie and Souter. She'd dated Evers several times. She introduced Evers to Souter. They all had dinner together, but she left before they did. Souter was found dead in the parking lot. Evers hasn't been seen since. Jacob Evers was described as 5'9 to 6 foot, 
hazel eyes, bald, full blonde beard. Ordinary looking, aside from the whiskers. Carrie White said he had no scars or tattoos anywhere. She'd had opportunity to see. Police said the name is probably false. Four years ago, right after Ginger's funeral, I met with Leanne Gross. Leanne had been Ginger's lover for about a year. A few months before Ginger was killed, they'd quietly split up. But they'd remained close friends and talked frequently. Now I learned that Leanne spoke to Ginger the night she was killed. She called me, asked if Travis had come by. They talked all the time, you know. I knew. Travis Mosley and Ginger had been best friends since Argenta Junior High, closer than siblings. Though I was a couple of years younger, he'd been my friend too as much as anybody so bottled up could be. Travis was a stoic, never betraying hurt or anger. Though he had a warm grin, he only rarely showed excitement or affection. Only Ginger could open him up. All our parents expected them to get married. Then they both announced they were gay the same week. That had rattled me. I'd never had a gay friend before, didn't know how to take it. But when I saw how he stuck by Ginger during our parents' first angry, frightened reactions, I realized I owed him the same loyalty. He disappeared for a while earlier that summer. When he reappeared, he claimed not to know where he'd been. Ginger was the only one who really believed him. Even his parents thought he was hiding something. I didn't know what to believe. I backed him because Ginger did. Now Leanne told me that Ginger and Travis had planned to meet at the Square Diner. Ginger had called Leanne because Travis was late and hadn't called her. Leanne said, Ginger thought maybe he'd come by here to get her, not remembering we split up. I toyed with the idea that Travis was the werewolf. Travis was the right size and build, a bit under six feet, and blonde. All the descriptions called the guy ordinary looking, until he changed. And Travis was the complete guy next door. Ordinary as oatmeal except for two stark scars on his chin and cheek from a bicycle wreck. I was ashamed for even considering him. Travis crying in public? Laughable. And I absolutely couldn't believe he'd hurt Ginger. He'd have died first. Travis hadn't come to Ginger's funeral though, a real shock. He'd holed up in his parents' house in Argenta, absolutely crushed by her death. I'd gone by to visit and found him sitting in a darkened bedroom. Though glad to see me, at first he'd hardly talk. When he did, his voice was flat. It's like a curse. First I lose a month, then I lose Ginger. Something happens to mom and dad. No way I could stand that. I'd just die. I'd never heard that much emotion from him. A week or two later, he took off. Closed his apartment, stored his stuff, and left town. He called his parents every week or two, but never told them where he was. He turned off friend tracking on his phone. I didn't see him for four years. About the time Travis left, I talked to the server in the diner. Only a few weeks after Ginger's funeral, Marcus Alderizio's story was already well rehearsed. Aldo said Ginger and this blonde-haired fellow came in together. The man started crying. I thought she was giving him the dear John, said Aldo. He started crying, then he changed. I was closer than anybody else, Aldo said. Right across the counter. I could see tears dripping off his chin. I can tell you, he didn't sprout hair or big fangs, none of that. But his bones changed. When he stood up, he was over seven foot. And he had claws like a cat that he could sheath or pop out. A lady screamed, but the real panic didn't start until some working class hero type tried to wrestle the cat man to the ground. He eviscerated the idiot. When guts hit the floor, the diner went crazy. Less than a minute later, Ginger was dying her belly ripped by glass. She bled to death before paramedics arrived. The coroner found bruises on her back from feet. Hating myself, I showed Aldo a photo of Travis on my phone. Small as the image was, he immediately picked out the facial scars. Same kind of face, real John Doe type, but this guy didn't have so much as an acne scar. Perfect skin. Two days after Suter's murder, I talked again to Aldo. Before he'd say a word, I had to remind him I was Ginger's brother and that we'd talked four years earlier. But he wasn't much help regarding Jacob Evers. I told the cops, I don't know if it's the same guy. I couldn't pick either one of them out of a decent lineup they got that kind of face. Joe average face, no scars, no tattoos, just that beard. I'd recognize this guy's voice again. Maybe, we talked that much, but his face? 
could be anybody. At least this time I could be sure it wasn't Travis, since Jacob had slept with Carrie White. Some small comfort. How do you find a werewolf? Or were cat? The cops thought it was some sort of stunt and were checking all of Ginger's acquaintances. They'd investigated Travis too, but I still felt guilty. In four years while I was in college, they found no leads on the diner killer. Now, with Robert Souter, there'd been another killing. They wouldn't say whether they thought it was the same killer. But either way, they weren't looking for a shapeshifter with cat claws. I was. A shapeshifter who cried. My granddad used to say of someone, he was raised breathing drunken tree lake. He meant that people who move to the area don't have the same attitudes as people who grew up here. And people who grew up in town don't have the same attitudes as those who lived along the shore or in the hills. Things happen around here. Sometimes people make things happen. This fall, after wondering for four years about Ginger's death, I wanted to make something happen. I looked up a lady who'd been my grandmother's friend when I was little and asked her what she remembered about Ginger's death. If she'd blamed it on drugs like the newspapers, I'd have visited a while and gone home. But she said, that was a terrible thing and that creature's still around somewhere. You heard he killed another man last week? When I told her what I wanted, she warned, some of those folks can be as dangerous as the thing that killed Ginger. You should keep your distance from them. I told her I had to find the cat man whatever it took. You're fixing to do it anyway, she said finally. So I suppose I ought to steer you to the right people. Let me ask about, see who's still walking this earth. I left my number. A week later, she called me. There's a man named Yuri White, lives on Grace Mountain, Jackson Road. He won't do anything, but he'll put you in touch. She read me a number. Yuri White, Jackson Road. Mr. White to you, he's uppish that way. Mr. White refused to talk on the phone or invite me to his home. I'll meet you at the old Second Baptist downtown Argenta. You know it? Across from Guthrie Park? That's it. I'll be there at three to meet someone else. If you come, we'll talk. I'll have a black necktie. Guthrie Park is a square block on JFK. Crossing the park to Second Baptist Church, I spotted a broad-shouldered bald guy with a blonde beard, maybe 40, leaning against a historic marker, gazing up at the church. I tensed, then relaxed. Since Souter was killed, I'd been clenching up at every bald, bearded blonde I saw. The little church had closed down, I discovered. A sign said it would soon be a neighborhood resource center. Inside, several young people in jeans and t-shirts worked at scrubbing and painting concrete block walls. The color of Mr. White's tie was irrelevant. Nobody else even had a collar. He was a tall, thin man, perhaps in his late 60s, with thick snow-white hair and a narrow mustache. I briefly told Ginger's story. I want to find him, I said. Landy said you knew people. Perhaps. Have you heard of the Coterie? The what? No, sir. Good. You shouldn't have. And it would be good if no one heard of them from you. He smiled thinly. One of them is likely to have the required skill, and this sort of case often interests them. He stooped toward me. They will expect a substantial payment. Are you prepared to pay? I remembered standing by Ginger's grave sweating in my best suit. If I can afford it, sir, I'll pay whatever it takes. The bearded guy still stood looking at the church. His eyes flicked to me as I came out, looked away then came back more sharply. Rick, he said. The voice rang bells, but the face didn't. Sorry? He grinned, obviously unsurprised at my lack of recognition. Even with a beard, that grin was familiar and took 15 years off him. I looked at the tanned scalp, the whiskered jaw. Travis? Hey man, how you been? He'd grown thin since I'd last seen him. The broad shoulders only emphasized that, and that bare scalp, cancer but there was a robustness to him that belied that thought. Clean, I thought, then couldn't think why. Where the hell have you been? It just burst out. He'd been such a part of Ginger's life. Then, he'd fallen off the earth. Before he answered, he walked right up and put his arms around me. I returned his embrace somewhat hesitantly, 
unused to such display from him. He stepped back and looked me over. I've been kind of messed up, he said. I lost more in a month of my life and I'm still hunting for it. You still don't know how? Jesus, your mom must have called Ginger 200 times while you were missing, asking had she heard from you. Where have you been since? Around. You'd have seen me, but I hear you went to Texas a and -M. He punched me on the shoulder. Traitor. I had to get away after Ginger and I couldn't stay home. Compared to Arkansas, Texas is like a foreign goddamn country. Yeah, Ginger messed me up too. I spent so much time trying to find out what happened to her. Me too, whenever I came home. You believe in this werewolf shit? Not one goddamn bit. His jaw clenched. I believe in plain old human fuckery. That's more than enough. Listen, I, uh, I've got to get to the bank. Are you at your mom's house? We should talk, compare notes. Maybe between us we've got all the pieces. He cocked his head. You mean you've actually found out something? I must have talked to a hundred people who said they were there that night, and not more than ten of them were for real. I think I've got a lead, at least, but I really have to get across town. You carry a phone, right? I sent him a text, so we had each other's numbers. I was in line at the bank when my phone rang. Two thousand dollars, Mr. White told me. Five hundred in advance for our expenses. Fifteen hundred if and when we find him. If we can't, we don't bill you. I whistled softly. That's a lot. This requires more than a Craigslist ad, Mr. Ames. Our techniques can be dangerous, even when we aren't seeking a known killer. Earlier he'd said they, not we. How fast do you need the five? Please have it by this evening. Somebody will come for it. She'll call herself Kitty. Free spirit, huh? No, Mr. Ames, a very efficient hunter. She couldn't have been 16 yet skinny and cultish, but she scared me. When I opened my door, she stood on my porch, twitching like an open switchblade. The sunset flamed against her strawberry blonde hair. I'm Kite. I'd have sooner invited a hooded cobra into my apartment, but she slipped in before I could protest. I had the urge to check my ribs for slashes. I gave her a $500 cashier's check, and she gave me a receipt. We'll keep her white in for med. When she was gone, I drew a deep breath and felt myself shuddering. Our techniques can be dangerous, Mr. White had said. She was scary as hell, but seemed like she'd be fast and efficient. I had no idea how fast things were about to move. In two hours, I'd know nearly everything. Fifteen minutes after Kite left, someone knocked. My heart pounding, fearful she'd returned, I opened the door. Travis stood there. The sunset had already faded. Thin, hairless. His beard grayed in the twilight, he looked like the ghost of Travis yet to come. Hey man, he said softly. Your mom told me where you live. This a good time to talk? Yeah, sure, come on in. Don't like talking inside, how about we go for a drive around the lake? I started to protest, but something in his face stopped me. There was a look of tremendous calm, even peace about him. But it was the peace of someone who has swallowed an enormous pain certain of his capacity to absorb it. Yeah, sure, I said again. Let me go pee and grab a drink. Driving north through the marina district, we exchanged news about our families, our parents, his grandfather, my older brother Gary in Atlanta. Not until we hit the quiet, dark, tree-flanked roads of Grace Mountain did our talk turn to Ginger. I summarized what I'd learned over the years, though I didn't admit showing his photo to Aldo. He listened intently, without commenting. At the end, he said, Well, it's too bad, but you ain't got anything I didn't already have. But he didn't seem disappointed. In fact, he seemed almost relieved. I asked him what he knew that I didn't. I don't know, he said. I don't know if you're ready to hear some of it. What? Travis, that's not fair. She's my sister. But I watched his face close, growing distant. I realized something. Travis had been trying to open up with me as he had with Ginger. But I wasn't Ginger, and in the end he couldn't trust me that far. It hurt, but I resolved not to show it. So I realized something about myself. I was trying to be like Travis, stoic and strong. 
Before he came out, I'd have never guessed that a gay man would one day be my role model for tough. And a final revelation. Four years at A&MM hadn't taught me anything about dealing with death. Though older than Ginger had been when she died, I was still a kid, asking the grown-ups for help. We were winding down Grace Mountain Road, less than a minute from the center of Drunken Tree. To circle the lake, we'd turn east toward Shore Road, right past the Square Diner. I'd been by it often, small as Drunken Tree is to avoid the diner you'd have to avoid the whole town. But tonight, Ginger's memories were strong. I signaled a right turn, my grip painfully tight on the wheel. There in the bright lights, people sat eating supper. Well, if you won't help me, I said, somebody else will. I've been talking to people. They think they can find the guy with the claws. I stopped, embarrassed to say more. Who the hell told you that? Don't snap at. Sorry, I just feel so damn silly saying it. They're witches. You know the stories around here. Witchcraft. Covens up in the hills. They can find things cops can't. He sucked in sharply. You were at the church. Who was it? People called the Coterie. They say they can help. Oh Christ, Rick, are you crazy? They're dangerous. How the hell did you even hear of the Coterie? I asked around old folks. You know the people I could ask. The village fell behind us. From here to the dam, Shore Road was woodland and houses on large private tracks with a few shoreside developments. The old money lived here, north of the lake. Oh Jesus, you don't know who you're messing with. Did any of them give you a name? A girl named Kite, just a kid. Oh shit, oh Christ. Those people will kill you if you screw with them. Why the hell did you go to them? I started to cry, blurring my headlights on the curves. I loved her so much, I choked out. But she trusted you. I was just the little pest brother. His face worked. Shit. No man. She was hella proud of you. Aggie scholarship and all that. She talked about you all the... He broke off. By passing headlights, I saw tears glisten in his eyes. And I saw something else. His beard covered his chin and his jawline, but not his upper cheeks. Clean, I'd thought, in Guthrie Park, and wondered why. The beard had confused me, but the white scar was gone from his left cheek. Without thinking, I pressed the gas. In moments, I was going over 50 rural mailboxes flashing past. I couldn't ask the question in my mind, who are you? Instead, I asked, why were you late? If you got there on time, you could have protected her. He groaned. I was there. I tried to protect her. I glanced at him. He'd squeezed his eyes tight, fighting the tears streaming down his face. He started crying, Aldo said. Then he changed. As Travis changed now, my friend, my sister's best friend, changed into something I couldn't explain. I pressed the gas harder. If I went fast enough, maybe he wouldn't dare attack. I whipped around a curve, tires squalling, claws sprang out to grip my dash. His growls laid a ghastly baseline beneath my shrieking tires. If he attacked me, or if I found the courage, I would slam my car's passenger side against one of the huge old hickories flashing by. Would it kill him? Even hurt him? Crazily, I thought of the times I'd considered having a silver-bladed knife made just for this scene, this confrontation with my sister's killer. I came out of a curve half sideways and fought the car back into its lane. I knew Shore Road, but not at this speed. I glanced toward Travis. He sat braced in his seat, lips drawn back, jaws clenched. His voice was thick, guttural. Rick, please slow down. I shot past a westbound pickup at 80. You killed her. You got her killed. My own voice was tight, raised just over the road noise. He terrified me, but so did my speed. A tree appeared on the right, very near the road. I tried to twitch the wheel toward it, but my arms wouldn't obey, or obeyed a deeper command. I didn't hurt her, he growled, a voice from the pit. Another man killed her, on purpose. You gotta believe me. Now a ditch ran along the road's right side. I'd missed my chance with trees over there. Tall poles for high-tension lines were flashing by on the left, shining in moonlight, too far from the road. Then I remembered the bridge over Possum Walk Creek, a short stretch to accelerate, a quick twitch to the right, and a concrete post would tear off everything behind my right headlight. 
He must have seen my eyes change as the bridge came into sight. As I floored the gas, he leaped at me, roaring. My last hesitation overcome, I turned squarely toward the bridge pillar. One clawed hand snatched at the wheel, tearing a gash across my raised arm. The other grabbed the transmission lever and chunked it into neutral. The engine screamed, racing. For a frantic half-second we fought the wheel. I heard a hard bam and tearing sounds. Then we shot off the far end of the bridge and slid sideways into a chain-link fence. The car reared onto its side and Travis fell on me. I couldn't move, pinned by his arms. I waited for the claws to rip into me. And waited. Are you done? Travis rumbled. If you are, we need to get out of here. Somebody will call the cops. He pulled himself off of me, up into the passenger seat. Wedging himself there, he shoved his weight back and forth, rocking the car against the fence. After three or four well-timed shoves, the car toppled, whamming down onto four wheels. Amazingly, the engine was still running. By feel, not taking my eyes off him, I shifted into reverse, pulled away from the fence, then pulled forward to swing onto the pavement. He opened his door and stepped out. I'll find you, I said. You can't get... Don't be a dweeb, he said, startling me into silence. I'm just gonna check the car. He walked around. I heard, holy crap, followed by the creak of metal and crackle of plastic. Turn around, go back to the bridge. We gotta pick up your bumper before some poor dumbass runs over it. Hardly believing myself, I did as he said. My rear bumper lay half across the road. With arms unnaturally long, he picked it up, opened my rear door, and wedged it into my back seat. That's gonna cost you some. He climbed into the front, bending almost double to fit. Not a mark on the right side until just behind the rear wheel. A foot further back, you'd have missed the post completely. Six inches forward, you'd have lost the wheel. He pointed east. Turn around, drive. I drove. I could never hurt you, Rick, he said. He shook his head. I didn't hurt Ginger either. She was safe or should have been. Fresh tears in his eyes, he told me the true story of how Ginger died. I only interrupted once to exclaim, you slept with Carrie White just to find someone she knew. Yeah, I'm not proud of that, but I would have done worse to find that guy. When it was over, I should have had a thousand questions, but I only had three. When I saw you tonight, I thought you looked well peaceful. Is that why? Because you got the truth about Ginger? Peaceful? Oh man, I wish. But yeah, I feel better than I have for a long time. You haven't said how do you change back? Start laughing? I guess to him it was a chuckle. It sounded like a bulldozer breaking up pavement. I wish. No, it's what you said first. I gotta get peaceful. I have to let go of myself. That bulldozer sound again. It's as hard as letting myself cry. I'm too uptight even when I ought to relax. I couldn't think of but one answer for that. I pulled into the Falk Dam parking lot, put the car in park, and walked around to his door. Get out, I said. He frowned up at me, but then clambered out, standing up, and up, and up. I hugged him, something I hadn't done since we were kids. It was weirdly like being ten years old again when he was twelve and sprouting like a chinaberry tree. My head rested on his chest. I've got you. I told him now. Just for a little while. Let me hold on to everything for you. First he cried. Then a car passed and he gave a soundless laugh. We look like a fine couple, I bet. And finally, I felt the tension go out of his back, out of his chest. Stand back, he hissed. From a pace away, I watched him shrink to the Travis Mosley I knew. He drew a deep breath of the cold night air and grinned a familiar grin, warm but shallow. He was already rebuilding his walls. I knew now they held a door for me, as they had for Ginger. I asked my last question. Why were you at Second Baptist? I already suspected the answer. I was following a woman. I think she's Coterie, but I don't think she knows about me. She's a witch, I'm pretty sure. But not all the Coterie are bad. I want information and I think she'll talk to me. He jerked his head at the car. We climbed back in. You know I lost a month. By now you can guess that's when this happened to me, when I became whatever the hell I am. Not a werecat, even with those claws. All stretched out like that, you're about as cat-like as a blue heron. 
Where giraffe? He laughed, a nice normal laugh. Let's stick with werewolf. The laugh stopped. That's when I was changed. And now I'm pretty sure who did it. The coterie made me a werewolf. We reached the Taylor Branch Bridge below the dam. He looked up at the glaring lights and the high concrete wall. And that makes the coterie the bastards that got Ginger killed. We drove south toward home, his face as hard as Fulk Dam. The full moon hung low in the inky sky, casting an eerie glow over the desolate forest. A chill wind rustled the leaves, carrying with it a sense of impending dread. In the heart of the woods, a small cabin stood, its windows boarded up and its door reinforced with heavy chains. Inside, a man named Jack huddled, clutching a silver dagger with trembling hands. Jack had ventured into the forest in search of solitude, hoping to escape the troubles of the world. But as the sun dipped below the horizon, the forest came alive with sinister secrets. He had heard the tales, the warnings of the locals. This forest was home to a pack of werewolves. The wind howled through the trees, and Jack's heart pounded in his chest. He had barricaded himself in the cabin, hoping that the crude defenses he had assembled would hold against the creatures that prowled outside. The cabin's walls creaked, and the flickering candlelight cast eerie shadows on the wooden beams. Jack's fear gnawed at him, his mind racing with thoughts of the horrors that lurked in the darkness. Outside the werewolves gathered, their eyes, once human, now burned with an unholy hunger. Their snouts twitched as they caught Jack's scent, and their muzzles curled into malevolent grins. This night, the moon's pull was strong and their transformation was imminent. As the clock struck midnight, the first transformation began. Bones cracked and flesh stretched as the humans within contorted into monstrous forms. Fur sprouted from their skin, teeth elongated into sharp fangs, and claws emerged from their fingertips. They howled in agony and ecstasy, embracing their newfound power. Inside the cabin, Jack's blood ran cold as he heard the gruesome symphony of their transformation. His mind raced, and his grip on the silver dagger tightened. He knew that silver was their weakness, the only weapon that could kill a werewolf. But he had only one, and there were at least four of them outside. The cabin shuddered as one of the werewolves slammed into the door, its immense strength threatening to break through. Jack's heart raced, and he knew he had to act fast. He lit a bundle of dried herbs and tossed it into the fireplace, creating a cloud of thick, acrid smoke that filled the room. The pungent aroma stung his eyes and made it difficult to breathe, but he hoped it would deter the creatures outside. Outside, the werewolves recoiled at the noxious fumes. Their keen senses were overwhelmed, and they stepped back from the cabin, howling in agony. Jack seized the opportunity and smashed a window, frantically crawling out onto the moonlit forest floor. The silver dagger was clutched tightly in his hand. The forest seemed to come alive around him as if the very trees conspired with the werewolves. Branches reached out to grab at him, roots snaked up to trip him, and the wind whispered eerie warnings in his ear. But Jack pressed on, determined to survive the night. The werewolves, recovering from the smoke, gave chase. Their powerful limbs carried them swiftly through the forest, and their predatory instincts drove them forward. Jack's heart pounded in his chest as he sprinted through the moonlit underbrush, desperately searching for a way to escape. He stumbled upon an old, decrepit well and skidded to a halt. It was his only chance. With trembling hands, he tossed the silver dagger into the darkness below, hoping it would find its mark. The dagger disappeared into the depths of the well with a faint, echoing clink. The werewolves closed in, their eyes gleaming with hunger, their snarls growing louder. Jack backed away from the well, his mind racing. Suddenly, an otherworldly howl pierced the night. The ground trembled, and the tree shook as a massive figure emerged from the shadows. It was an alpha werewolf, towering over the others with a commanding presence. Its fur was a silvery gray, and its eyes burned with a malevolent intelligence. The other werewolves, recognizing their leader, lowered their heads in submission. The alpha werewolf turned its attention to Jack, who stood frozen in terror. But instead of attacking, it spoke in a haunting, raspy voice. You have shown cunning and bravery, human. We spare your life this night, but remember this. The forest is ours, and we are its protectors. Never return. With that, the alpha werewolf and its pack melted back into the shadows, 
disappearing into the depths of the forest. Jack stood there trembling as the moonlight slowly faded and the forest returned to an eerie calm. He knew he had narrowly escaped death that night and he would heed the warning of the alpha werewolf. The forest held secrets and terrors beyond imagination and it was a place best left unexplored. Jack turned and fled, vowing never to return to the moonlit terror of that cursed woods. The cabin would remain abandoned, a grim reminder of the night when a lone human faced the wrath of the werewolves beneath the full moon's gaze. In the remote village of Ravenscroft, nestled deep within the shadowy embrace of an ancient forest, there was a chilling legend that haunted the locals for generations. Every century, on the night of the Blood Moon, a sinister curse befell one unsuspecting resident, transforming them into a ravenous beast, a werewolf. Lucas Connolly, a reserved librarian with a penchant for books on the supernatural, had always dismissed the legend as mere folklore. But as the night of the Blood Moon approached, strange occurrences began to unfold. The village's atmosphere grew tense, and whispers of dread echoed through the cobblestone streets. On the fateful night, Lucas found himself unable to sleep, the ominous crimson glow of the Blood Moon seeping through his window. A peculiar sensation gnawed at him, as if an unseen force beckoned him into the forest. Against his better judgment, he ventured out with a silver dagger hidden beneath his coat. The forest was shrouded in eerie silence, the only sound being the faint rustle of leaves beneath his feet. Moonlight filtered through the ancient trees, casting ominous patterns on the forest floor. Lucas's heart pounded, and he couldn't shake the feeling that he was being watched. As he delved deeper into the woods, he stumbled upon a clearing bathed in the eerie red light of the blood moon. At its center stood a circle of gnarled trees, their twisted branches forming a grotesque archway. Lucas sensed a malevolent presence in the air, and his skin prickled with fear. Suddenly, a chorus of agonizing howls erupted from the shadows. Lucas spun around, his heart in his throat, and there, emerging from the darkness, were the werewolves. Their eyes glinted with an unnatural hunger, and their fangs glistened in the dim light. Before Lucas could react, the largest of the werewolves lunged at him, teeth bared. He fumbled for the silver dagger and managed to thrust it into the creature's side. The beast howled in pain, retreating into the shadows, but Lucas knew it wouldn't be long before it returned. He darted through the forest pursued by the relentless pack. Their snarls echoed in his ears, and their hot breath brushed against his neck. The village seemed impossibly distant, and Lucas's hope dwindled with each passing second. As the werewolves closed in, their claws grazing his back, Lucas stumbled upon an old dilapidated chapel hidden deep in the woods. Desperation fueled his strength as he flung open the heavy wooden door and darted inside. The sanctuary was dark, save for the feeble light of a flickering candle. The werewolves prowled just beyond the chapel's entrance, their eyes burning with a fierce hunger. Lucas knew that he was trapped, with no way to fend off the relentless pack. He clutched the silver dagger, his knuckles white with fear. It was then that a haunting, melodic chant filled the air, emanating from the candle's flickering flame. The ethereal voice seemed to beckon to the werewolves, luring them away from the chapel one by one. They hesitated, their heads tilting in confusion, before disappearing into the depths of the forest. Lucas watched in awe as the last of the werewolves vanished, leaving him alone in the eerie chapel. The voice faded, and the candle's flame returned to its gentle glow. He realized that he had been saved by a supernatural force, one that had kept the curse at bay for another century. The blood moon waned, and the village of Ravenscroft returned to an uneasy calm. Lucas Connolly, forever changed by his encounter with the werewolves, vowed to protect the village from the curse. He became the guardian of the forest, ensuring that the malevolent beasts would remain at bay for generations to come. But as he stood in the eerie chapel, he couldn't help but wonder about the mysterious force that had come to his aid, a force that seemed both otherworldly and ancient, bound to the curse of the Blood Moon and forever intertwined with the dark secrets of Ravenscroft. In the remote village of Eldridge Hollow, Nestled deep within the dense, ancient forest, an unspeakable terror lurked beneath the pale glow of the moon. The villagers had lived in dread for generations, as every full moon brought forth the blood-curdling howls of creatures cursed by a dark secret. Isabella Thornton was a fearless hunter, 
known throughout the village for her unmatched skill with a crossbow. When her brother Gabriel went missing after venturing into the woods, she swore to find him, no matter the cost. She believed his disappearance was linked to the sinister legend of the Eldridge werewolves. As the moon waxed to its fullest, Isabella equipped herself with a silver-tipped arrow and set out into the eerie forest. She carried with her a small vial of wolfsbane, a rare herb known for its potency against supernatural creatures. Her determination was unwavering, fueled by a fierce love for her brother and a thirst for vengeance against the creatures rumored to have taken him. Deep in the forest, Isabella stumbled upon a clearing bathed in moonlight. There she found her brother Gabriel, his clothes torn and his face twisted with agony. He had become one of the Eldridge werewolves. Despair gripped her heart, but she knew there was no turning back. She raised her crossbow and aimed it at her transformed brother. The creature that was once Gabriel lunged at her with terrifying speed and strength. Isabella fired the silver-tipped arrow, hitting the werewolf in the shoulder. It howled in pain, but the wound did little to slow it down. Isabella quickly retreated, her heart pounding in her chest. As she fled through the haunted woods, Isabella's pursuit of vengeance became a desperate struggle for survival. The Eldridge werewolves closed in, their eyes gleaming with predatory hunger. Isabella's silver-tipped arrows and wolfsbane offered some protection, but the creatures were relentless. She stumbled upon an old, decrepit cabin, its windows shattered and its door barely hanging on its hinges. With the werewolves closing in, Isabella had no choice but to barricade herself inside. She prayed that the flimsy wooden planks and her remaining silver-tipped arrows would be enough to hold them at bay. The werewolves surrounded the cabin, their snarls and growls echoing through the night. Isabella, her back against the wall, clutched her crossbow tightly. She could hear their claws scratching at the wooden walls and their monstrous forms casting eerie shadows on the cabin's interior. Suddenly, the cabin's door burst open and a figure stepped inside. It was an elderly woman named Eliza, known as the village's wise woman. She had knowledge of the ancient curse that plagued Eldridge Hollow and had come to Isabella's aid. Eliza held out a small vial filled with a glowing silvery liquid. It was the key to breaking the curse, a potion crafted from rare herbs and moonlight. Isabella quickly consumed it, her body surging with newfound strength. As the werewolves closed in for a final assault, Isabella's transformation began. She felt the power of the moon coursing through her veins, but unlike the cursed Eldridge werewolves, she had control. Her eyes blazed with determination as she confronted the creatures that had terrorized her village for generations. A fierce battle ensued, silver-tipped arrows clashing against fangs and claws. Isabella, now a formidable adversary, fought with all her might. One by one, the Eldridge werewolves fell before her, their dark curse broken by the silver and moonlight. In the end, only her brother Gabriel remained. He lay wounded on the cabin floor, his eyes filled with regret. Isabella, with tears in her eyes, embraced him. With the last of her strength, she whispered the words that would release him from the curse. As the first light of dawn broke over Eldridge Hollow, Gabriel transformed back into a human. The curse was finally broken, and the village was free from the shadow of the Eldridge werewolves. Isabella and her brother returned to the village as heroes, their bravery celebrated by the grateful villagers. The forest, once a place of dread, was now a symbol of hope and triumph. The legend of the Eldridge werewolves became a cautionary tale, a reminder of the darkness that could be conquered by the light of love and determination. The small town of Ravenwood had always been a place of secrets and shadows, nestled deep within the dense, foreboding forests of the Pacific Northwest. For generations, the townsfolk had whispered tales of a curse that befell the Howler family, a curse that turned them into ravenous beasts when the blood moon hung low in the night sky. Lucy Howler, a young woman with auburn hair and a fierce determination, had grown up hearing the legends of her family's dark heritage. But when her father, Elias Howler, fell victim to the curse one fateful night, Lucy knew she had to uncover the truth. As the next blood moon approached, Lucy delved into her family's history. She discovered an old journal hidden away in the attic, its pages filled with the desperate scribblings of past howlers who had sought a way to break the curse. One entry spoke of a hidden grove deep in the forest, a place where the curse's origin was said to lie. With the journal as her guide, 
Lucy ventured into the ominous woods on the night of the blood moon, her heart pounding with fear and determination. The moon's eerie glow bathed the forest in an otherworldly light, casting elongated shadows that seemed to come alive. In the heart of the forest, Lucy found the hidden grove, its ancient trees twisted and contorted, their branches reaching out like skeletal fingers. In the center of the grove stood a gnarled oak tree, its roots sinking deep into the earth. A stone altar lay at its base, adorned with a silver amulet. As Lucy approached, she felt an overwhelming sense of dread. The amulet, pulsating with a sinister energy, was the source of her family's curse. With trembling hands, she recited an incantation she had uncovered in the journal, calling upon the spirits of the forest to aid her in breaking the curse. The ground trembled, and the wind whispered ancient secrets as the spirits answered her plea. The amulet began to crack, and a dark swirling mist emerged from its shattered form. Within the mist, the tormented souls of past howlers writhed in agony. The curse fought back with a vengeance, and the blood moon's light grew more intense. The very earth seemed to rebel against Lucy's efforts, roots rising from the ground to ensnare her. But Lucy's determination was unwavering. She reached into her pocket and pulled out a silver dagger. The last resort passed down through generations of howlers. With a swift, decisive strike, Lucy plunged the dagger into the heart of the swirling mist. A deafening howl echoed through the grove as the curse was shattered. The spirits of her ancestors found release, and the Blood Moon's malevolent influence waned. As dawn broke over Ravenwood, the curse that had plagued the Howler family for generations was finally broken. Lucy stood in the grove exhausted but triumphant, knowing that her family's dark legacy had come to an end. Word of Lucy's bravery spread throughout the town, and the people of Ravenwood celebrated her as a hero. The forests that had once been feared were now seen in a new light, their secrets no longer threatening. Lucy had faced the horrors of the Blood Moon's curse and emerged victorious, proving that even the darkest of legacies could be overcome with courage and determination. Nestled deep in the Appalachian wilderness, the remote town of Harrow's Hollow harbored a chilling secret. For generations, its residents lived in fear of the Blood Moon, a night when the town was plagued by a savage and bloodthirsty pack of werewolves. Olivia Mitchell, a renowned wildlife biologist, arrived in Harrow's Hollow on a crisp autumn day. Her research on wolf populations had brought her to this secluded town, but she soon discovered that the townsfolk's fear of wolves ran far deeper than any natural predator could explain. As night fell and the sky turned a deep crimson, Olivia found herself in the dimly lit bar, the Broken Fang. The locals, a mix of wary stares and hushed conversations, whispered about the impending blood moon and the horrors it brought. One man, an elderly hunter named Samuel, beckoned her closer, his voice trembling with fear. He told Olivia of the cursed blood moon, a night when their ancestors had made a dark pact with a malevolent spirit. In exchange for power, they were bound to a terrible curse, transforming into savage werewolves under the red moon's baleful light. Olivia's scientific skepticism wavered as she listened to the tales and saw the dread in their eyes. Intrigued, she resolved to stay and observe this phenomenon, even as Samuel urged her to leave before nightfall. The blood moon rose high in the sky, casting an eerie crimson glow over Harrow's hollow. Olivia, determined to uncover the truth, set out into the forest with her camera and recording equipment. She followed a stream deeper into the woods, the sound of running water masking her presence. As the moon reached its zenith, a low, haunting howl echoed through the forest. Olivia's heart raced as she realized the townsfolk's stories might be true. She huddled behind a thick tree, camera trained on the clearing ahead. One by one, they emerged from the shadows, their forms shifting and contorting in the moonlight. The werewolves were massive, their eyes gleaming with malevolence. Olivia's hands trembled as she captured the chilling transformation on film. She watched in horror as the pack set off on a hunt, their inhuman senses guiding them through the forest. Olivia knew she had to follow, to document their actions, but fear rooted her in place. As the night wore on, the cries of their victims echoed through the woods. Finally, she summoned the courage to track the pack deeper into the wilderness. She stumbled upon a gruesome scene, the remains of their victims strewn about in a grisly display. She felt a presence behind her and turned to see a lone werewolf, 
its eyes locked onto hers. In a flash, the creature lunged at her, its fangs bared. Olivia raised her camera on instinct, the blinding flash of the camera's burst momentarily disorienting the beast. She scrambled to her feet, racing through the forest with the werewolf in relentless pursuit. Branches clawed at her, and the underbrush seemed to conspire to slow her down. She could hear the creature's snarls growing closer, its hot breath on her neck. Desperation gave her strength, and she pushed herself to the limits of her endurance. At the edge of a precipice, Olivia made a daring leap, landing on the other side with a painful thud. The werewolf, unable to make the jump, howled in frustration from the other side. Olivia's heart pounded, but she had escaped the immediate danger. The night wore on, and as the blood moon waned, the werewolf's ferocity diminished. Olivia, exhausted and shaken, ventured back to Harrow's Hollow at daybreak. She had proof of the town's horrifying secret, but she knew she could never reveal it without endangering the town. Olivia Mitchell left Harrow's Hollow, haunted by the memory of the Blood Moon Hunt and the chilling realization that sometimes, the darkest secrets are best left hidden. The town's residents continued to live in fear, bound to a curse they could never escape as they awaited the next Blood Moon and the terror it would bring. Nestled deep in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, the sleepy town of Blackwood Ridge held a dark secret. For generations, the townsfolk whispered tales of a curse that had plagued their ancestors, a curse that transformed them into savage beasts under the light of the full moon. The curse had not manifested for decades, but the fear remained, passed down through the generations like a sinister heirloom. Charlotte Turner, a young and curious anthropologist, arrived in Blackwood Ridge to study the town's unique folklore. She was drawn to the eerie stories of the Ridge Runners, as the afflicted townsfolk were called, and the bizarre rituals they had developed to ward off the curse. Charlotte believed there was a scientific explanation behind these legends, a rational answer to the supernatural tales. Her investigations led her to the enigmatic Holloway family, whose lineage was intertwined with the Ridge Runners. Despite the townsfolk's warnings, Charlotte became close to the Holloways, especially Samuel Holloway a brooding and mysterious man with a haunted past. Samuel reluctantly agreed to help her with her research, but he carried a heavy burden of guilt and fear, the truth of which he concealed from Charlotte. As the full moon approached, Charlotte and Samuel delved deeper into their studies, collecting oral histories and analyzing old diaries and family records. The closer they got to the truth, the more unsettling their findings became. The Holloway family, they discovered, had a dark history of lycanthropy that dated back centuries, and the curse had reawakened in recent years. Charlotte remained skeptical, attributing the curse to a rare genetic disorder rather than supernatural causes. She believed that science could find a solution, but her optimism was about to be shattered. On a fateful night, as the full moon bathed Blackwood Ridge in an eerie silver light, Samuel and Charlotte ventured into the woods to collect samples for analysis. Unbeknownst to Charlotte, Samuel had hidden a terrible secret from her. He was a ridge runner himself, struggling to suppress the beast within. As the moon rose higher in the sky, the transformation began. His body contorted and twisted, fur sprouted, and his bones cracked in agonizing pain. The beast had awakened. Charlotte watched in horror as Samuel transformed into a monstrous creature, his eyes filled with primal hunger. She had to make a choice flee or confront the unthinkable truth. With trembling hands, she reached into her backpack and pulled out a syringe filled with a serum she had developed, hoping it would suppress the lycanthropic transformation. The creature that had been Samuel lunged at her, fangs bared, but Charlotte managed to plunge the syringe into its chest. A low guttural growl escaped Samuel's distorted throat as the serum took effect. The curse fought against the science, but Charlotte's determination was unyielding. The struggle raged on as Samuel fought to regain control, and Charlotte desperately whispered words of encouragement. Slowly, the beast's features began to soften, and its eyes regained their human semblance. Samuel, still partially transformed, collapsed to the forest floor, gasping for breath. The curse had been quelled, but not defeated. Samuel, his body bearing the scars of his nightly battles with the beast, confessed everything to Charlotte. He explained that the curse could never truly be eradicated, only controlled. The Holloways had kept their lycanthropic nature a secret to protect the town from the horrors they might unleash. Charlotte faced a choice, 
expose the truth to the world or protect Blackwood Ridge from the curse. In the end, her scientific curiosity yielded to her compassion. She promised Samuel that she would continue her research in secret, seeking a way to break the curse once and for all. As they stood in the moonlit forest, Charlotte and Samuel knew that their lives had been forever changed by the lycanthropic descent. The curse of Blackwood Ridge remained, but they vowed to face it together, standing as a beacon of hope in a town haunted by its supernatural legacy. In the heart of the remote Appalachian Mountains, a secluded village named Silverbrook clung to its ancient traditions and secrets. Every inhabitant knew of the sinister legends that plagued their home, the Curse of the Silver Fangs, a bloodline of werewolves who had terrorized the region for centuries. Amelia Caldwell, a young woman from the city, arrived in Silverbrook, seeking solace and a fresh start. She rented a rustic cabin nestled in the woods, far from the prying eyes of the villagers. Little did she know that her arrival would awaken the dormant horrors of the Silver Fang Curse. One fateful night, as the moon bathed the forest in its silvery light, Amelia heard a hauntingly beautiful howl that sent shivers down her spine. It echoed through the trees, a mournful symphony that spoke of ancient agony. Curiosity compelled her to investigate, and she ventured into the woods with a flashlight in hand. Amelia wandered deeper into the forest, the shadows closing in around her. Unbeknownst to her, a pack of werewolves, descendants of the accursed Silver Fangs, stalked her every move. They watched from the underbrush their eyes gleaming with a malevolent hunger. As the moon reached its zenith, the transformation began. Bones cracked, muscles rippled, and fur sprouted from their skin. The pack of werewolves embraced their monstrous forms, their howls blending with the eerie night. Amelia, now deep in the heart of the forest, stumbled upon a forgotten shrine. It was adorned with faded symbols and tattered scrolls, relics of an age-old struggle against the curse. Her flashlight flickered, casting eerie shadows on the shrine's moss-covered stones. The werewolves closed in, their predatory instincts guiding them toward their unsuspecting prey. Amelia's heart raced as she sensed the impending danger. She felt an inexplicable connection to the shrine, as if it held the key to her survival. Desperate and trembling, Amelia recited an incantation from one of the ancient scrolls, her voice quivering with fear. Unbeknownst to her, the incantation held the power to ward off the cursed creatures, a secret passed down through generations. A brilliant light erupted from the shrine, a radiant barrier that repelled the approaching werewolves. They howled in frustration and pain, unable to breach the protective circle. Amelia watched in awe as the creatures recoiled, their sinister eyes unable to meet the radiant glow. The standoff continued until the first light of dawn broke the spell. Weakened and defeated, the pack of werewolves retreated into the depths of the forest, their snarls fading into the distance. Amelia, shaken but alive, knew that her destiny was now irrevocably tied to the ancient curse of the Silver Fangs. She had stumbled upon the village's darkest secret, and the werewolves would not rest until they had claimed her as their own. Haunted by the knowledge of her new reality, Amelia vowed to unravel the mysteries of Silverbrook and confront the malevolent spirits that lurked in the moonlit shadows. As the next full moon approached, she prepared to face her destiny and challenge the curse that threatened to consume her life. Silverbrook's ancient secrets would not remain hidden for long, and Amelia would either break the curse or become its next victim, forever bound to the legacy of the Silver Fangs. In the remote village of Ravensbrook, Nestled deep in the shadowy embrace of the Blackwood Forest, there lived a recluse named Elias Gray. He was a man of few words, shunned by the superstitious villagers who believed he was cursed. Elias's family had carried a dark secret for generations. They were lycanthropes, cursed to transform into monstrous wolves under the light of the full moon. One fateful night, as the villagers gathered in the local tavern to share tales of the supernatural, a stranger arrived. Her name was Isabella, and she had come to Ravensbrook in search of a new life. Unaware of the village's dark history, she was drawn to Elias's mysterious demeanor and rented a small cottage nearby. As the full moon loomed, Elias felt the curse's grip on him tighten. He had managed to isolate himself during previous transformations, but with Isabella's arrival, the stakes had changed. 
He knew he had to keep his secret hidden, for fear of the villagers' wrath. On the night of the full moon, as the moon's glow bathed the village in an eerie light, Elias struggled to contain his transformation. Desperate, he locked himself in the basement, chaining himself to the stone walls. But the beast within him was relentless, and the chain strained as he howled in agony. Isabella, unable to sleep due to the chilling howls, followed the sound to the decrepit gray house. She stumbled upon the basement door, and her curiosity led her to descend into the darkness below. As she entered, she found herself face to face with the monstrous lycanthrope, Elias, trapped in his lupine form. Their eyes met, and something inexplicable passed between them. Isabella saw not a monster, but a man tormented by a curse. Elias, in turn, sensed a compassion in Isabella that he had not felt in years. It was a connection that transcended the boundaries of fear. Isabella, undaunted by the beast before her, approached Elias cautiously. She spoke softly, her voice filled with empathy. Miraculously, the lycanthrope's eyes softened, and his feral growls subsided. Isabella reached out and touched the creature's fur, her touch soothing his agony. Through the long, moonlit night, Isabella remained with Elias in the basement, offering comfort and companionship. As the first rays of dawn broke, Elias's transformation slowly reversed and he reverted to his human form, naked and vulnerable. Tears welled in Isabella's eyes as she covered him with a blanket. She had seen the humanity within the lycanthrope, and in that moment, she made a fateful decision. She would help Elias break the curse that had plagued his family for generations. Together, Isabella and Elias embarked on a perilous journey to uncover the origins of the curse. They delved into ancient texts, sought the wisdom of reclusive witches, and faced deadly challenges. As their bond deepened, so did their determination to free Elias from the lycanthrope's curse. Their quest led them to a forgotten shrine deep within the Blackwood Forest, where they confronted the malevolent spirit that had cast the curse upon Elias's bloodline. With bravery and sacrifice, they managed to break the curse's hold on Elias, but not without consequences. As the curse dissipated, Isabella found herself afflicted by a fragment of it, a faint trace that made her more attuned to the supernatural. She had willingly embraced Elias's world of darkness to save him. Ravensbrook's villagers remained unaware of the couple's struggle and triumph. Elias and Isabella chose to live their lives in seclusion, far from the judgmental eyes of the outside world. Together, they embraced the newfound bond forged in the crucible of the lycanthrope's curse finding love and redemption in the face of unspeakable horrors. Nestled deep within the rugged Appalachian Mountains, the sleepy town of Ravenswood harbored a chilling secret. For generations, the townsfolk had lived in fear of the blood curse that plagued their community. Every 20 years, under the eerie light of the blood moon, a malevolent force would awaken, transforming ordinary people into ravenous werewolves. Evelyn Carson, a young woman with an insatiable curiosity and an insuppressible wanderlust arrived in Ravenswood just days before the fateful event. She had come to study the town's folklore and its peculiar history for her doctoral thesis. The locals warned her about the impending blood moon, but Evelyn dismissed their superstitions as mere tales. As the ominous night approached, Evelyn decided to spend it at the town's ancient library, poring over dusty tomes and yellowed manuscripts. There, she discovered a hidden journal belonging to a long-forgotten historian who had documented the town's dark secret. The journal contained cryptic incantations and warnings of the impending curse. Unbeknownst to Evelyn, the journal's owner had paid the ultimate price for his knowledge, falling victim to the curse himself. Desperate to unravel the mystery, Evelyn committed the incantations to memory and ventured into the woods on the night of the blood moon. Under the eerie crimson glow, Evelyn recited the incantations, unleashing a dark force that coursed through her veins. She felt a surge of power and an overwhelming hunger. Her body twisted and contorted as she transformed into a beastly creature. The curse had claimed her. Evelyn's newfound senses led her to a pack of fellow werewolves, their feral eyes gleaming in the moonlight. They communicated through guttural growls and hunted as a pack, their prey unsuspecting travelers who had strayed too close to Ravenswood. Terrified of her own monstrous nature, Evelyn struggled to maintain her humanity amidst the chaos of the hunt. 
Her internal battle raged as she tried to protect the innocent victims from her fellow werewolves. Yet with every passing moment, the curse tightened its grip on her. As the blood moon began to wane, Evelyn's transformation grew more agonizing. Desperation forced her to seek the hidden journal once more, hoping to find a way to reverse the curse. She discovered a passage describing a sacred amulet rumored to break the curse's hold. With her pack close behind, Evelyn embarked on a perilous quest to find the amulet before the blood moon disappeared entirely. The journey took them deep into the heart of the Appalachian wilderness, where they faced treacherous terrain and nightmarish trials. Along the way, Evelyn's connection to her human side deepened. She learned to resist the werewolf's savage instincts and to communicate with her pack in their human forms. Together, they deciphered clues that led them to an ancient cave hidden high in the mountains. Inside the cave, Evelyn discovered the long-lost amulet, its blue gemstone radiating an otherworldly light. As the blood moon's last rays vanished, she clutched the amulet, its power surging through her. The curse began to unravel, and her pack members regained their human forms. With the curse broken, Evelyn and her pack returned to Ravenswood as ordinary humans, their memories of their time as werewolves forever etched into their minds. The town, freed from the cycle of the Blood Moon's curse, celebrated their return, and Evelyn's thesis on the dark folklore of Ravenswood became a local legend. But Evelyn knew that the curse could return in another 20 years, and she had learned the true cost of tampering with forbidden knowledge. As she gazed at the moonlit mountains, she vowed to protect Ravenswood from the curse's resurgence, even if it meant confronting the darkness within herself once more. Deep in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, nestled within the dense forests, there lay a forgotten town known as Silverwood. Abandoned for generations, it was rumored to harbor a sinister secret. This was a place where the moon's pale glow unleashed a blood-curdling terror. Isabella Morgan, an ambitious young journalist with a fascination for the occult, had heard the legends surrounding Silverwood for years. When she stumbled upon an old journal detailing strange occurrences in the town, she knew she had to investigate. The journal spoke of a curse that had plagued Silverwood for centuries, a curse that turned its inhabitants into monstrous creatures under the light of the full moon. Isabella arrived in Silverwood during the waning days of summer. The town's derelict buildings stood as grim sentinels, bearing witness to the horrors that had transpired. Her inquiries led her to an elderly resident named Elias, the last living soul to have witnessed the curse firsthand. Elias, his eyes clouded with memories of terror, shared the chilling history of Silverwood. The curse, he explained, had been inflicted upon the town by a vengeful witch centuries ago. Under the full moon, the townsfolk transformed into werewolves, their humanity consumed by savage instincts. Isabella was skeptical but determined to uncover the truth. As the full moon approached, she set up camp in the heart of Silverwood, armed with a silver knife and a sense of dread. She was determined to capture evidence of the transformation and expose the curse to the world. On the night of the full moon, the town fell into an eerie silence. Isabella watched from her hiding place as the moon's glow intensified, casting an eerie light over Silverwood. And then it began. The townspeople changed, their bodies contorted, bones cracking and flesh warping as they transformed into hideous creatures. Isabella's heart raced as she snapped photos of the gruesome scene. The werewolves, driven by an insatiable hunger, began to roam the streets. Their howls filled the night, echoing through the trees. Isabella's hands shook as she realized the danger she was in. One of the werewolves, larger and more menacing than the rest, caught Isabella's scent. With lightning speed, it closed in on her hiding place. Isabella knew that her silver knife was her only defense. She raised it, ready to face the beast. But before the werewolf could strike, a figure emerged from the shadows. It was Elias, the elderly resident who had shared the curse's history with her. He stood between Isabella and the creature, his voice ringing with authority as he recited an incantation from the ancient journal. The curse, it seemed, had not taken Elias. Instead, he had become the guardian of Silverwood, tasked with protecting outsiders who stumbled upon its dark secret. As he chanted the incantation, a powerful force enveloped the werewolf, causing it to writhe in agony. Isabella seized the opportunity to flee, her heart pounding as she raced through the moonlit forest. 
Behind her, the curse began to recede, the howls of the werewolves fading into the night. She emerged from the woods, her camera filled with chilling evidence of the curse's existence. Isabella's expose on the curse of Silverwood made headlines around the world. The town was left undisturbed, its secret hidden once more. Isabella, haunted by the memories of that night, vowed never to return. For Silverwood was a place where the moon's pale glow brought forth a horror that defied explanation. A place where the curse of the werewolves remained a dark and chilling secret. Nestled deep within the remote Appalachian Mountains, the tiny town of Whispering Pines harbored a sinister secret. For centuries, the townsfolk had lived in fear of the legendary curse that plagued their ancestors, a curse that transformed them into savage beasts under the light of the blood moon. The tale of the curse dated back to the founding of Whispering Pines when a group of settlers, led by a man named Samuel Thornfield, arrived in the area. They had trespassed on sacred land, unknowingly angering the ancient spirits that guarded it. In retaliation, the spirits had cursed the settlers and their descendants to become monstrous, bloodthirsty creatures whenever the blood moon rose. Eleanor Finch, a young woman with a thirst for adventure, arrived in Whispering Pines one chilly autumn evening. She had come to research the town's history for a book she intended to write. The townspeople welcomed her with wary smiles, but none dared to share the dark secret that lay hidden beneath their facade of normalcy. Eleanor's research led her to the long-forgotten journal of Samuel Thornfield, the town's founder. As she pored over the brittle pages, she uncovered chilling details about the curse and how it had tormented the Thornfield family for generations. Determined to unveil the truth, she sought out the last living Thornfield descendant, a reclusive man named Daniel. Daniel lived alone in a dilapidated cabin on the outskirts of town, far from the prying eyes of the townsfolk. He was haunted by his family's dark legacy and had become a recluse to protect others from the curse that ran through his veins. When Eleanor confronted him with the journal, he reluctantly agreed to help her decipher its cryptic clues. As they delved deeper into their research, Eleanor and Daniel discovered that a rare celestial event was approaching, the once-in-a-lifetime convergence of a supermoon and a blood moon. According to Samuel Thornfield's journal, this event held the key to breaking the curse. But time was running out, and the townsfolk grew increasingly suspicious of their investigations. On the night of the celestial convergence, Eleanor and Daniel ventured into the forbidden woods that surrounded Whispering Pines. The moon loomed large and crimson in the sky, casting an eerie glow over the trees. They followed the journal's instructions, reciting an incantation in an ancient language that had been passed down through the generations. Suddenly, the ground trembled, and a chorus of agonized howls pierced the night. The curse was awakened, and the townsfolk, now transformed into monstrous werewolves, closed in on Eleanor and Daniel. Their snarling faces, twisted by the curse, bore no resemblance to the friendly neighbors they once were. Eleanor and Daniel clung to each other as they faced the approaching horde, the incantation their only hope. The townsfolk, their lupine eyes fixed on their prey, lunged forward. At the last moment, as the werewolves closed in, the incantation took hold, and a blinding burst of light erupted from Eleanor and Daniel. The light washed over the werewolves, causing them to writhe in agony. It was as if the curse itself recoiled from the purity of their intentions. In a moment of excruciating pain, the curse was shattered, and the townsfolk were released from their torment. When the light finally subsided, the townsfolk, now human once more, lay on the forest floor, bewildered and disoriented. Eleanor and Daniel had succeeded in breaking the curse, but at a great cost. The townsfolk, their memories hazy, had no recollection of their time as werewolves or the curse that had plagued their ancestors. Eleanor and Daniel returned to Whispering Pines, their mission accomplished. The town was finally free from the Blood Moon's curse, but it was a bittersweet victory. They had sacrificed their own memories to save the town, their names and faces forgotten by the very people they had rescued. As the years passed, Eleanor and Daniel remained in Whispering Pines, living quiet lives among the townsfolk who had no idea of the heroes in their midst. The curse was gone, but the price they had paid was a reminder that some secrets were better left buried in the shadows of the past. In the remote village of Thornbrook, nestled deep in the heart of a dense ancient forest, an ominous legend hung over the townsfolk like a shadow. 
every generation, when the blood moon rose, a curse befell the village, and those who dared venture into the woods at night vanished without a trace. Elena Thornton had always been curious about the legend. Her family had lived in Thornbrook for generations, and as a child, she had heard the chilling tales of the blood moon curse from her grandmother. The curse spoke of vengeful spirits and feral creatures that roamed the forest during the blood moon. On the eve of the blood moon, Elena decided to unravel the mystery once and for all. She ventured into the forest, her flashlight cutting through the darkness like a thin beam of hope. The moon hung low in the sky, its crimson hue casting an eerie glow over the trees. A sense of foreboding gripped her, but she pressed on. As she delved deeper into the forest, Elena heard faint whispers on the wind, like the mournful cries of lost souls. Shadows danced among the trees, and she quickened her pace, her heart pounding with dread. She stumbled upon an ancient overgrown graveyard, its tombstones weathered by time. The whispers grew louder, and she felt an otherworldly presence. A sinister growl echoed through the night, causing Elena to freeze in her tracks. From the darkness emerged a pack of grotesque creatures, neither fully wolf nor fully human. Their eyes gleamed with malevolence, and their snarling lips revealed rows of razor-sharp teeth. Elena realized she had stumbled upon the cursed souls of Thornbrook, transformed into savage, bloodthirsty werewolves under the Blood Moon's influence. With a howl, the werewolves closed in on her, their intentions clear. Elena's flashlight flickered and died, plunging her into darkness. Desperation overcame her as she blindly fumbled for a weapon, and her hand landed on a small silver locket that had belonged to her grandmother. In a last-ditch effort, she held the locket aloft, and to her astonishment, it emitted a brilliant silvery light that banished the werewolves' darkness. They recoiled, howling in agony, their wolfish forms writhing in the silver's searing glow. Elena's heart raced as she realized the locket was a family heirloom, passed down for generations, said to possess the power to ward off supernatural creatures. With newfound resolve, she chanted an incantation she had heard from her grandmother, commanding the cursed souls to retreat. The werewolves, their forms shifting back to human, whimpered and fled into the forest, vanishing into the shadows. Elena watched them go, her breath ragged, the locket's silver light slowly fading. The Blood Moon's curse had been broken, and Thornbrook was safe once more. As the sun rose on the horizon, Elena returned to the village, clutching the locket tightly. The townsfolk marveled at her bravery, and the legend of the Blood Moon Curse would become a tale of her triumph over the supernatural forces that had plagued Thornbrook for centuries. Elena knew that the forest still held many secrets, but she had faced its darkest horrors and emerged victorious. With her grandmother's locket as a symbol of her family's resilience, she would continue to protect Thornbrook from the supernatural terrors that lurked in the shadows, ensuring that the curse of the Blood Moon would never again cast its malevolent influence over their lives. Asterisk asterisk title. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Blood Moon Descent asterisk. Natalie had always been drawn to the mysterious legends of the remote village of Ravenwood. Nestled in the heart of a dense, ancient forest, the village was known for its eerie tales of werewolves that emerged during the Blood Moon. When her grandmother passed away, Natalie received a letter from the village's solicitor. In it, she learned that she had inherited her grandmother's secluded cabin in Ravenwood. The news arrived just as the villagers began speaking in hushed tones about the impending Blood Moon. Ignoring the superstitious warnings of the villagers, Natalie set out to claim her inheritance. She arrived at the cabin on the eve of the Blood Moon, the sky a deep crimson hue. The villagers had barricaded themselves indoors, refusing to venture out on this ominous night. Inside the cabin, Natalie uncovered an old diary that had once belonged to her grandmother. Its pages were filled with cryptic writings and sketches of fierce, wolf-like creatures. As she read, she realized that her grandmother had been obsessed with uncovering the secrets of the village and its cursed blood moon. Curiosity peaked. Natalie delved deeper into the diary's pages, learning of an ancient ritual that her grandmother believed could reveal the truth about the werewolves. The ritual required venturing into the heart of the forest on the night of the Blood Moon, and offering a silver locket as a token of peace to the creatures. As the Blood Moon rose higher in the sky, casting eerie shadows through the cabin's windows, Natalie decided to undertake the ritual. She found her grandmother's silver locket, a family heirloom, 
and set out into the forest, guided only by the crimson moonlight. The forest was alive with unsettling sounds. The rustling leaves, the distant howls, and the chilling breeze all seemed to whisper a warning. Natalie's heart raced as she ventured deeper into the dark woods, clutching the silver locket tightly in her hand. Suddenly, a low growl echoed through the trees, and a pair of glowing eyes appeared in the underbrush. Before Natalie could react, a massive wolf-like creature emerged from the shadows. It was a werewolf, its fur matted with blood, and its snarling fangs glistening in the moonlight. Fear coursed through Natalie's veins, but she remembered her grandmother's words, offer the silver locket as a token of peace. She extended the heirloom toward the creature, and to her surprise, the werewolf hesitated. Its menacing growls softened, and it approached cautiously, sniffing the locket. In a hushed, guttural voice, the werewolf spoke. You carry the blood of the Ravenwood protectors, as did your grandmother. We have watched your family for generations, waiting for one who would seek the truth. The werewolf revealed that the village's curse had been inflicted upon them by a vengeful witch centuries ago. To break the curse, they needed a descendant of the original protectors to perform a ritual of purification during the blood moon. It was the only way to free the villagers from their terrible fate. With newfound determination, Natalie agreed to help the werewolves. They led her to a hidden grove deep in the forest, where the ritual would take place. As the blood moon reached its zenith, Natalie followed their ancient instructions, chanting incantations and using the silver locket as a conduit for her power. The ground trembled, and a blinding light enveloped the grove. The curse that had plagued Ravenwood for centuries began to lift, and the werewolves' monstrous forms shifted back into their human shapes. Tears of gratitude filled their eyes as they thanked Natalie for breaking the curse. Natalie returned to the village, greeted with both awe and gratitude from the villagers who had been freed from the curse's grip. She had not only inherited her grandmother's cabin, but also her legacy as a protector of Ravenwood. As the blood moon faded, the village of Ravenwood transformed from a place of fear and superstition into one of hope and renewal. Natalie had ventured into the heart of the forest on the most dreaded night, and in doing so, she had brought salvation to the village and unlocked the truth hidden beneath the blood moon's ominous glow. The town of Ravenscroft had long been shrouded in secrets and legends, but none were as terrifying as the tales of the Midnight Pack. Whispers in the dark spoke of a group of bloodthirsty werewolves that roamed the forest surrounding the town, hunting under the light of the full moon. On a cold, moonlit night, a young woman named Emily found herself walking alone through the dense woods on the outskirts of Ravenscroft. She had heard the stories, of course, but she was too skeptical to believe in monsters. A hike under the full moon seemed like a harmless adventure. As Emily ventured deeper into the forest, she felt a strange unease settling in her chest. The woods were silent, devoid of the usual nocturnal sounds. An eerie stillness hung in the air, broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves in the breeze. The moon bathed the path ahead in an ethereal light, casting long shadows that seemed to move of their own accord. Emily quickened her pace, a sense of foreboding gnawing at her. She clutched her backpack strap, the weight of her skepticism suddenly feeling insignificant. A low growl echoed through the trees, chilling Emily's blood. Her heart raced as she glanced over her shoulder, but she saw nothing. She shook off her unease, attributing the sound to a wandering animal. However, when the growl was joined by more sinister guttural snarls, doubt crept into her mind. The moon reached its zenith, bathing the forest floor in an eerie silver glow. Emily's steps grew hesitant as she realized she had strayed far from the main trail. She stopped to consult her map, her breath misting in the frigid air. Suddenly, a deafening howl split the night. It was no ordinary howl. It was the blood-curdling cry of a predator. Emily's heart pounded in her chest as she dropped the map and scanned the woods, her eyes wide with terror. Emerging from the shadows, a monstrous creature stepped into the moonlight. Towering on two legs, it was a grotesque fusion of man and wolf, its fur matted with blood, its eyes, cold and malevolent, locked onto Emily. The transformation had begun. In an instant, Emily's skepticism crumbled, replaced by sheer terror. She turned and ran, her footsteps pounding on the forest floor. 
The werewolf, now fully transformed, gave chase with terrifying speed, its fangs gleaming in the moonlight. Emily's heart raced, and her lungs burned as she sprinted through the tangled underbrush. The sound of snapping twigs and heavy footsteps pursued her relentlessly. She knew she couldn't outrun the beast, but she had to try. Just as the werewolf closed in, Emily spotted a decaying, abandoned cabin through the trees. Desperation fueled her and she hurled herself inside, slamming the door shut behind her. It rattled on its hinges as the creature threw its massive weight against it, snarling and scratching. Inside the cabin, Emily's eyes darted around in search of a weapon. Her fingers closed around an old, rusty fire poker. She held it tightly, her knuckles white with fear. The werewolf's savage assault on the door continued, but it couldn't hold forever. Emily knew she had to act quickly. She spotted a small window on the far side of the cabin and realized it was her only chance to escape. With trembling hands, she smashed the window, sending shards of glass scattering. She crawled through the opening, her backpack snagging on a jagged edge, but she didn't care. She needed to survive. Outside, Emily stumbled through the woods, her heart pounding in her ears. The werewolf burst through the cabin door, its eyes locking onto her once more. She had bought herself some precious seconds, but she knew she couldn't outrun it for long. Just as the creature lunged at her, a shot rang out through the night. The werewolf's howl of agony pierced the air as it crumpled to the ground, writhing in pain. A figure emerged from the shadows, a hunter with a silver bullet. Emily watched in shock as the werewolf reverted to its human form, a man racked with pain and confusion. The hunter approached, his face grim. You were lucky, he said to Emily. The Midnight Pack rarely leaves survivors. As the moon dipped below the horizon, the forest seemed to sigh in relief. The terror of the Midnight Pack had been momentarily quelled, but the legends of Ravenscroft would live on, a chilling reminder that some horrors were all too real. Emily would forever carry the scars of that night, a reminder that skepticism could crumble in the face of true terror. A little background first. I was serving a 15-year sentence in a penitentiary in southern Arizona. What I was in there for isn't important. During my stay there, there were countless things that happened that no one could explain, and even more that no one wanted to know more about. It all started with a prison legend. Supposedly, years ago, something awful and unexplainable happened in the prison. Every morning we'd be woken up and expected to stand near the front of our cells, while guards visually confirmed we were present and accounted for. Apparently about a year before I got sent there, the most brutal and unexplainable thing happened during one of these routines. A man who had a cell to himself looked very off during this check. When a guard pulled over another guard to help him check it out, they found it wasn't actually the prisoner they were expecting at all. It was a totally different man. This man was wearing the skin of the other man over him. Loosely fitting, draped over him, apparently looked like a real monster. The scariest things were, though, was the guy. Wearing the skin was not an inmate. They had no idea how he even got into prison, let alone a cell. What's worse is that they couldn't even figure out who the hell he was. He wasn't documented anywhere. And what's worse than that? They never even found the body of the man of the skin he was wearing. Pretty grisly stuff, I know. And I realize that's not the go-to definition of a skinwalker, but that's what the prison called him. The skinwalker. Didn't help that the guy never talked, apparently. Anyway, that's what started the whole skinwalker superstition around the yard. Apparently, the guy got shipped to a different spot about a month after it happened. And just about everyone in Gen Pop felt all the better for it. I heard about the story on the second day of my stay. Hell of a story to hear to place in your home for the foreseeable future. Now onto the real shit though. Sure, that guy was the skinwalker, but all he did in the long run was get an old lifer Navajo inmate to tell everyone about actual skinwalkers. It seemed like a lot of the prison culture actually revolved around them. Now, apparently, skinwalkers are tricky to point out on the spot, but if you manage to survive around one for more than a minute or two, Almost everyone can tell the mannerisms are all off. They can mimic human speech, but not replicate it. They twitch manically. They have an unnatural gait while walking. But apparently, they got better with experience. The old Navajo guy, his name was Carl, said that he was sure there was an actual one among the prisoners, slowly picking us off over the years. He called it the Grandmaster Skinwalker at one point. 
Apparently, he thought it had human mannerisms down so well that you might not even be able to tell if it was your cellmate for a day or two. It had to be good, he posited one night. He would expect a skinwalker to jump at any opportunity for a kill. But this one realized it had a revolving door of people to kill coming to it and masterfully bided its time, as Carl thought, for years. A lot of guys found humor in it. A lot more were really on edge about it. Every once in a while in prison, people snap. Sometimes you'll find your cellmate swinging in front of your bunk, strung up around the neck by his pant leg. Sometimes you just can't take it anymore. But in our yard, people tended to snap in a very special way. It wouldn't be an outburst at dinner or a silent suicide in the night. Guys would just stop talking, hunch over and shuffle around. Any friendships they had would be mostly out the window. They would turn into a loner during wreck time. They would let their hair hang in front of their face. No one liked to talk about it. Like if they did, it would happen to them next. I felt the same way. I didn't know if it was a skinwalker or just people going crazy, but I didn't want to find out. It wasn't clockwork or anything, but every time someone snapped in this way, it wasn't more than a couple weeks before they were shipped off or transferred to God knows where without anyone else knowing beforehand. Then there was the nighttime occurrences. Short, loud bursts of sound echoed through my cell block during all hours of the night on a regular basis. It sounded like a mix between a pig's dying squeals and nails on a chalkboard. Just another thing no one liked to talk about. Even scarier were the shadows and footsteps. The block was dimly illumined in the night by a few lights hanging from the ceiling outside the cells. I myself saw shadows flit across my walls on a regular occasion when there were definitely no guards near my cell. One time near the end of my sentence, I woke up, looked at my back wall and found a perfect silhouette of a person standing there. But when I looked, my bunkmate was asleep and no one was outside my cell. And the footsteps. Everyone hated the fucking footsteps. They were the scariest part. In the night, sometimes, more rarely than the shadows, you would hear ungodly fast footsteps. They sounded like wet feet slapping on tile floor. Whatever caused them would fly from one end of the block to the other in a dead sprint. Whatever it was, it was inhumanely fast. If you happened to be awake before it started, by the time you heard the footsteps on one side of your cell and whipped your head around to see the thing run by, it sounded like it was three cells past you. Everyone hated the footsteps. I agreed. I thought they were the worst. I was released from that place about a month ago, and I have more stories than I can count. I swear it was nearly my turn. About a week before I was discharged, my cellmate and a good friend of mine snapped in the same kind of way. I didn't sleep for an entire week. Well, I did sleep, of course, but never for more than a few minutes at a time. Never turned my back on the guy. The scariest thing? I woke up one night to him somehow, snaking his body through the bars of our cell. For reference, I couldn't get anything past my shoulder through them. The worst part, though, he was coming back into our cell. On the day of my release, I didn't say a word to him. Just left. He seemed fine with it. So, so was I. I had made it through, 15 years of prison fights, gang disputes, and for all I know, skinwalker abductions. I left through the front gates, a free man. As I walked along the fence for the wreck yard, I spotted my cellmate standing off on his own, like he had for the last week or so. I shook my head, not even really sure if it was him anymore. I took one last look over the yard, this time from the other side of the fence. I wish I hadn't. There, standing off on his own, on the other side of the yard, was Carl slouched over, eyeing the other inmates and twitching manically. Jint. Let me start off by saying that my wife doesn't believe in paranormal entities or anything of that nature. We have three cats, and one of them likes to be a rebel, jumping onto counters and meowing at the top of his lungs just looking for attention. He does this throughout the night, and it's a regular occurrence. Last night, after a few beers and video games, I decided it was time to head to bed with my wife. When I woke up this morning, my wife was basically attached to me with wide eyes and a nervous look on her face. I asked her what was wrong and she proceeded to tell me what happened last night. She said that around 2.50 in the morning, she was woken up to a noise that sounded like one of our cats downstairs, mewing unusually loud. After giving herself a few seconds to perk up and fully pay attention, 
She said that the meows sounded more like a person trying to mimic a cat, and it kept saying hello. After meowing for two to three minutes, a loud bang came at our door and then a notification went off for a motion sensor at our front door. When she told me this, I checked my phone and sure enough, there was a notification for motion detected at 2.52 a.m. I asked her why she didn't wake me up so I could grab my gun. She said she was frozen with fear and didn't want it to hear her make a noise. We're out running errands while I'm typing this, but something made me uncomfortable about her story. Last night I set the home security alarm around 9 p.m and we didn't turn it off till we walked the dog this morning. To make things worse, we had slept with with all of the animals in the room and the door was closed. So whatever was in our house or outside the front door was not one of our animals. Obviously, the first thing that came to my mind was a skinwalker, but maybe I'm just being paranoid. I checked all the rooms in the house after I got up. I'm not sure what I could have done anyways. It's very odd that my wife was scared so badly by something she doesn't necessarily believe in, we bought this house brand new, so no one has lived here before. When I'm home alone, I do feel like I'm being watched or someone's always walking directly behind me. My wife also said that the house has given her chills since we moved in. Something is just off about it. We just got home and I went to hang up one of my shirts in the master bedroom closet when I noticed that the board that covers the attic access has been shifted a little. When I asked my wife about it, she said she's never been up there and the builders would have placed it back in its original place before we made the purchase. I'm genuinely getting anxious just thinking about what could be going on. Has anyone had an experience like this? Or similar at least? We're going to my mother-in-law's to get some sage. My wife said burning it should keep whatever's around our house away. My grandfather told me a story once as we sat around a campfire in his backyard in the cool night of the Arizona desert. The horizon was clear, and each star twinkled in a purple sky, with a full fat moon hanging low over the mountains. His voice was raspy and gravelly, the result of a lifetime of smoking cigars and drinking whiskey. The fire danced and shined across his wide, dark eyes as he settled into his seat, ready to tell his story. Way back when I was a boy, about your age, he began, I lived outside an Apache reservation with your great-grandfather. He had returned from the war and set about raising horses and cattle on a hundred-acre ranch settled between a brambly mountainside with dirt good for growing thornbrush and not much else. One night my mother was sick and Pa and I took a trip into town, about 50 miles away, straight through a dry desert, over a washed-out creek and some old abandoned farmsteads. The fire sparked and a log cracked, jolting me out of the story. What next? I asked. Settle down, boy, you'll hear soon enough. Pa and I were driving in an old Ford pickup truck. I remember it was dark out, inky and thick, with only the lights of our old truck lighting up the road. I remember too when the engine began to sputter and the truck slowed to a jerky stop. God damn it, Pa said, guiding the Ford to the side of the road as it coasted to a halt. Stay here, son, as he stepped out into the darkness, shutting the door with a heavy thud. My window was down, and the cool desert air was breezy and felt good on my hot face and neck. Pa was getting water from the back to cool the engine, and that's when I smelled it. Rotten eggs. Strange, I thought, to smell sulfur in the desert. My nose also picked up carrion, like one of them dead bloated cattle that would drop from the heat and lay there until the crows pecked enough holes in their hide to cause the whole thing to explode. It stunk, and I gagged. My skin started to tingle too, the back of my neck felt itchy, and my face started to get hot. The wind stopped blowing and hung still and heavy, with the stink filling the cab. Pa, I called. Pa, pa. No answer. My heart started beating, and I felt such a fear in me, in my bones, in my chest. Boy, I tell you, I never felt fear like this. Not until Vietnam, not until I saw men dying around me. I locked the door and reached over for my pa's door and saw a shadow bound across the road through both dim beams of light across the partly open domed hood. Grandfather paused. He spit a fat wad of tobacco spit off to his side and he looked pensively into the darkness. I realized I was holding my breath and gasped for air. The night was cool, but I was sweating and clammy. Well, what happened? 
What about your father? What did you see? He sighed. A creature. He shook his head. You have to understand. There were legends. Old legends. Older than the rock cairns out in the valley. Older still than Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. Then the old Injun chiefs and their shamans. The Apache and Hop and Cherokee. And all them old tribes and first peoples. They told tales, old stories, about dark Injun magic. A deal made with the old spirits of blood sacrifice to gain power, old power, enough to fight each other and the Spaniards, and later the white men that came for their land and women. They called them... He paused. Grandfather took a deep breath and bodied forward into his tail. Across the fire and the sky, the desert, the creek, the moon, the sun, and old mountains, he bodied forward. They called them skinwalkers, shape changers, old warriors resurrected as skinless men, all sinew and muscle, walking on deer legs with the torso of a man and the head of a coyote. But messed up boy, long and malformed snouts, teeth like a bowie knife, long arms and standing seven foot, even hunched over. They'd gut the old cowboys and white riders, they'd run through bullets and sabers, part the Spanish armor like it was a potato sack. Wily too, they could change their voice to match a person you knew or might know. Boy, that's what I saw. Big and fast, only for a second it ran across the road, gray and mottled, muscle flexing under its legs, hooves clomping on the road, stringy muscled hunched shoulders. And it turned, looked right into the cab, looked right into my eyes, and I swear, boy, I swear it grinned at me. I sank into my seat in shock, in fear, shaking. I knew death was near. The air was electric. I smelled ozone and brimstone. The air felt like right before the lightning comes and blows a tree to smithereens, charged and full with power. I yelled for my pa, but no words came out, just a dry squeak. I was shaking as grandfather told his story. He was still here, so I know he lived. But the supernatural always fascinated me. And even now I felt the force of his words. The real power of skinwalkers was trickery. Sure, they could change their voices, but also their skin. That's why the gods took their hide, so they could take others. Not for long, the legends say. Maybe an hour before the soul of the skin they wore would come looking for their mortal shell before going to whatever hell awaited them. Though I think that getting skinned alive was hell enough. A minute passed in what felt like a lifetime, one second in 1,000 years. My father's door opened and I jerked my head to the left, putting my fists up to fend off attack. Son, it's me, my father said before climbing into the cab. He grasped the steering wheel and pulled himself in awkwardly, jerking himself into the seat. I cringed into the corner. I looked at him. I looked hard. Boy, your great-grandfather was a good man, treated me and my ma right. He fought the Nazis and saw the worst of man in Poland when he freed all them camps. And now I was taking his measure. Is this my father? Do I make a run or do I die? Is it him or not? Let's go get that medicine for your ma, as he pulled the truck into gear and pulled it out onto the road, and our trip resumed. I guess it was him after all. But how did you know? Was it because he said something about your mom? No boy I knew because out the window, out the corner of my eye, I seen that beast running 50 miles an hour right next to the car, looking at me with them yellow eyes and grinning mouth. I looked and saw it, hunched and angry, running next us boy, my pa kept his eyes on the road, locked straight forward. Son, he said, don't look at it, don't look at it. That's how I knew, boy. If you're reading this, congratulations, I am probably dead, or worse. My name is Daniel and I own quite a bit of land up in the Appalachian Mountains, left to me by my great aunt. So far in the years I've lived here, Paranormal and downright disturbing things have happened to me here. People told me to just leave or report it, like I've never done that before. To them, I'm just the young guy that went crazy a little too early. It bothers me that normal people have no idea what goes on up here, all alone. My first encounter with them, I didn't know how to deal with them. Heck, I didn't even know what they were called until recently. It's important, or at least it's important to me, that some of the tricks I've learned throughout the three years I've lived up here could be of use to somebody. My second, or maybe third time I was stalked by a skinwalker. It felt like I was walking in circles. I had a trail camera with an SD card pretty deep in the woods, 
But when I tried to walk back to my cabin, I kept passing the camera. I was effectively walking in circles. This went on for hours. The sun was setting soon, and I was quite thirsty at the time, I remember. I sat up against the tree my camera was mounted on and started softly crying. It was watching me. I guess waiting for me to fall dead. I hit myself in desperation a few times, trying to think. I sat up and took a very deep breath, wiped the water from my eyes and it dawned on me. It's gotta be messing with my equilibrium. I have to be off balance, there's no other way. Teleportation in hindsight sounded stupid. But I could still walk, but my depth perception was slightly off. All I had to do was tilt my head as far as it would go into my shoulder and walk back to my cabin. My ear was pressed into my shoulder, but even with one ear, I could still hear how anxious the creature sounded pacing in the woods hoping I didn't get away. Once I made it inside my cabin, I didn't come out for a couple days, for safe measures. Another trick they know is mimicking animals. I've found that they like coyotes. I used to coyote hunt quite a bit back home but never up here in the mountains. I seen on a couple of my deer cameras that it looked like, right after I left my camera, a coyote would follow me a while, if not all the way home. I had to stop that real quick and set out some snares. All a snare would and could do is jam the coyote's leg into the mechanism until a button is pressed and the thing would unlock. I set out a couple of them, but also rubbed white ash on all of the traps, and sure enough the next time I start walking back from my camera, I hear the sound of one go off. I quickly ran back to where I had laid the traps, gun drawn, and all that was left was the trap in three separate bent up pieces and the subtle scent of burning hair in the air. Every time I checked the camera after that, a coyote with a nasty burn scar on its leg would stop where the camera was mounted and turn around and walk back into the brush. And lastly, do not engage in any type of combat with them. Warding them off is one thing, but actively hunting them is a mistake. I'd wish I would have known that sooner. I had two buddies back in town I used to tell my stories to. Alcohol loosens the lips. Their names were James and Cole. I'm pretty sure they were cousins, but I never asked. Thinking about it now, I wish I would have gotten to know them better. Long story short, they're dead, and I'm dying. This morning they came and pounded in my door insisting we hunt these skinwalkers. I told them it was a very bad idea, but they even took the liberty of buying silver bullets. They told me how much they cost, but I can't remember right now. I finally caved, and we prepared all day. We first started making a large amount of white ash, cleaning our guns, heck, they even packed MREs and special high dollar spotlights. We set off right as the sun went down. We weren't three hours in when disaster struck. We're all sitting around a tree. I could tell these skinwalkers were watching us. They're all around us. Multiple. I'm frantically scanning everything with my spotlight, not even realizing Coley wasn't with us anymore. I asked James where he was, but he didn't seem nervous at all and told me he may have had to pee. I turn back to face my front, and there I see Cole. He's a good distance out, but something wasn't right. He was contorting in ways a human could never. I start to turn around to ask James what we should do, but halfway around, I heard James guttural sounding breathing, like his lungs were filling with blood. I couldn't stand to be there anymore and booked it back to the cabin. The forest seemed like it was laughing at me in my desperation to run home. I knocked my flashlight running and it was slowly getting dimmer and dimmer. I eventually had to ditch it and use some of the flares Cole and James bout. I pulled the top off and struck it against a tree and the red flame lit up the surrounding forest. There were so many of them, 10, 20, probably more, but as luck would have it, they never attacked me. I could see the cabin and flung the door open and shut it behind me. I ran for the upstairs bedroom and quickly got into the old wooden closet where I am typing this. I don't hear them, but they're outside my house. Unfortunately, I did end up getting clawed or maybe bitten. It's not a terrible wound, but it's bleeding black. If you can send help, please do. I really need it this time. Being assigned to Camp Pendleton was a dream come true. Located in Oceanside in northern San Diego, it's one of the biggest Marine Corps bases in the U.S. There's a ton of stuff to do nearby, whether it's going to the beach to surf, swim, or go for drinks at the pier. The people around here are mellow, 
and there's a surfer sort of vibe to the neighborhood I moved into. Everything was going great for me the first few weeks while I was here, but I noticed that despite the laid-back attitude of the surrounding area where I lived, my work life was rigid and inflexible, my commanding officer, gruff and no-nonsense. I began to realize this place was not going to be a cakewalk. Then, one cool night, I woke up disoriented and far from my bed. Looking around I saw there was nothing nearby. Not another person for miles. Just flat, dirt ground with hills in the distance, and the black sky full of stars and a full moon above. I must have been sleepwalking, I thought to myself rubbing the sleep from my eyes. I had been marching in my dreams while remembering my days of basic training, and I had somehow ended up in the middle of the dirt field. I looked around in every direction and finally saw lights in the distance behind me. At least I had an idea which way to go now. Turning around, I started to walk back towards the base, my legs wobbly from the long walk while asleep. It felt surreal to be out there in the middle of the night, and I didn't understand how it could have happened. I had been caught sleepwalking once or twice before, but I'd never gone anywhere near to this far. Part of me wondered with a paranoid fear just how often this happened without me realizing it. I walked for a few minutes alone, feeling an increasingly strange sensation like a tingling on the back of my neck. After a while, I began to suspect it was that outdated lizard brain notion that someone was following me a remnant from some bygone era when humans actually had to worry about being stalked in the night. Just as I had that thought, someone cleared their throat in the darkness behind me. A chill ran up my spine and my flesh broke out in goose pimples as he spoke, his voice deep, gruff, and commanding. What are you doing all the way out here so late at night? He asked. He stepped closer, and in the moonlight I could see him more clearly. My voice caught in my throat as I looked at his eyes and saw they were yellow like a cat, or a wolf, or a snake maybe. Haven't you been told to stay in your bunk at this hour? His tone was predatory and overwhelmingly creepy, but his demeanor was otherwise friendly. The part of my brain telling me to run was suddenly being hushed into submission by an unfamiliar voice which told me this was fine and not to worry about a thing. Look at his uniform, the voice said. And sure enough, I looked down to see he was wearing a Marine Corps uniform with the insignia indicating he was an officer. You wouldn't want to disrespect a superior officer, would you? The voice asked. Sorry, sir, I must have been sleepwalking. I'm just heading back towards the base. I can make it home from there. He showed his teeth in a grin and told me he'd walk with me for a stretch. We must be distant relatives from somewhere down the line, he said as we walked. Both of us out here walking in the middle of the night. I wish I could chalk my trip up to somnambulism but I'm just a run-of-the-mill insomniac. I can never get back to sleep once I'm up. I usually just go out for a long hike. It reminds me of the old days when I was deployed, I guess. Going for long marches that started before sunrise and didn't end until long past noon. The more time that went by, the more guilty I felt for having almost run from the man. He was just an ordinary guy. And the conversation became easier as we built up a rapport, and I told him about my life and my background, and where I was from. When I looked back at his face, I was shocked by what I saw. Maybe there really was a family connection between the two of us. In the increasing light from the base as we drew closer to it, I saw there was a striking resemblance between us. He didn't look like that when you first saw him, that suspicious voice in my mind said uneasily. His eyes were yellow, remember? And now look at them, they're brown. But it was quickly drowned out by that other, louder voice which spoke up, and said all of this was okay too. It was just dark out in the dirt field, and I hadn't gotten a clear look at his face until now. Tell me more about your parents, he said. I want to know all about them. What are they like? I started speaking again, feeling hypnotized as I looked into the older man's swirling brown eyes. He was walking slower and slower, and I was matching his pace. The base was close now. I could see the lights of it were very bright up ahead. Less than a couple hundred yards away, but they were getting dimmer suddenly. The light was fading. But how? Were we walking backwards now? Was I even walking at all? Or was something dragging me now? It took me a few moments to shake the strange sleepwalker's haze from my vision, and I realized I had been in a trance of sorts. 
When I looked at the man's face again through my half-closed eyes, I was astonished at what I saw. He didn't just bear a passing resemblance to me, he could have been my long-lost twin brother. His eyes were the same shade of brown, his hair close-cropped and chestnut. His jaw was defined, and his nose was sharp and angular. But his smile and his teeth, those were not like mine at all. They were pointed and long, designed for tearing flesh from bone and ripping it to shreds. He was pulling me, dragging me across the dirt, deeper into the darkness again. Who are you? I heard myself asking, and in that second he changed completely. It wasn't like in a horror movie when you see a man turn into a werewolf over a matter of a few minutes. The metamorphosis was not slow and drawn out. Instead, it happened in a split second. I blinked and the man who looked like me was no longer there. In his place was an indescribable monster, tall with long limbs, pale gray skin, and pitch black eyes. Its jaw unhinged as it revealed teeth longer and sharper than those belonging to a wolf or a bear. It reminded me of that strange, ethereal, white-masked creature from Spirited Away, full of hate and hunger and wanting to consume everything. It didn't appear solid. This thing looked like it was made of shadows. A shot was fired suddenly, bringing me out of my hypnotized stupor. I realized that I was being dragged away from the base. The creature had my shoulder between its jaws, and it was biting down so hard I could feel it grating against the bone. Another shot rang out and I heard a few people yelling. There were footsteps, and I heard something approaching from behind me. The thing tried to pick me up in its jaws, and it was so massive and so strong that it actually succeeded momentarily. I thrashed and punched it in the face, kicking it in the eyes. My shoulder was on fire, and my entire arm felt like it was dangling by a thread, as if it would pop off at any second, unhinging at the joint like a Thanksgiving turkey drumstick. And then for a second I thought it would. It popped out of the socket and dislocated. The flesh began to rip and tear and bleed. The creature nearly tore my arm clean off as another shot rang out. I gave it one more good, hard kick to the face, and the already wounded monster dropped me to the ground, letting out a low moan of pain. It fell, its form turning into a large, black puddle of darkness, like an oil spill, before skittering off into the night, like an infinitely long centipede. It blended in perfectly with the shadows, and was gone a second later just as a few other marines arrived. Are you okay? One of them asked, helping me to my feet. Man, I never thought I'd live to see someone get attacked by a mountain lion. You're lucky to be alive. It took me a few seconds to comprehend what he was saying. It was so bizarre. The thing which had just attacked me looked nothing like a mountain lion. It was long and tall and humanoid, with a black, wispy shroud surrounding it like a living cloak. Man, are you blind? The other marine asked. That wasn't a mountain lion. I breathed a sigh of relief. I wasn't crazy. Someone else had seen the thing as well. It was a wolf, a big gray wolf. Man, I've never seen one so big. You sure are lucky to be alive though, that's for sure. Do you want us to call for an ambulance? I shook my head. No, I'll be fine, I can walk. I took a nervous look at them both, as if judging for myself again whether they were human or not. But I decided these two were the real McCoy. If not for them, I would have been that thing's dinner. The two of them walked me back towards the base, and I tried to decide whether I should tell them the truth of what I had really seen. But with each step we took, the memories started seeming more and more surreal and dreamlike, to the point where I even started to convince myself I had exaggerated what happened. Maybe it was a mountain lion, or a gray wolf, far from its pack, desperate for food. But no, the memories could have been wiped away, but the teeth marks were not. They were strange and totally unlike anything a wolf or a mountain lion might leave. When I went to the infirmary to get the bites looked at, they told me they'd never seen anything like them before. After several sets of blood cultures and antibiotics, they never did figure out what was wrong with me or how to get rid of my symptoms, sleepwalking being primary among them. I would get up from my hospital bed in the night, and it would take a whole team of security guards to get me back into my room. So desperate I was to escape. Back to the fields, I told the men. I needed to get back to the dirt fields. To march. All they could do was watch.
as my symptoms got worse and as black vein-like formations began to spread from the bite wounds like a dark plague spreading throughout my body. Everything is so cold now and I feel like I'm losing control. I don't want to feel like this, but I can't help it. Whatever bit me, it infected me. Its contagion is spreading throughout my system and I can no longer fight it. I get these windows of time when I'm with it enough to speak and live my life, and then I get a period of darkness where I remember nothing. They discharged me recently, leaving me alone to deal with the symptoms myself. I think they're worried about having me so close to the base. They don't know what I'm capable of anymore. Most nights, I wake up far from home and don't know how I got there just like that night in the dirt field, like I'm sleepwalking all over again. Except that's not what this is. This is something much worse. The dark veins are spreading up my neck towards my face, making me stand out and look strange. People think they're bizarre facial tattoos, inching their way towards my skull. They keep asking me if I'm alright as sweat pours down my reddened face and my eyes dart around with nervous paranoia. The blackouts are getting longer and closer together. I don't know how much longer I have left to be me, and I'm terrified of what's going to happen when those veins get to my heart. And my mind, who knows how long I have left before I'm out roaming the dirt fields, looking for a meal. I am writing this now as a call for help. I am desperate and I don't know what to do. My name is Michael. I own a dairy farm in the Great Plains, near a Navajo reservation, along with my brother. The farm was built by our parents before we were born, and it was passed down to us after their death. It's a pretty big farm. It has two barns, a well, and a house, where we spend most of our free time. Although, I've always dreaded this place, because it's the place where our parents died, or at least where they were found. My parents died when we were both 19. Their bodies were found mutilated in the well. There was nothing stolen or destroyed. If not for the blood trail leading to the well, we would have never found them. The case was passed as a murder, but they never had any suspects and me and my brother were too ravaged by the event to think about it. Years passed and we forgot about the event. Well, until two weeks ago. We were gathering food for the cows using an old tractor. It was pretty dark, but we didn't use its headlights because the battery was too old and couldn't stand them being on for very long. As I was loading up the food, I heard my mom's voice calling for me from behind some bushes. Michael, it's been too long come to me. But it sounded weird, as if it was spoken through an old radio. I was terrified. I looked at my brother, and he was as white as snow. I whispered to him to turn on the headlights in the direction of the voice. What laid before our eyes made my knees weak. It was a coyote, but its eyes were pitch black, and it was standing on its back legs. I jumped in the tractor and we noped our way out of there as fast as we could. We arrived at the house and locked the door. That's the moment when I passed out. I woke up in the middle of the night. I thought all that just happened was a dream. But then I saw my brother telling me to stay quiet and pointing his shotgun at the door. Then I heard it again. Michael, come here my dear. Then it started to knock softly on the door. That didn't last for very long though. The knocking turned into banging. Then my brother started looking through the window at that thing. It realized we were looking at it and it let out the most horrific screech I've ever heard before it ran off. An hour later, it started again, the voice and the knocking. I've searched it up on the internet and I learned they are called skinwalkers, evil Navajo men that sold their soul. Calling their name supposedly attracts them. I hope writing it doesn't trigger them. My brother wants to go outside and face it. I'm afraid we won't see the light of day again. Please help us. Northern Canada would get so cold in the winter that it was almost impossible for cars to function. So, my family became very skilled hunters. We would have a hearty meal of deer or rabbit every night, and we learned to grow vegetables indoors for a little bit of freshness in our Viking-like diet. I was around 15 when I first started to hunt alone, and I was 18 when this happened. It was early in the morning and I was tracking rabbits. I had found a nice spot near a rabbit den and bundled up gun raised, ready to shoot. Something felt off though. It took a minute before I realized the forest was dead quiet. 
No chickadees, no coyotes howling, no wind, nothing. It was as if all the creatures in the wild disappeared. As weird as it was, I paid no mind to it and chalked it up to being too cold for animals to be out and about, though that didn't explain the lack of wind and no leaves rustling. I lay in the snow for another 16 minutes before giving up and deciding to set off a different location. Just as I slung my gun over my shoulder, I glanced to the side and froze. A large black dog stood around 10 feet away from me. The dog had on a collar, so I assume it was tamed. But the nearest house was in Haraway and it made no sense that a dog would be out here. Are you lost, boy? I asked Ed casually, not at the time taking into account how wrong it was for a dog to be all the way out here. Is your owner here? The dog just stared. Its eyes were milky and I felt as if they were boring into my skull. I approached the dog and held my hand out for it to sniff it. The dog didn't move, it didn't flinch, and its tail didn't wag. I drew my hand back and rummaged through my coat pocket. I pulled out a piece of deer jerky my father had steamed during the week. I snapped it in half and offered the piece to the dog. It took the piece in its teeth before swallowing it whole. I laughed nervously as the dog licked its chaps. Hungry who? What are you doing out here? I knelt down and stroked the dog's head. Its coat was freezing, like the dog had frostbite or fell in a river, but somehow wasn't wet. Its milky white eyes stared into me still. At the time I assumed it was cataracts. A bark came from the left of me, and both me and the dog turned to look. An entire pack of dogs stood in the clearing, all with milky white eyes and black fur. Chills ran down my spine, but still, being a stupid teenager, I just thought it was just a trait of that breed. The dog looked back at me and licked my hand with a tongue that felt like ice before running over to the group. I watched as the pack moved on, the largest dog's eyes lingered on me before following the others. I watched as they ran off out of the clearing. It was like a reset mode as soon as they left because the forest came back to life. I could hear Chica Dees, the rustle of wind through leaves and the scattering of nearby rabbits and shrews. I shot three rabbits and headed home, still curious about the dogs. A week later, I asked a dad about it, but he said that the neighbor's dog, Sombra, had been missing for months, and everyone else either didn't have a dog that matched my description, or just didn't have a dog in general. I thought that was very unnerving and didn't hunt for a while after that. The next time I saw the dog it was early spring. I didn't have school to attend until the fall, so I just helped out at home and read and raised chickens. One Monday, both my parents were in Calgary visiting friends, and my brother was sick downstairs watching Game of Thrones, so I was pretty much alone. I sat in the library, reading and sipping some sweet Earl Grey tea. The rain was in a full-out downpour, so the chores I could carry out were mainly indoors and quick to complete. Scratching came at the door, causing the hair on my neck to stand up. We didn't own any animals that could scratch. Scared and curious, I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and opened the door. The black dog stood there, its familiar milky eyes staring into my soul. I jumped in surprise at first but quickly smiled at the thought that the dog came all the way from the woods to my house. Hey bud, I said bending down and petting its frosty skin. How did you find me? It was the lavender, wasn't it? I joked, referring to the essential oil I always had on my hunting gloves and wrists. I could have been mistaken, but I swore the dog nodded its head slightly. Where are your friends? I asked. My brother loves dogs. We could all play a game of ultimate frisbee. The dog blinked up at me in an almost amused manner. It nudged my arm with its cold nose. Do you want jerky, bud? I asked. The dog blinked. All right then, wait here. I walked to the pantry and grabbed a bag of jerky before returning to the dog. I once again snapped a piece of jerky in half and gave the half to the dog. It swallowed it whole like it did the first time and just sort of wandered back into the tree line. I laughed to myself and the rest of the day went by normally. I awoke that night with fear in my chest it felt as if I was being watched. Slowly, I sat up and peeked through the curtains. My breath hitched. A woman stared back at me. She stood in the tree line completely naked. She looked Native American but with milky white skin that almost glowed in the moonlight. Her black hair was in two long braids. I felt my world crash around me as I stared into her big white milky eyes. Just like the dogs, I realized. The woman caught my gaze through the window and smiled. 
it sent chills into my heart. She walked to the window, almost as if approaching an old friend and tapped onto the glass. I don't know why I did, but I opened the window out of pure curiosity. Um, are you okay, lady? I asked, trying not to sound fearful. She just nodded and said something in a language that I couldn't pin down. I caught nighttime and forest, so it may have been Cree, but it sounded so ancient. Do you want me to call the police? She cocked her head to the side. I take it she couldn't understand the question. She took me by surprise when she took hold of my wrist and put a feather into my hand. Her hands were so cold that I shivered. Then she just turned and ran back into the woods. I awoke the next morning convinced that it was a dream, but I turned to find the feather on my dresser. I haven't seen the dog for a year now, and I have no idea why the woman came to my window. I still have the feather and I still wear lavender oil. I don't know why the woman and the dog had the same eyes, but after doing some research, I learned about skinwalkers, and I feel that that is what I encountered. But they weren't malevolent in any way, and I never felt threatened, only a bit uneasy and cold. And I don't know if this is related in any way, but I often find little presents on my windowsill like rabbit skin, and my parents are curious why dead owls keep appearing on the porch. This story was told to me by one of my good friends, who's of Navajo descent on her father's side. It happened several years ago, when she was spending the last two weeks of summer visiting relatives on a reservation in New Mexico, and is by far one of the creepiest things I've ever heard. My friend Jessie was 12 at the time and playing outside with her cousins. They were tossing a frisbee around, and one of the younger kids threw it too hard. It flew over the fence and was swallowed up by a small grove of parched bur oak trees. Jessie, being the eldest, went to retrieve it, leaving her 11-year-old cousin Ellie in charge until she got back. The sun was setting, lighting up the sky in brilliant shades of orange, as Jessie made her way over to the grove. After some poking around, she found the frisbee caught in one of the tree's branches. As she climbed, she began to sing an old Navajo song, but paused when her body suddenly went cold. That's exactly how Jessie described it to me. Cold, as if she'd been dunked in ice water. You know that annoying, scary story cliché of feeling like you're being watched? Well, it's only cliché because it's true. Jessie could feel a pair of eyes following her, even when she looked around her and saw nothing. Seriously creeped out, she grabbed the frisbee and ran back to her grandmother's house, just in time to see the old woman step onto the porch and call for the kids to come inside. The true horror didn't start until several hours later. Jessie, her cousin Ellie, and Ellie's little sister Clara were asleep in their grandmother's guest room when Jessie woke up to the strangest sound she'd ever heard. She described it to me as a cross between radio static and the noise an old movie reel makes. At first, it sounded distant, but after a minute or two, Jessie realized it was getting closer. Beside her, Ellie rolled over and muttered, What is that? Don't know, Jessie whispered. The girls waited, holding their collective breath. By now, the sound was right outside the window, and Jessie realized it was singing. At this point in her retelling of the story, Jessie went white and began glancing over her shoulder. She told me the song was the exact same one she'd been singing in the tree grove earlier. It sounded so wrong, she said, rubbing her arms as if a cold breeze had rushed by her. Remember when we listened to that clip of the very first recording of a human voice? How weird it sounded. When I nodded, Jessie added, it was like that, but a little clearer. Somehow that made it even worse. Jessie and Ellie were both terrified, while Clara, unaware, slept on. Through the thin blue curtain over the window, they could see the dark shadow of something peering in at them. To this day, Jessie can't explain what motivated her to get up and see for herself, since she was scared shitless. Ignoring Ellie's protests, she slid out of bed and walked across the room on shaky legs. As soon as she drew back the curtain, she regretted her decision. Staring back at her was the most horrifying creature she had ever seen. It had the head of an emaciated deer, with antlers like dead tree branches, and eyes so black they seemed to absorb the faint silver moonlight. It had a scrawny humanoid body with abnormally long arms and legs, 
and as Jesse stood there, caught in its hideous gaze, it raised a clawed hand and scratched at the window with a horrible screeching sound that made Jesse's skin crawl. It was Ellie's scream that jolted Jesse out of her terrified stupor. She stumbled back from the window and landed on the carpeted floor. Clara woke up and began screaming too. Then their grandmother ran in and turned on the light. The thing at the window had vanished, leaving behind three long scratches in the glass and three terrified little girls. Jessie's grandmother managed to calm the hysterical children enough so they could tell her what had happened. As she listened, her age-weathered face became progressively paler. She hustled the girls downstairs to the living room and made up a bed for them on the couch. She then sat by them all night, and whenever one of them asked her what was going on, the old woman simply shook her head. Needless to say, Jessie and her cousins didn't sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, Jessie's grandmother announced that everyone was to stay inside that day. No arguments. She looked so shaken nobody dared protest. Around noon, she called for a medicine woman to come and bless the house. Later, after the woman left, Jessie marched into the kitchen where her grandmother was loading the dishwasher. Tell me what that thing was, she said bluntly. Her grandmother sighed and motioned for Jessie to sit down. You have heard the legend of the skinwalkers, yes? Jessie frowned and nodded, vaguely recalling the story. So that was a skinwalker? Her grandmother nodded. Yes. Grandma, said Jessie as a light dawned. I think it overheard me singing in the tree grove yesterday. Her grandmother's dark eyes narrowed. Why do you say that? Because it was singing that same song. You know the lullaby you used to sing to me when I was little. Her grandmother was silent for a long time before whispering, You are a very lucky girl, Jessica, but luck has its limits. From now on, you must be more careful. The look in the old woman's eyes as she spoke those words still haunts Jesse to this day. As I said earlier, that was years ago, seven to be specific. Jessie has returned to the reservation many times, each without incident, but she has never set foot in that tree grove again, and probably never will. Jessie's grandmother died this past March, at the age of 87, and Jessie later moved in with her aunt for the summer, so she could help clean up the old house which the family was going to rent out. She had been there for about a week when I went down there to visit her. On my first night, we sat on the porch and drank some beers, and I found my eyes drifting towards the tree grove. So that's where it all happened? Jesse shuddered and nodded. Yep. Tomorrow, I'm taking you to the medicine woman and have her bless you. Is that really necessary? The look Jesse gave me nearly turned me to stone. You think nothing will happen to you because you're white, but when you're in Navajo territory, you're in Skinwalker territory. Take caution. I nodded. Yes. That night, I swore I heard radio static outside the house. When I brought it up to Jesse the next morning, she didn't speak, but grabbed my arm and practically dragged me to the medicine woman where I was blessed. Nothing happened for the rest of the trip, and I went back to the city unscathed. I didn't post this here with the intention of teaching a moral, but I suppose if there is something to be learned from the story of the singing skinwalker, it's that there are things out there we can't explain. The look in Jessie's eyes when she recounted her experience told me everything I need to know. What she saw truly horrified her, and all I can say is, I'm grateful I didn't have to go through it myself. My wife and I were sitting on the front porch after a long day of moving furniture and boxes into our new house. We were tired, red-faced, and sweating after sharing the burden between the two of us. The sun was setting on the horizon as we sipped our warm beers and looked out over the landscape of our newly acquired ranch. Fields stretched off into the distance as far as the eye could see, not a neighbor in sight for miles. The cows were grazing, looking unhappy their tails hanging straight down as they ignored the fresh grass all around them. I figured they were just upset from the long move. Why do you think they needed so many locks? My wife asked, taking a sip of her beer. It was the elephant in the room, so to speak, and I had to admit I was curious about it as well. Every door in the house had a deadbolt on it, inside and out. Not only that, 
but the windows were shielded by thick iron bars. The old owners had left long before we could ask them about it. The folks who lived here before were probably paranoid about home invasions so far from the city. We'll take them down, and I'll fill the screw holes with wood putty. We'll paint them over, and they'll be good as new. You wanted to redo the trim anyway. And the bars on the windows? That'll take a bit more work, but I can get it done before the weekend. I'll just have to run over to the hardware store to grab a few things. I can't find some of my tools. Maybe they got lost during the move. My wife was no longer paying attention. She was staring at some point far off in the distance. What's that? She asked, pointing. I followed her finger and looked to see a large gray wolf moving in the fields. It seemed to be stalking deliberately toward us, marching at a steady, quick pace. It came to a fence and did the strangest thing. Instead of leaping over it, or burrowing under it as I'd expected, it stood up on two legs like a person, grasped the loose corner of the wire fencing, and pulled it up, ducking between the strands and stepping through, one leg after the other. It was exactly how I would have done it. Once it was on the other side, it went back on four legs and started its progress toward us again. Then it looked up and saw us staring at it. The gray wolf stayed still for a few seconds, then disappeared in the tall grass suddenly. It was just gone. It didn't dive into the grass or duck down. It was there, and then a moment later, it was just gone. Vanished in the blink of an eye. The two of us sat uneasily on the porch, and I stood up to look in the distance trying to spot the creature. But it was nowhere to be found. I'm going inside. You should come too, my wife said, sounding nervous. We went in and locked the doors at the front and back of the house. The bar stayed on the windows after that, and my wife didn't mention the deadbolts on the doors in the house again either. The two of us went to bed that night with little talk between us, a big difference from the ecstatic chatter that had been the norm all day prior to the event with the wolf, or whatever that thing was. I got the feeling wolf was not quite the right word. That night, something else even more disturbing happened to us both. I woke up in the early hours of the morning, around 3.30 a.m. according to the bedside alarm clock. When I looked next to me in the bed and saw my wife's spot was empty, I became immediately concerned for her safety. Where could she have gone at this time of night, I wondered. That was when I heard her voice calling to me from outside the window, asking insistently for me to let her in. Her cries for help were muffled through the glass, and I lifted the heavy old window pane up to hear her better. What are you doing out there? I asked, worried about the wolf we'd seen earlier. I was looking around for glowing eyes reflecting the moonlight nearby. Standing on two legs or four, I wasn't sure which to expect. I must have been sleepwalking, she said dreamily. The front door locked behind me somehow. You have to let me back in, please. It's cold out here. I'll be right down, I said, without thinking about how impossible all of that was. I was only concerned for her safety at that moment, and she had been known to sleepwalk occasionally, so that part seemed to make sense. I raced down the stairs in my boxers and grasped the front door knob in my hand, turning it. Thankfully, it was locked, or who knows what might have happened. Reaching up to turn the lock, I was startled to hear a voice behind me. What are you doing? My wife asked. I jumped at the sound, my heartbeat quickening, but what terrified me even more was what I had just seen outside. Given the time frame it had taken me to get downstairs, it was impossible that it had been her. It was like someone else had been out there, wearing her skin and speaking in her voice. Looking at the woman standing in front of me, I had no doubt it was Christine, my wife. Panting, I walked over to her and hugged her tightly. What's wrong? She asked. I didn't answer, afraid she would think I was losing my mind. Some things we don't share with anyone, not even our significant others. We take them to our grave, afraid that if we speak of them out loud, it will make them true and it will make the source of the impossible things return. So instead, I just took her hand and led her up the stairs, looking back nervously over my shoulder at the front door, waiting for the sound of a key turning in the lock, or the sound of it being broken down by powerful forces beyond my control. Instead, there was a gentle knock, polite almost at first. 
but then the fist began to pound against the front door of the house louder and louder, more and more insistently. My wife stopped, turning around to look at me on the stairs. Who could that be at this time of night? She asked. Just ignore it. Let's go to bed. They'll go away. Eventually. After a few moments of hesitation, she turned around and began going up the stairs once more, taking a couple nervous looks back as she did. We kept walking up the stairs as the pounding continued, devolving into steady scratching noises that didn't cease until daybreak. What were you doing down in the basement last night? My wife asked at the breakfast table the next morning. Neither one of us mentioned the sounds at the door the night before. We were both trying to act like it had never happened. In the light of the morning, it seemed like a shared hallucination, a bad dream brought on by warm beer and too much time spent moving boxes without enough assistance. In the basement? I wasn't in the basement, I told her. Yeah, you were. You were calling my name, asking me to come down there. I looked at her with concern. When was this? Right before I found you at the front door. I figured I just missed you. That you found whatever you were looking for down in the basement and went into the kitchen for a snack or something. But then I found you by the front door. I was never in the basement last night. She looked at me, puzzled. Of course you were. Who else would have been calling for me from down there? I debated telling her what I had seen outside and decided I probably should. We were clearly dealing with something very strange here and we needed to be on the same team if we were going to figure it out. Christine, did you go outside at all last night? No. What does that have to do with... Okay, so, here's the thing. I saw you outside. At the same time when you were going down to the basement, you were calling to me from out front, saying you had been sleepwalking and you were locked out. That's why I was at the door. I never went down to the basement, and I don't think that was really you outside either. I think there's something else causing all this to happen. What the hell could cause that to happen? I opened my mouth to answer when there was a polite rapping at the door. The two of us sat dead silent for a few moments, unsure what to do. The knocking came again and I heard a man's voice muffled through the door saying, there's a car here, maybe they're out in the fields. Should we just leave it on the doorstep? A woman's voice asked. I don't like being here any more than you do, but that seems a bit rude. Maybe we should come back. Christine and I both stood up, sensing that this was not the same entity from the night before. I don't know how I could tell, but I just could. This wasn't an evil presence. It was just some neighbors coming by to welcome us. And they sounded like they might know something more than we did about the ranch and its mysteries. I opened the front door and saw a man and woman with their backs turned, Walking away from us, they spun around when they heard the sound of us opening up. Oh, hi there. We're the Turnbulls. We live down the road. Technically next door, as if there is such a thing out here. But we do share an easement with you to access the river. Jack takes the cattle down that way sometimes for a change of scenery. The man put his arm around his wife's shoulder and whispered something in her ear. She abruptly stopped talking realizing that she was rambling on nervously. Sharon, I'm sure they don't want to get into all that. We just wanted to stop by and welcome you to the neighborhood, so to speak. It's nice to have another couple living next door again. This place has been empty for so long. My wife and I looked at each other with surprise. As far as we knew, the place had been occupied right up until our arrival. It hadn't shown signs of disrepair or neglect, so we'd had no reason to think otherwise. Really? No wonder the place was such a bargain. How long was it empty for? The man and woman shared a look. Oh, you know, not that long, a few years. Anyways, we just wanted to bring this casserole. We have a few errands to run, but it was great meeting you both. Come on by our place anytime. We're number 56981, the next driveway on your side. Up that way, the man said, hooking his thumb eastward. I had never seen anyone introduce themselves and run so quickly. I tried not to take it personally. It was so nice to meet you both, the woman said, taking a few quick steps towards my wife and handing her the casserole dish. You can keep that dish, by the way. It's Pyrex. Great for casseroles. She backed up to join her husband, looking around the property nervously as she did. Hey, can I ask you something? The two of them looked ready to run back to their car, but they stopped and nodded, shifting on their feet anxiously, 
and waiting for me to speak. Have you ever seen anything? Uh, how should I put this? There's been a couple weird occurrences since we moved in, and I was just wondering if you could tell us anything. Is this place haunted? Is that why it was so cheap? I can tell you guys are nervous. Just give us something to work with, please. We're getting a little freaked out. The woman looked pleadingly at her husband. He nodded to her, and she went back to the car and got in the passenger seat where she sat, darting her eyes around from side to side. What exactly did you see? The man asked. Wait, no, don't tell me. It's better if we don't speak of them. They know when you talk about them. It's better if we don't. Well then, how do we get rid of them? You don't. These things have been around a lot longer than you or me. My wife and I get our share of strange events on the ranch next door too, but not as bad as here, this place. Well, there's something here that makes it special. And not in a good way, I'm sorry to say. I'd tell you more, but it would only make things worse. It always does. There was a sound of knuckles rapping against the glass, and I looked to see his wife banging on the car window, looking with wide eyes at us and pointing into the distance, towards the fields. My eyes followed where she was pointing and I looked to see the large gray wolf was back, and it was moving towards us again. I told you, we're not meant to speak of them, I need to go. The two of you should decide soon if you want to stay. This place will change you, and it will take things from you. You only get so long to decide. If you wait to see what the changes will be, it will already be too late. Trust me. With that, he turned away and went back to his car. He started the engine and drove off much quicker than I would have thought safe on the dirt driveway, swerving and leaving a cloud of dust hanging in the air around us, obstructing my view for a few seconds. When I turned around again, the wolf was much, much closer. It was about 50 yards away and closing in fast. It was looking at me intently. My wife was running back towards the house, yelling at me to come, but I was frozen, watching the wolf as it stood on its hind legs again. Not a wolf. Stop calling it a wolf. It's not a wolf. It's just trying to fool you into thinking that's what it is. But it's so much more dangerous than that. I tried to take a step, but my legs wouldn't budge. My eyes were locked on the wolf as it began to stalk towards me. No longer an animal, but something else wearing an animal suit. The ancient leathery-skinned humanoid beneath the wolf armor could be glimpsed occasionally as it strode like a hunter in my direction, taking long steps, moving low to the ground. The fur pieces were simply strapped onto it like clothing, the wolf head strapped on like a hat. What are you doing? Get in here! My wife yelled one more time and my foot suddenly started to move. As soon as it did, I found I was unfrozen and finally able to start running, and not a second too soon. The house was close, but the thing was fast. When it saw me beginning to run, it became a wolf again in an instant. The idea that it was anything but that seemed ludicrous as I watched it race towards me on all fours, its snapping jaws dripping saliva as it dove to cut me off. This thing was a massive gray wolf through and through. It could be nothing but that. And yet my eyes had begged otherwise just a moment before. If not for my wife, it might have gotten me. But she saw what was happening and took a large rock we had been using as a doorstop and threw it straight at the thing's head. It missed, hitting the beast in the shoulder instead, but it was enough to drive it back for a brief second, which was all I needed. I ran into the house and slammed the door shut behind me. An instant later, the scratching began again. Soon there was another one at the back door, scratching it as well. The sounds continued for hours. When the noises stopped and I finally ventured outside again, I found that three of the cattle had been killed. The others were scared out of their wits, hiding huddled together in a corner of the field near to the house. Their eyes darted around the fields, reminding me of how the neighbors had looked as they scanned our property for the things lurking in the shadows. I was beginning to suspect we were not going to be able to stay in this place much longer. Even if we could survive, this was no way to live. That night, my wife and I sat in the living room with all the blinds and curtains drawn, discussing what we would do. The house wouldn't sell quickly, that much was obvious based on the neighbor's statements. The two of us decided we would leave in the morning, regardless. We would stay in a motel until we found an apartment to rent, sacrificing all of our investment in the house. 
Even if we put it up for sale again, it would be a long, long time before we made any portion of our money back. But it was too dangerous and too terrifying to stay. I'm going to bed, my wife said, looking tired. Come upstairs soon, okay? I don't want to be alone. I'll be up in a minute, I told her. I just want to grab a glass of water. She nodded sleepily and went up the stairs slowly, looking depressed. We had dreamed about this move for so long, and now it was all coming to ruins. I felt sad about it too. I went into the kitchen and poured a glass of water. After drinking it down in one long gulp, I decided I needed another. It had been a long day, and I'd been too distracted to drink anything. A noise came from upstairs, a scraping sound like claws. Setting down the glass, I turned around and listened closely. Christine? She didn't reply. I took a few steps across the linoleum floor of the kitchen before calling out again. Once again, there was no answer. By the time I got to the bottom of the stairs, my heart was pounding so fast and hard, I felt like it would beat right out of my chest. I opened my mouth to call her name one more time when I saw it. The wolf that wasn't a wolf strode on two legs across the gap at the top of the stairs, then disappeared around the corner, heading towards my wife. It was so quick that I thought for a moment I could have imagined it, just a gray blur that was gone in an instant. If not for the fact that it looked down the stairs at me and smiled, its long canines gleaming in the light. Its eyes were pure blackness. I ran up the stairs as fast as I could, terrified of what it would do to her. When I got to the second floor, I looked down the hall to see all of the doors were closed. It was as if the whole thing had really been just my imagination. Taking an unsteady step towards the bedroom, my heartbeat did not slow down even slightly. My hand was shaking as I reached for the doorknob, turning it, and entering the master bedroom. I entered hesitantly, finding the room dark and my wife asleep in bed. Part of me wanted to wake her up, but for some reason I didn't. It will be fine, just go to bed, my irrational thoughts said. My pounding heart began to slow and my eyelids grew heavy. This is fine, my mind told me. Everything is fine, just go to sleep now. Trying not to think of what I had seen just moments before, I climbed into bed getting in next to my wife and shivering while my body warmed up beneath the sheets. There was a soft sound of padding footsteps outside the bedroom door. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Something wants to get inside the bedroom, and a strange foreign voice in my mind is telling me to let it in. I think the sightings first started up about 10 years ago. That's the same time my family moved to this town. I was only 12 at the time. Since then, many have claimed to have seen some sort of wolf or hyena-like animal running around. Supposedly, it roams the forest right next to our neighborhood at night. I went around and interviewed the eyewitnesses. Every description was the same. They said it has thick brown fur and bright blue eyes. It also has the ability to stand on its hind legs and is about my height when not fully upright. These sightings are common enough that even the law enforcement officers believe in this werewolf. They say there are no officially recorded wolves or mountain lions or any other similar animals in this area. That could explain the sightings. They've also tried to catch it more than once, but it clearly has human level intelligence since it has always been able to evade them. And no one knows where it goes during the day. And the sightings just seem to get more and more common as the years flew by, to the point where even my parents had claimed to see it once or twice. My mother says she saw it running across a road while driving home from work, late at night, while my father said he saw it creeping around our front yard before leaping over the fence and running back into the woods where it lurks. Everyone in this town claims to have seen this werewolf at some point, except for me. I don't believe in the thing. Why should I? Everyone knows eyewitness accounts are the least reliable form of evidence since they can easily be fabricated, exaggerated, or misinterpreted. That said, just recently, some extremely convincing physical evidence has been found. For instance, some people have photographed large footprints clearly canine in origin, but much larger than that of a fox or coyote. More gruesomely, hikers have been finding carcasses with their necks and spines, violently snapped open with powerful bone-crushing jaws. Ever since these deaths turned up, Everyone in town has been keeping their pets and livestock indoors at night for safety, especially since the creature seems to be losing its fear of humans. 
hence the recent sightings of it in urban areas. One of our elderly neighbors even claimed she saw it digging through her garbage right by her window. She says it turned right in her direction before going over to the window, pressing its muzzle against the glass and breathing powerful hungry breath before she ran to her bedroom, pulled the blanket over her head and stayed there until morning. After hearing that story, I knew I had to get to the bottom of this. Even if it wasn't a werewolf, there was clearly something in our town wreaking havoc. Maybe a feral dog or even an escaped hyena that someone was keeping as an illegal exotic pet. I decided I was going to try and catch the creature on film myself, no matter how difficult it would be. I set up a camouflage tent in the backyard, right next to the forest, and brought with me a headlamp, a video camera, and a gun. The latter I brought just in case I needed to defend myself from this animal. I set the camera up on a stand right outside the tent, pointed towards the woods, before crawling into my tent, zipping the door shut, and falling asleep. The next morning I felt a breeze coming from the front of the tent. I sat up and nearly had a heart attack when I saw that there was a gigantic hole torn in the tent door. I peeked out of the hole and noticed the chewed up carcass of a turkey lying in front of the tent, along with large paw prints surrounding it. He was here, I thought. I wanted to be excited, but I was mainly terrified. I had been extremely close to being this animal's dinner. The animal had torn open my tent then, for whatever reason, decided I wasn't worthy of a meal. Maybe the videotape will explain everything. I hooked the camera up to my computer and uploaded it, before examining the footage. At the very beginning of the video, I saw myself setting the camera up, before stepping out of view to get into the tent. The next hour of footage was unfortunately corrupted for whatever reason, so I skipped ahead another few hours. At approximately 3 a.m., I saw a big, furry, wolf-like creature walk out of the woods, its eyes shining brightly in the dark. It was carrying the same dead turkey from before in its jaws. The creature then walked over to the tent, dropped the turkey to the ground, and reared up on its hind legs like a bear. I felt chills run through my skeleton as the animal leaned forward and disappeared completely from the camera. Not only had it torn open my tent, but it had crawled into the tent with me as I was sleeping. I held my breath, desperately waiting for the animal to come crawling out of my tent and run back to the woods where it came. But it never did. Instead, as the sun rose up over the backyard, I saw myself climb out through the hole in the tent, walk over to the camera, and shut it off. After the footage was over, I felt anxious and confused. Even though that shot of it entering the tent was out of view of the camera, I'd expect to see some sort of movement from its paws as it tore the tent open. It was as if the opening in the tent was already there when it entered the yard. Had it torn the tent open in the corrupted footage? Also, if it had slept with me in the tent the entire night, how come it wasn't there when I woke up? The footage should have shown it going through the opening and it's not like there was any other way of leaving the tent. Then it hit me. I suddenly remembered all those mornings where I would wake up with dirty hands and feet for no explainable reason. And those mornings where my breath would smell worse than usual, as if I had devoured a whole bunch of rotting meat as a midnight snack. My heart sank. The entire room began to swirl around me as I struggled to stand. All of the pieces were falling into place. Why the creature only appeared at night, while I was sleeping. Why I was the only one in town who had never seen the thing why the camera had caught it entering the tent but not leaving. It turns out the camera had caught the creature leaving the tent, and that creature was the one who set up the camera in the first place. I had everything I needed. Pistol with silver bullets, silver blade, the only thing that could kill the beast. Sturdy pickup truck that could follow it through the mud if necessary. Adequate food and water that could last me for days. I wanted to kill this thing so badly I could feel the rage pumping through my veins corrupting my blood and sending me into a near frenzy. It ripped my father in half right in front of me, remorselessly, with an apparent bloodlust that I'm still trying to process. I lived alone with my father for a few years, taking care of him, helping him do basic things because he had become decrepit in the last several years. We lived in a small shack on the edge of nothing, a bleak and dense wilderness. He often told me stories of the wilderness of those that went in and never came back out, or if they did, 
they were forever changed. Many nights I would sit on the back porch, sipping beer and staring out at the thick line of trees. My father and I would go hunting in those woods, but only so far. We could always see the cabin from our stomping grounds. In a weird way, I developed the belief that as long as we were in the shack's sight, that it would protect us. Which, of course, was shattered when my father got brutally murdered in front of me that night. I probably would have been a goner too, except in my desperation and terror. I picked up the Bible and held it in front of my chest. The werewolf howled and its fist froze an inch from the book and promptly pulled back. It then sat on its haunches and whined like a puppy. For a brief second, my gaze turned incredulously to the book, and when I glanced back up again, the beast had gone. I wept for my father, and when the tears were spent, I buried him in the backyard. After my grief somewhat subsided, I collected my thoughts and a new goal formed in my head, that of vengeance. I'd often sit on the back porch and stare at the Bible, thinking about how it saved my life that night. And then I remembered what the priest had happened to his wife many years back. I couldn't believe I didn't think about it before now. I did hesitate, but my dad had been religious, at least vaguely, and had a sort of tenuous friendship with Father George at one point. So I made the trip. About half a mile down the road, the decent-sized house sat right at the end, seeming like a damn thing. I remembered the whispers around town, that the priest veered from his faith, and that was why his wife had died. I took a few deep breaths and got out of the car walking up the gravel road and knocking on the door. The day was fine enough, a bit overcast and just a little chilly, but okay. I stared out at the priest's acres and felt a sense of peace, my very first slice of it since my father died. Father George opened the door and smiled, and not the fake kind of smile my father and I had been given because we were poor. He just saw us as members of his flock. I wasn't necessarily a religious man, but I admired his consistency if nothing else. I came into the living room and he asked if I wanted anything to drink. I said just a bottle of water would be fine if he had any. Once he emerged from the kitchen, he handed me the bottle of water and sat down. After an uncomfortable silence, which only lasted a couple of seconds, I spoke up. Father George, I won't lie as I believe you'd frown on that kind of thing, but I came here for a reason. I know you always liked my father and I, and, well, something has happened to him. Something similar to what happened to your wife. What you said happened. Father George cleared his throat, maintaining his silence for a few more seconds. Then he said, I try not to think about that night, but when I do, my heart is filled with a rage that I just can't let go. I am practically a feeble old man. I want to take vengeance on the beast that killed my wife. But two things are stopping me. I am a holy man. Secondly, as I said, physically, I do not think I am up to the task. I told him that I was. The same beast killed my father and would have done the same to me if I hadn't held the Bible in front of me. Father George paused. That is interesting. Since I was wearing something holy, it didn't occur to me that it could have been the reason I wasn't mauled by the beast. All of this seems to suggest that it is an instrument of holy vengeance, and my own sense of right and wrong pales in comparison. But it killed your wife, the woman you loved. Father George's eyes became moist and he looked away. I need your help, Father. You are the only other one who knows about the wolf, and honestly, I can't do this alone. I am not the only one, Father George said. There is one other. Her husband fell victim to it, or so she claims. But I do not know if you can trust the woman in the woods. Father George told me that a woman lived in the woods, not far from the main road. He told me he would consider what I said, but that I should leave for now so that he could collect his thoughts. I got up in my car and left, even though he told me I couldn't trust the woman, nonetheless I was compelled to seek her out. I parked my car near the shack my father and I built with my own hands. Then I went behind the shack and entered the woods. I could have just parked my truck anywhere on the side of the gravel road, but I didn't want anyone in town, especially Father George, to see me entering and exploring the woods. He, above all us, would know what I was up to. I believe Father George was being authentic and telling how things were from his perspective, 
but being a priest and everything, his view was restricted to what he currently believed. I had to travel my own path. The woman's tent didn't take long to find, not really. I probably hiked for about a mile all total, combing the woods back and forth until I saw it. My heart skipped a beat as I realized this was the farthest I had ever been into the wilderness. An elderly woman was hanging her clothes on a line, the ends of the line supported by two trees directly opposite each other. The tent looked small, but I spotted a luxurious rug inside, a wooden chair and desk, and smaller items that I thought might have been talismans or something. The old woman saw me. Her eyes grew big and she made to flee. I held up my hands, backing off a little. I just want to talk about your husband, I said. She halted in her tracks. Who told you about that? I hesitated. The priest who lives in town. The woman spat on the ground. That bastard has been spreading rumors about me for years. Well, I haven't heard them. She hesitated for several moments, then offered me to come into her tent and hear the real side of the story, as she put it. The woman introduced herself as Bethany. She said she and her husband had run a small business in town years and years ago, and based on the dates, it happened before I was born. After I said what had happened in the shack on that fateful, horrific day, she told a similar story to mine, and to Father George's, about how the werewolf broke into the place and slaughtered him right there. Bethany said it was the most traumatic experience of her life, and Father George painted her a liar. No one could corroborate her story, of course, but charges weren't brought. It explained why she fled the town and decided to live in the woods. The town had shamed her. I wasn't sure why I never heard the stories, or maybe my dad did and just didn't tell me. I would have thought one of the other people in town would have told me, but maybe she was the town's dirty secret. Or maybe they were afraid of her. If you don't believe me, Bethany said, go to the only abandoned building in town. It used to be a dry cleaning service. I do not go inside the buildings anymore because the werewolf only kills inside buildings. It cannot kill you in front of anything you have built with your own two hands but inside, it has domain. Father George has no doubt told you he thinks the beast is an instrument of holy vengeance, and I believe that's true. This is a weakness of it, however, and for reasons that are unknown to me. Bethany said she wouldn't talk to me further until I had checked out the old one-story building. I remember passing it hundreds of times during my lifetime, never giving it much thought, except how creepy it looked. The door to the building opened easily, Large chunks of wood were missing where the doorknob should have been. Clearly, people had broken into it over the years. I opened the door and went inside. Everything was dark, and I turned on my flashlight, always kept several in the car, something my dad taught me when I was younger. You do not want to be stranded somewhere, in a strange place, completely in the dark. I shone the bright beam all over the large room near the desk, scanning the rows of empty racks. I didn't see anything of interest at first. Then someone's ghost materialized in front of me, and I let out a scream, almost dropping the flashlight and I was trembling too severely to move or flee. Bethany never should have cursed the beast, it said. I know she did it to avenge my death, but it's only brought pain to her. The ghost's voice was wispy. I could barely hear it, but the whispers sent violent shivers down my spine. The man had clearly been killed in a grisly way, similar to my dad, and I tried to avoid looking at the ghastly wounds. It remained for several seconds before wavering and disappearing. As soon as the trembles ceased and I knew the ghost had gone, I fled the building. I hurriedly opened the truck door, fumbled putting the key in the ignition, finally turning it. I took the car out of park and peeled the hell out of there. I had unfinished business with the woman in the woods. Based on what the ghost of her husband said, it stood to reason that she was responsible for the wolf creature killing my father. After all, it seemed that her cursing the beast resulted in something horrible happening. The ghost disappeared before I could find out what. On the other hand, the woman cursed the wolf creature to avenge the death of her husband. So it killed before that. Bethany was still putting her clothes on the line when I came to her little clearing. A pang of sympathy momentarily sliced through me. I was still angry at the prospect that she was responsible for the beast killing my father but I didn't see it as deliberately murderous, more like blind fury. I met your husband a little while ago, I said. His ghost. 
You didn't tell me I'd meet a fucking ghost, I said. I can still see the terror in your eyes. You are telling me the truth, Bethany said. He told me that you cursed the beast to take revenge. My husband was a kind man, but only told you part of the story. For some reason, I felt as if his ghost gave me the power to curse the beast, to channel its killing urge to annihilating those that lack faith. Because my study of the occult has led me to believe that the priest is responsible, albeit indirectly, for the origin of the wolf. It came to be because he had faith, then abandoned it. After the death of my husband and its transformation by my hand, the werewolf seems to seek the same in its victims. But, but his wife, had I started. She died, yet he survived. You said that it seeks out those that are like him. He should have died. You mentioned the werewolf didn't attack you when you held the Bible. If Father George was dressed as a priest in that moment, he would have been spared. I found this strange. Jurid explained why he had been spared that one time, but not all the other times after he could have killed. It didn't seem possible that he'd be dressed like a priest 24-7 or carrying a Bible. There had to be a better explanation. Honestly, I didn't know what to think. This werewolf seemed equal parts mystery and horror. I realized I couldn't rely on the perceptions of Bethany or the Father George. I needed time to think. I knew that each second that passed would give the werewolf another opportunity to kill me. I figured that as long as I held a Bible in my hands, I'd be safe. So much had happened that I couldn't even think straight. That was as much of a danger, if not a higher one, than giving the beast more time to annihilate me. Driving back to my shack, I noticed how deep the night had settled into everything, pervading every crevice my eyes could see, and all the hidden ones that people probably wished would just go away. Back at the shack, I sat on the wooden chair and leaned over the desk. I lit the lamp on the desk a few moments before, and a soft glow filled the room. I realized I hadn't gone through the trunk since Dad died, and that I probably should. I opened the trunk, seeing all the possessions he had accumulated over the years. Most of it was loose leaf papers or small leather-bound journals. I did my best to go through them all, making sure to keep the Bible close for protection. Once I had read most of the journals and papers, I just sat there incredulous. My dad had known the wolf, had conversations with it. I remembered he told stories of those who went deep into the woods and never came out, but apparently he was one of the lucky souls who did and lived to tell the tale. My mind returned to the question of why the werewolf had spared the woman in the woods and the priest while killing the priest's wife and the woman's husband. My rage at wanting the thing dead dissolved into an intense curiosity and then spiked into a constant state of low terror. I hadn't been very deep into the woods. My father had built a kind of vague mysticism around it. The thing he had used to instill such a feeling of terror in me was something I knew I needed to chase after despite my fear. The woman believed that the werewolf killed her husband for reasons unknown to her and killed the priest's wife because of its lack of faith after she transformed it, channeled it, as she claimed. But Father George had been wearing holy garb equivalent to my Bible, so why had he been spared? She had even said the werewolf had been created from Father George's lack of faith, not just lack of faith, but having abandoned his faith. Of course, the faith might have ebbed and flowed in the man, considering he was still a priest, but did the beast really make such distinctions? Underneath all the papers in the trunk was a secret panel. Inside lay a shining pistol. I checked to make sure it was still filled with silver bullets. It was. My father told me that if I ever needed to go into the woods, that I should take this pistol with me. But be warned, son. Despite what you might have read, you cannot kill the werewolf with a silver bullet. Only seriously wound it for a time. I grabbed the pistol and headed into the woods. The moon seemed suspended in a hammock of clouds, and I swallowed nervously. I know how werewolves are perceived, except my recent experience taught me that werewolves are real, and that they can be vicious killers waiting to pounce from the dark at any moment. As I went deeper into the woods, my fear increased. I could feel my blood pumping in my ears, and my left hand shook around the pistol. I didn't even know what I was looking for, but for some reason, I knew that if I went far enough into the woods, I'd find what I was looking for. Eventually, I came across a cave 
tucked behind a thick line of trees. I barely glimpsed it as I scanned the trees, but then my eyes went back to the blur of gray between the trees. If the werewolf was hiding anywhere, it would be inside, I told myself. I crept closer to the cave, pointing my flashlight closer to the ground so that I wouldn't arouse attention. I jumped several times while approaching the cave, but the sources of the sounds were only harmless critters. Once I was near the mouth of the cave, I had no choice but to shine my flashlight inside. I didn't see anything at first, so I had to venture further into the cave. The beam bounced all over the cavern walls, and I noticed deep scratch marks that upon closer inspection were tally marks. When the beam finally caught a patch of dark brown fur, which seemed to shudder with each long, beastly breath, I screamed. Two red eyes, sleepy and menacing, peered from the bubble of darkness. You are your father's son, I know you, the werewolf said. Stay back, I said, even though you savagely killed my father, I can't shoot you yet. It wouldn't even do any good because silver bullets can't kill you. I need to know. Why did you kill my father? Father George's wife, the husband of the woman in the woods, the woman said that she cursed you to attack those that lack faith. Father George lacked faith, according to... That woman is a fool. She does not control me, although she thinks she does. The magic provided by her dead husband, the perfidious soul who deserves to languish, only increased my rage at those that are unfaithful. The pistol shook in my hands again. I tried to keep the beam steady, but it kept bouncing on the cavern walls. Wait, are you saying you annihilate those that have been unfaithful to their partners? The werewolf nodded and bared its teeth. What about my father? My mom died long ago. Are you saying he was with another woman? Your mother isn't dead. She still lives, but a thousand miles away. She thinks he is in the ground rotting, and you with him. He led a double life, and you in its shadow. Then the werewolf got on its legs, bared its teeth again, both red eyes radiating a murderous gleam. All of a sudden, the beast lunged. I fired the pistol. Two bullets landed in its chest, another in its right leg. It whimpered and fell to the ground. I emptied the remaining bullets into the beast, and its spasms seemed to roll together before it went entirely still. I cautiously approached the motionless body. Then what happened next, I'm not quite sure. The werewolf stirred, growled, and its claws barely missed my foot. A billowy cloud of smoke filled the cavern, first a deep and frightening black, then becoming white and ghostly. My feet and arms weren't my own until several minutes later. The white cloud surrounding me dissipated, not slowly, but suddenly. The ghost of Bethany's husband floated before me, looking as ghastly as ever. I remember my first posthumous visit to the werewolf. That horrid beast is filled with revelation, isn't he? I couldn't talk for several minutes. The terror needed time to loosen. Nanut, my mother was still alive. When I recovered my wits, he took me deeper into the woods, far enough from the cave that eventually I stopped looking over my shoulder. Bethany's husband led me to a great pine tree, which seemed taller than the others. At its base rested a small ornate box. A bejeweled blade rested inside, the only thing that could kill the beast, according to the ghost. Shortly after, I embarked on the mission to remove the werewolf from this town I lived in most of my life, but I soon found that it wasn't easy to stalk and kill. It always seemed to be one step ahead of me. With the ghost's help, I tracked it to a gas station in the middle of nowhere, an abandoned one at that. I finally thought I had cornered the thing. Part of me didn't want to extinguish it for good because it had known about my mother. It knew about my dad's secrets, that he uprooted me from my childhood home that I didn't even remember, and placed me in this strange isolated town, where my life had been reduced to hunting a werewolf that, as far as I was concerned, knew the deepest, darkest secrets of the universe. It doesn't matter where I'm employed as a park ranger. What does matter is my secret job, the thing that I do when I'm off the grid, so to speak. A werewolf started appearing about six months ago, and I'm still not sure why. At first, we got calls from visitors saying they encountered grizzly bears, or something approximating one, deep in the forest. For the first few months, we got maybe a dozen calls. After that, things really started to ramp up. Daily, or rather, nightly, sightings. Despite that, no one could really get a good look at the thing everyone assumed to be beer. Then my boss showed up, 
A man I rarely saw, he tossed a trank dart gun at me and told me to head into the woods. Whatever you do, don't kill the thing. Based off the information we've been able to gather, this is no damn bear. Something possibly supernatural. Does this have anything to do with Elijah's disappearance last month? Something killed Elijah, and we never found the body. James only gave a slight nod, something that could be denied later if asked. The less you know, the better, Liam. Just take your truck and head into the woods. I'll mark the most recent sighting on your map, James said, crossing his arms and giving me a look that told me not to ask any more questions, but I couldn't help myself. Guess some weird government agency is involved in this if you're telling me not to kill it. You'd think the safety of the visitors would come first, I said, but James cut me off. Now officially, that's none of our business, Liam. Just taking orders. You'd be wise to do the same. So I closed my mouth and got to work loading my vehicle with some last minute things I thought I might need. Food, water, binoculars. Then I got in the truck and drove down the winding road. I decided to not get on the walkie because I didn't want to alert James. My plan was this, pick up Bill, my partner in crime more or less, at his usual patrolling location, then head off to where the location James marked on the map and see if we couldn't tag team this thing. I caught Bill just sitting in his patrol truck, reading an Agatha Christie novel and smoking a cigarette. I remember him telling me how relaxing he found it. Being out here, not a care in the world, tending to his biological needs, the cigarette, and the needs of his higher brain, the Agatha Christie novel. Hey Bill, we got a situation James wants us to look into. Bill looked up from his novel, mildly irritated. What kind of situation? Got a trank something, you know, that thing that everyone thinks is a bear, but probably isn't. Why trank instead of kill? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering that too, anyway. Hop in, good buddy. We got a long night ahead of us, and that's putting it really fucking mildly. Bill got in, and we drove off in the direction of the last sighting. I filled Bill in on what little I knew. Guess the thing that really concerns me is why now, why a month after Elijah's death? Bill asked, thumbing through the book in his hands but not really reading it. That caught my attention too. I don't know the reason, I just know that something fishy is going on. Then that's when we saw it, a large hairy beast running on all fours then randomly standing upright and roaring. Our headlights seemed to confuse the thing. Bill took out his pistol, rolled down the window and fired. Bill, what the fuck are you doing? No lethal force is allowed on this thing. We gotta use the trank gun. The thing which upon closer inspection looked exactly like a werewolf just roared and charged at the truck, grabbing its bottom and shaking it violently until Bill and I were completely disoriented. It then leapt into the trees. What the fuck is wrong with you? I said to Bill again once my head stopped spinning. I said no lethal weapons. Sorry Liam, just got rattled is all, wasn't going to get turned to human paste because a pair of government issue sunglasses told us not to us actual bullets. Bill replied, face flushed. Well, after that, I began to drive again, keeping our eyes peeled for the werewolf. We heard howls coming from the infinite line of trees to our left. No matter how much we combed the woods, we didn't find anything. This went on for several nights, experiencing horrific sightings of the massive man-wolf. I went by myself after the first night because I didn't trust Bill not to fire bullets at the thing. James was ripping me a new ass because I couldn't track the damn thing down, at least not keep it in my sights long enough to trank it. On the fourth night, I sat in my truck on the side of a wide road, scanning the eerily still line of palm trees. My ears pricked as I heard the soft crunch of twigs as tired crushed them. I peeked in the rear view mirror and saw a sleek black car parking behind me. A short woman with red hair came out of the car, using precise movements so that not one ounce of energy was wasted. Are you Liam? The woman asked, popping into my window like she was a cop about to give me a ticket. I heard the trees rustle behind her and began to perspire a little on my forehead. I'd tell you that you shouldn't be out this way, ma'am, since we've seen had a few bear sightings out this way, but I started. I don't mean to be blunt, but I outrank park rangers, again, not trying to be a jerk, just stating a fact. The woman seemed fairly young and her smile sent a shiver down my spine because it was so emotionless. She explained to me what was going on. She worked for a government agency, one I hadn't heard before. 
and they had been working on a serum to reverse the transformation of the werewolf. They were hoping I could sedate the thing before it did any real damage or chose to move on to an even broader wilderness. There has been a reason why this werewolf has been so good at evading you, and I'm not sure it has anything to do with it having preternatural abilities, the woman said. She finally introduced herself as Sarah Perkins. Here, take this Trank gun. It comes with a special tranquilizer that will not only sedate the werewolf, but also hopefully reverse his transformation. It hasn't been tested on his kind, since we believe he is the only one of his kind that exists. Sarah said and handed me a much larger gun than I had, which had a small tube filled with yellow liquid fitted onto the top. She had one for herself too. We hurried into the woods following the howls until I felt like we were dangerously close. Sarah scanned the environment, looking more vigilant than nervous. Okay, maybe a little nervous, but she hit it remarkably well. As for me, I was terrified, not afraid to admit that since I didn't have special government training to deal with a friggin' werewolf. The trees all around us began to rustle and before I could really get my bearings, the massive hairy beast shot from the top of one of the trees and landed on the ground. My hands shook. I tried to steady my gun, except my nerves wouldn't let me. Steady, I said I'd steady, but I just couldn't calm my shaking hands. The beast slowly moved closer on all fours, fierce yellow eyes fixed on me. A pound of drool must have escaped from its jaws hanging from them in thick, disgusting streams that made me want to vomit. It swiped the air with massive claws, growling. Just as I thought I was a goner, I heard the sound of a whisper whizzing by at about a hundred miles an hour, landing in the beast's hairy, bulging neck. Without thinking, I fired my own gun. The dart landed in the thing's abdomen. It growled weakly and collapsed onto the ground. Sarah didn't waste any time. She ran toward the thing and placed a small chip deep into the fur of its right arm tracking device, she said as its breathing slowed. The Trank transformation dart did what she claimed. The beast began to shrink. The fur started to go back into the skin. It all happened so quickly that at first I didn't believe what I was seeing. I went over to the man who shivered and rubbed his arms. The transformation had taken a toll on him. It took me a minute, but I recognized the man. Elijah, I said under my breath, you're alive, how is this even possible? Well, congratulations, Sarah, a man's voice said from behind. You got to Subject X first. You won the bet. I turned around. Bill. Bill, what is going on? I asked, tone clearly frazzled. Sarah jumped in. We work at the same agency. We had a little bet going. Whoever got to the werewolf first could do with it as it pleased. Kill it or trank it and but a tracking device on it. Of course, my way aligned with the agencies. Bill here is a renegade, wants to eliminate everything in sight. Bill gave a soft chuckle. Well, guess I got what I want either way, Bill said, grinning and patting me on the back as he walked past me. He knelt in front of Elijah and seemed to pluck one of the remaining werewolf hairs from one of its forearms and put it in a small glass vial. Then Sarah and Bill seemed to be talking in code and I couldn't at all parse what they were saying. Bill came up to me afterward. Okay, Liam, we better get out of here before that trank dart wears off. Looks like the serum's effects were only temporary. It'll completely change back into werewolf form in less than 15 minutes. Part of the transformation has already begun. The sedative will wear off in about 10 after that. But don't worry, we can track the thing with the device Sarah put on it. So we all left. Sarah in her sleek government vehicle and Bill and I in our park ranger truck. You can't tell James that I work for a government agency that hunts a werewolf, he said. Now, I wanted to kill the thing, wipe it off the map, but Sarah had other plans. I have to respect the bet. I lost. She won. Which means that Elijah will be roaming the woods and we have to track him every night, study him. After a while, once the agency has all the information it needs, it will either give a kill order, and I can deliver a bullet to the thing's brain, or it will come up with a serum that will permanently erase Elijah's werewolf tendencies. So with Bill's help, I track Elijah every night, using regular trank darts to sedate him. We take hair and skin samples, put everything into stainless steel containers that get shipped back to a secret government lab. 
They are working on a serum, just like Bill said. One which will be permanent. I have learned to accept Bill's new identity. Aspiring werewolf killer. I'll deal with it when the time comes. I think I have additional problems to the fate of Elijah because I've gone to the workman's cabin. Seeing Bill with those strange yellow eyes more than once, I'm not sure if he's a full-fledged werewolf because he's been with me every night, and I just see him in his human form, except sometimes as we are driving along, I'll see his eyes turn yellow under the deep shadows cast by the moon. Something is clearly different. Did the sample he took from Elijah that night have something to do with it? I feel trapped in this situation. Bill seems something else besides human, and I can't abandon my post without making him suspicious. I also don't want to abandon my post, because I feel like I have a duty to the visitors here to keep this werewolf at bay. And I do agree with Sarah given the circumstances. I don't feel comfortable ending the life of a fellow park ranger. Bill's a relative newcomer, and I worked with Elijah for years before he disappeared. I don't want to give up on a fellow ranger. I... Let's see, Rick said, eyes on the highway. I paid really scary people a $500 deposit to find the werewolf that killed my sister. He lifted a finger from the wheel counting. If the coterie witches actually find you, I owe them another $1,500. More fingers raised. My car's half wrecked and I'm not going to tell my insurance I tried to kill a 7-foot werewolf by crashing into a bridge. And the werewolf's my best friend, but he can only transform by bawling like a baby which he's too mean to do. He shook his head. How did my life get so screwed up? Count your blessings, I said. Forget the 1500. Once the Coterie figure out you and I know each other, they'll just kill you. And at least your best friend isn't a whiny drama queen. Bite me, wolf boy. Anyway, who's the queen here? The banter didn't fool me. Rick Ames was a badly disoriented fellow. Four years ago, his sister Ginger died when a werewolf sparked a panic in Drunken Tree's Square Diner. Tonight, he'd learned who the werewolf was. Now he was trying to absorb it all as we drove south toward Argenta. He was only two years younger than me, but I'd had four years to adjust to what had happened, what had been done to me. But he was making a tremendous effort and not just to be tough. He'd never dared a gay joke around me before either. I'll watch out for him, Ginger. So what can we do now, he asked. First thing, I said, you've got to call off the coterie even if they keep the 500. I suppressed a shudder. You don't want anything to do with them. I don't know how to get a hold of them. I'd have to call Mr. White. Then do it. It's almost 10 o'clock at night. Risk it. Tell you what, Rick said. We're only six or eight minutes from the Burger King in the pits. We can eat and I can call from there. We rode in silence for a mile or so. So tell me about it, he said at last. What really happened to you? He meant four years ago before Ginger was killed. You know I was missing for a month. Here's how I remember it. I was at home, that apartment on Wisteria. It was June 13th, Saturday. I remember eating lunch, getting on Facebook, then dreams, vague things. Ever have one of those nights when you keep waking up and having little dreams, and the night seems to last twice as long as it oughta? Yeah, I hate those. Like that only three or four times longer. Then there was a guy yelling at me and I opened my eyes and it was bright as hell. I wasn't in my apartment. I was hung up on the wrong side of a barbed wire fence and this guy's yelling at me to get off his land. He thinks I'm drunk. I think I'm still dreaming it because nothing around me looks familiar. He's calling the sheriff's office and I realize I don't know the clothes I'm wearing. They're all ragged, half worn out. Jesus. Yeah, so I start unsnagging my clothes and ask him where the hell I am. Turns out I'm on a county road south of 88. I'm 15 miles from town. I reach for my phone and I don't have it. We never found it. GPS tracking didn't find it. Ginger told me your folks were going nuts. Yeah, well, a deputy showed up about the time I got loose and got to the road. About then, I'm figuring out I don't have any underwear, just jeans and a t-shirt and cheap sneakers. The deputy takes a look at me and kind of rares back. Then he asks hostile-like, what's your name? Rick laughed. I can just hear boy on at the end of that. Yeah, I could too. I tell him my name and he looks like he can't decide whether to cuff me or pray over me. Where you been? He asks. And this time he does say, boy? I tell him. Last thing I knew I was in my apartment. 
but I scratch an itch on my arm and now I'm staring at my arms because they're too thin. I was remembering too well, I choked back the rising fear. Now I get scared and I ask him what's going on, he says I've been missing and it's July 22nd. I'm so scared I ask him what year. He tells me it's still 2015 and I about cried. You? Rick scoffed. You don't get how weird it was, I didn't notice for a while but the deputy sure did. I didn't have a beard. I'd been gone 39 days and I had one, maybe two days growth of whiskers, that's all. In fact, I had about exactly what I'd have had on June 13th, and there was something else. The bulletin on me mentioned the scars on my chin and cheek, said they were very distinct. But when I woke up in the barbed wire, they were gone. No scars anywhere. Not the burn scar on my arm, no vaccination scars, and I don't have a single mole anymore. Rick knew most of the aftermath already. Nobody accused me of anything, but nobody believed I remembered nothing of those 39 days. My parents had paid a month's rent on my apartment, had made Facebook pages and what all about me, and now I just popped up in strange clothes saying I don't know. They saw my face scars were gone and thought I'd gone to Mexico for plastic surgery. That's really dangerous, mom said. My billfold phone and the clothes I'd been wearing were all gone. Aside from spoiled food, my apartment looked untouched. My keys were on their usual hook in the kitchen. My car's odometer hadn't changed. My boss looked at me slantwise, but he gave me my job back. My parents called as often as ever, and we still ate together on Sunday. But it was more formal than before, like right after I'd come out as gay. Nobody believed me except Ginger. I went to work, moved pallets all day, came home. I didn't talk to anybody but Ginger. I'd never been lower in my life. One night I called mom and it was like talking to that deputy again. Lock him up or pray over him. After I hung up, sitting on my couch, I broke down. And that was the first time I changed and it didn't hurt but it felt wrong the way water in your ear feels wrong or a muscle that won't stop twitching. I could hear my skull bones creaking and stretching. My hands looked weird, palms too big, fingers too short. My vision blurred, then sharpened. I stood up to find a mirror and hit my head on a door lintel. The floor, the furniture, were too far below me. I got dizzy. Grabbing for the doorframe, I punched claws through the sheetrock wall. I pulled my claws in, pushed them out again. Watching that, I wanted to throw up. I was scared and muddled, but not a beast. I still had a human mind. I hid all that day. I fell asleep, curled on the living room floor, and woke up normal. I almost convinced myself it was a nightmare until I found the claw marks by the hall door. I nearly called in sick to work the next day, scared to death it would happen again. For two weeks I was tight as a drumhead, jumping at every sound, watching everyone watch me. I studied the moon phases until I figured out they meant nothing for me. I drank a hell of a lot more than was smart. Occasionally I drank myself to a weepy stage, something I never did around other people, and found myself changing again. I learned finally that sadness triggered the change and the calm reversed it. It wasn't enough to control my emotions, I had to let go of them, become empty of them. Damn tough for someone who spent his whole life holding everything inside. I'd always held everything in and now I held even tighter, but I had to talk to somebody. Ginger Ames was the only person in the world I trusted. I was afraid to have her in my apartment. Of course I thought werewolf when I began to change and I was afraid of the horror movie ideas. If Ginger was there when I changed, I'd go mad with hunger and eat her. Since I'm so uptight, I thought my control would be stronger in a public place. I asked her to meet me at the square diner. It's the worst mistake I ever made, I told Rick. His grip on the wheel was white knuckled. Every goddamn day, I blame myself that she's dead. You, his voice caught, came out husky. You shouldn't blame yourself. You didn't do this to yourself. I didn't handle it too well, Sikors. He turned into the Burger King on 88, let's get fed. We kept quiet until we had a table to ourselves. Time for you to make a call, I said. You sure it can't wait till tomorrow? But he pulled out his phone and dialed. Hello, sir, it's Richard Ames. I'm sorry for calling so late. They are? That's good. No, sir, I didn't think you would. Not this quickly. He bit his lip. The thing is, sir, I don't want the co- Your, um, associates to investigate after all. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. 
and I understand if I can't get my deposit back, you will, that would be great. But you see, I've been well advised not to look for the guy that I just make trouble. He listened, then gave me a nod. Yes, sir, that's fine, I'll be up, thanks. He hung up. He's gonna call. He says they might give my deposit back. Did you pay cash? Cashier's check. Look, Travis, is the coterie are? Are they really that dangerous? You know what they are. Yeah. yeah, I know witchcraft's real, but I never heard they were organized. There's at least two groups around the lake. I think they compete, and there's more than one level to the coterie. There's some decent folks that don't know about things like me. How'd you get onto the coterie anyway? Mr. White said they're a secret. They are mostly. I have found them sooner, but Ginger died, and I spent four years hunting that guy. It's only lately I've started asking about myself. Remember the clothes I woke up in? Old, worn out? It's a freak thing. But I knew the t-shirt. I recognized it. It used to be Ben Poundstone's. Do you remember the hand-painted t-shirts Ben and Charity used to wear to school? He swallowed a bite of Whopper too fast. I remember hers, a size too small. They came from a place in Branson, custom airbrush. Ben's had a black unicorn, emerald horn. I shrugged. That's what I woke up wearing in July. So I asked Ben. He said his mom donated a bunch of old clothes to the help closet. So the Coterie bought old clothes for you? No, you didn't see how worn out these were. Charities just tossed donated clothes that old. It had to be somebody working at the closet. I started checking out people behind the closet, and the name Coterie started coming up. Elaine Poundstone's almost certainly one of them. I was waiting for her when I saw you today. Laney Poundstone? Geez, she used to chaperone our band trips. Yeah, like I said, there are two levels and his phone cut me off. Rick paled, but he answered quickly. Yes, sir, I saw him mouth bullshit. Yes, sir, I could be there tonight. No, that's not too late. Thanks. He closed the call. That girl Kite is up in Drunken Tree, he says. She still got my check. He says to meet her at the diner, but not till after 11. It closed at 10, didn't it? Except Fridays and Saturdays, it's a trap, right? Oh, hell yeah, she could bring it to you any time. No need to go get it tonight. He grinned. So help me, he was enjoying this. So they figured out we're friends. <laughs> yeah, so now you're a problem. This was going to be hard. That's why you're not going. He did not take that well. Look, I said, they made me for some purpose. But you're just a headache. I'm useful to them, but you're not. So you're keeping your distance. I didn't really persuade him so much as convince him I wouldn't budge, and we didn't have time to argue. Take me home, I said. I'll take your car. If I need help, I'll call. You can use my car. And you'll keep me posted. I assured him I would. We linked friend tracking on our phones. By the time I thought of using it, it was too late. 20 minutes later, I was crossing Grace Mountain. We'd tried to think of preparations, things I could bring, but neither of us owned a gun or a knife bigger than a scout pocket knife. Neither of us had a Bible handy or crucifix or holy relic or piece of the true cross. I didn't like that they'd given Rick time to prepare. Rushing him would have been good strategy. It scared me they didn't think they needed that extra advantage. I planned to park some ways off, approaching the diner on foot a few minutes before 11. I hoped to ambush whoever the coterie sent. Even in human shape, they'd improved my night vision, and I seemed to move more quietly. It didn't matter, the coterie were too far ahead of us. I drove past the darkened diner without stopping. No cars in the gravel lot. If anybody lurked nearby, I couldn't see them. They'd see Rick's car, hopefully assume he was driving. I stopped a block up a side street. Slinking through yards, I zigzagged toward the square diner. The moon hadn't risen yet, but with my improved night vision, I saw two figures in the shadows behind the diner more than a block away. I could even see that one of them had a phone out, the screen lit. I wish I'd known what that phone meant. I'd argued with myself whether to change. I decided to stay human until I was done sneaking through yards. Now it was time to cry. It's not easy to be sad when you're scared blind. I thought about Ginger, all we'd lost, how my parents had grown formal, about Rick's pain, about the last four years of loneliness. I felt the first sting of tears. 
Ginger, I said under my breath, I want to take care of him. You're doing just great. For a heart-stopping moment, it was Ginger's husky voice. I whirled. A slight female figure stood a foot behind me, and I hadn't heard a thing. She held a phone. I've got the dog, she told it. Where's the puppy? She also held a knife, long and straight, a by-god dagger. It glinted in the orange sodium lights, as if the blade were gold. So did her hair, a pale orange cloud. Kite, from Rick's description. It doesn't take silver to hurt me. I watched that knife like a cat watching a broom. With the blade, she gestured toward the shadowed pair. After you. If I could have changed, I might have taken her. But her ambush had goosed me back into stark fear. For the moment, I was stuck as human. Sure, I said, my voice still easy and calm. I was caught, whether I waited here or over there, as we approached one of the others called, He's on his way, in a high, thin voice. He looked about 45 or 50, short dark hair peppered with gray. Then I recognized the tall, slender woman beside him. Fern Ames, Rick and Ginger's mother, what the hell was she doing here? Good God, was Fern Ames part of the coterie? Then she saw me, her voice dead, she said, you, I should have known, you've been nothing but trouble. Douglas, Ginger's dad, had been reasonable, but Fern had never stopped blaming me somehow for Ginger being gay. He's about three miles out, the man said. Rick, what did you do, make a spell to call him here? Fern wore a long khaki coat I recognized. It hung open and I realized she wore a robe beneath it. I think, Fern said, and stopped. I had never seen a face so empty. I think Doug's dead. We swayed on my feet, shocked to my soul. The man spoke, his thin voice ironic. Our acquisiting of the mother did not go as smooth as we hoped. He shrugged. Is the boy driving your car? Maybe you'll be blamed for it. Now I felt grief, but it was swallowed, utterly engulfed by cold rage. Why, I said, voice too flat to make it a question. What did we ever do to you? I heard Kite giggle. Rick was right, she was hella scary. The man shrugged again. Nothing, you were handy. Handy? What, you thought we wanted you for something? We had to bleed off some mojo. Sheer mystification was piercing my anger. What, you had too much good karma? You had to do something evil? He laughed. All that good evil crap about balancing magic is, you know, crap. He glanced at the phone. Ever overheated your brakies on a hill? What do you do when your brakes fail? Never been that stupid, but my mom taught me hit something soft. That's good. Well, sometimes magic's like a car with bad brakes. You get momentum and lose control. Summer of 2015, things between us and the circle got pretty hot. You could say we were fighting for the wheel and heading for a wreck. Shannon said we had to shed some momentum diverted into something random. He shrugged. You were nothing but a nice, thick hedge. Something soft, Kite said, smiling broadly. We didn't even pick you, really, the man added. Your building was in a hot spot, and you were home. He made a zap gesture. Tough luck, he said, so I attacked him. Nothing scientific, I just hit him as fast and as hard as I could. I knocked him back into the diner, putting me out of Kite's immediate reach. His fists came up but no more skillfully than mine. I popped him once in the throat, butted him in the mouth, kicked him hard in the crotch. He dropped the phone, thumped a fist into me a couple of times, then curled up, choking. I ran for the road. Catch Rick. Make him nope his ass out of here. I'll kill her, Kite shouted. I'd already made up my mind. With a choice between Fern and Rick, I'd save my friend. Somebody said a word. It was a simple sound, something like tan, but it rang all around me, a deep male voice. The ground quivered with it. It hit me in the chest like a cannon blast. I sprawled on the gravel, sliding to the road's edge. My muscles turned to string. The word, whatever it was, stole my strength. The new attacker killed my hope. I was beaten, almost before I'd started. Despairing, hardly knowing I was doing it, I began to weep. I saw headlights down Shore Road, a pickup, not Rick. That deep voice spoke again, a different word, KO. The headlights blurred, the pickup crews passed, inches from my outstretched hand, without swerving or slowing, a spell to hide me. 
I flexed that hand, saw claws slide from my blunted fingers. I heard a familiar engine, my car was coming fast. Rick and I pushed myself to hands and knees. The ground was a mile below. I stood and heard a gasp behind me. Oh shit, the man rasped. Kite, he's turned. I wheeled around. Kite was coming at me, dagger ready. Behind her, the man dragged Fern across the diner's front. To my altered vision, distant streetlights lit the area like sunlight. Tan boomed around me again, but I wasn't weakened. In fact, it seemed to invigorate my altered body. Had they made a mistake at last? Kite was upon me. Christ, she's fast. I barely dodged her first swipe, then we were circling each other. But the change made me fast too. It reshaped my joints for greater leverage and strength, lengthened my limbs for greater reach. I lunged and missed grabbing her wrist by a hair. She slashed my arm, but not deeply. Tires shrieked and headlights flared across us. We both flinched. I snatched at her and she sprang backward. Then she turned and ran for the diner's far end. With a glance back at the headlights, I pursued. The man stood beside Fern at the diner's entrance. The headlights swung across them. I hoped Rick recognized his mother's raincoat. No time, Kite screamed. Run! The man pushed Fern away, started Kite's way. K.O. said the deep ringing voice. For a moment, my vision blurred. Kite and the man disappeared. Fern seemed to shift sideways, some sort of illusion. Then my vision cleared and all three were back as they were. But the headlights had centered upon Fern. My car passed me, engine roaring, then Rick rammed my car into the diner entrance, with his mother sandwiched between. Plate glass windows exploded into splinters. A section of concrete block wall shattered. The entrance roof collapsed. Fern had to be dead, they'd cast some sort of illusion, tricked Rick into killing his own mother. Oh, Ginger. I bore down on the two visible enemies, Kite darted toward the road. The man ran for the diner's rear. Kite was the more dangerous, so I went for him first. His foot slipped on a scatter of broken glass, and he went down hard. As I leaped toward him, I saw him hold up something like a red popsicle stick. He snapped it, and the huge voice said Tan again. I felt an incredible surge of strength, like I'd mainlined Red Bull. I leaped into the air so high I had time to think. This was dumb, but he didn't take the opening I'd left. In panic, he screamed and crossed his arms over his face. I landed crouched on his chest, feeling ribs break, driving ten claws into his soft belly. As I ripped at him, I saw several more wooden sticks colored red and green and yellow spill from his shirt pocket. So, no third man after all. They really were pop cycle sticks, or those things schools call craft sticks. Some kind of prepackaged spell, like a potion or amulet from an old story. I glanced back and Kite was racing toward me, nearly soundless on the gravel. Wondering how to aim, I snatched up a handful of sticks and snapped them all together. For lack of any better command, I growled, Get her! A cacophony of words boomed around us, Kite smacked into an invisible wall. I sprang toward her, staying low this time. If I jumped high, she wouldn't panic. She'd skewer me on the way down. She was slashing left and right blindly with the dagger. Had a word hidden me? I darted in. But in a moment of misguided chivalry, instead of tearing out her throat, I seized her wrist. Then by God, she knew where I was. The sticks had taken her strength, but not her speed. Faster than I could think, she popped the dagger from right hand to left, then slashed behind her back, taking me in the left ribs. Ripping down, she bounced the blade off my hip and laid fire along my thigh. The pain was stupefying. I clenched my fist, but then my head spun. I lost my hold and fell. She shrieked. My convulsive grip had crushed her wrist. Still blind to me, she slashed back and forth, knife in her left hand. One swing just above my head left floating hairs behind its screw chivalry. She was female and blinded by illusion and the deadliest enemy I'd ever faced. I ducked under a wild swing and ripped the inside of her thigh from crotch to knee. She screamed the harsh, rage-filled cry of a falcon. As she fell, I rolled away over and over. I, I rolled right into the man's body. I pushed, groaning to my hands and knees, blood pouring from my shirt and jeans. Is she coming again? She lay on the ground, both hands squeezing her leg. Blood gushed from between her fingers. I'd hit something big. I could see her grip weakening. I watched her eyes unfocus, her head fall back. 
Two popsicle sticks lay unbroken, one green, one yellow. I scooped them into my own pocket, then started crawling toward my crumpled car. Was Rick alive? I didn't make it. Flashing lights roused me from a faint, a drunken tree patrol car rounding the corner. Another approached down Pinter. The first cop twisted his spotlight back and forth across the scene. I heard him say, holy shit, then get on the radio, send medical, I've got at least three casualties. He went first toward my car. I snapped the green stick, concentrating hard. Pay, said the voice. I have no idea what it might have done. I snapped the yellow one. K.O. boomed around me, and with every ounce of mental strength remaining, I pictured Rick in the passenger seat. And it worked. Both cops and three paramedics reported finding Rick in the passenger side, buckled in, airbag in his lap. He was concussed, but not otherwise hurt. Fern was quite dead bled out in moments, if not killed instantly. The Argenta police had already found Douglas dead on his front lawn, after neighbors called 911 about screams, fighting, and a car racing away. That took place almost exactly at 10, when Rick and I had been across town at the Burger King. I spun a confused tale about how these strangers had called Rick, saying they had his mother. I'd come along to help him. I showed the Burger King receipt. I claimed they'd had some sort of big cat on a leash, that clawed them and ran away afterward. I said I'd been too busy fighting the girl with the knife to see how my car crashed. I denied knowledge of why any of it happened. The call record of Fern's phone by the dead man's body backed me up. So did the staff at Burger King, who amazingly remembered us. The dead man turned out to have a record for assault. I had wounds from Kite's knife, and they couldn't identify Kite at all. Whatever story Rick told must not have contradicted mine too badly. I don't know what he knows about Fern's death. I've been afraid to ask. The cops don't like any of it, but they're taking my version, at least for now. They don't want to look for a werewolf. Rick tells me he's done. He's lost nearly his entire family. He's going to move to Atlanta, live with his brother while he finds a job. The Coterie can go to hell on their own time, he says. I'm glad he'll be with Gary, because to me he looks like a wounded animal searching for a place to die. But I'm not done, I have more names to check. Shannon, some sort of coterie leader. Yuri White, who led Rick to kite. The Circle, who might be allies against the coterie, or might be worse. Ginger, I promise somebody is going to pay. We were always told not to venture out on Werewolf Road late at night when we were children. But one night, we were just too damn determined to know why the teenagers from our small town were so frightened by the unnerving place that we had to see for ourselves. I had my small backpack loaded with snacks, a flashlight with spare batteries, a flare gun with a can of bear spray, and attached to my backpack was my sleeping bag. The four of us gathered together behind my cousin's house, who lived just two houses down across the street. And together, we all exchanged scary legends and stories we had heard about the road and the cemetery on it. I heard there's a woman in the trees who jumps on people's cars late at night, she sleeps on a mattress with her dead, rotting baby, Evan said with a morbid sense of pride in his voice. That's baloney, my cousin Justin said, shaking his head. I heard she was just drunk and that happened once. The baby wasn't dead. The police took it from her, though, he said in a matter-of-fact tone. You guys ever hear about the dead puppy in the box my brother found in the cemetery? I said aloud. The other three looked at me, their eyes widening with interest as I spoke up. He said he went up there alone one day around two years ago, when we moved here. He said he was walking through the graveyard, and near one of the tombstones, there was a purple box. He saw blood on the outside of the box and grabbed a stick to open it, and there was a dead puppy that someone sacrificed. He looked up and saw streamers in the trees, and an area where it looked like there was a fire. For four adolescent boys with active imaginations, you could only picture how terrified we were. There would have been next to no possibility that we would venture out anywhere such as that alone. But together it was a different story. We were all in this together despite how frightening it was. Oh come on, he's just jacking with you, Ronnie, the youngest of us four, spouted. I could tell if he was lying and believe me he wasn't. He had a look on his face that makes me feel like he wasn't. Are we gonna do this or not? Justin said, seemingly irritated by the stories. We each shrugged and picked up our belongings, and next thing we knew, 
we were walking towards the woods that led to the legendary road on the other side. The leaves and sticks cracked beneath our feet as we stumbled around in the pitch black summer night. Justin had his flashlight shining ahead of our group. The narrow beam shone the heavy thicket that surrounded us. In some places you could see, even in the absence of light, the silhouettes of fast food litter like styrofoam cups of various sizes and plastic bottles or discarded cans that were scattered about. I felt the crunch of an empty beer can under my foot. I cursed under my breath as I realized just how loud and inconvenient my misstep was. Evan turned around and shooshed me as we continued walking. Fuck off, Evan, I said in a stern but quiet voice. I raised my hand as he turned forward, the thought crossing my mind to smack the back of his head. I bit my bottom lip and considered how bad that could be for us if the wrong group of people noticed our presence. Okay, I can see the road. We need to decide right now if we are going to drop our stuff off first and then continue, or if we're going to take everything, Justin said. I looked around at the flat, dry ground that was covered in leaves nearby. That looks like a perfect area to set up camp, I said, pointing at the spot. We all four removed our bags as we walked over to the grounds I chose, setting them down. Anything valuable any of you might need to grab before we go? Justin asked. I ran to my bag and grabbed the bear spray, assuming it would be good just in case we ran into some trouble. Ronnie and Evan shook their heads and continued with him as he moved his flashlight from off our newly claimed campsite and headed for the cemetery on Werewolf Road. I quickly caught up to them as we continued. In the humid summer night, there wasn't a sound to be heard besides a barn owl that could be heard in a tree nearby and our feet lightly moving across the earth. We reached the dirt road and I raised my head and looked around as what sounded like something heavy fell through a mess of branches, perhaps a decrepit tree or a large animal. Whatever that was, it wasn't small, I heard Ronnie say. I looked over at him and was leaning over his bent knees, wiping his sweaty face off with his dark shirt. He raised up and shook it, attempting to cool off. We four sat in silence, the night now grew more ominous. We stared at the dirt road, and I now looked to the right, remembering the wooden bridge that led to the cemetery. It's this way, I said. We continued walking, I turned around to notice the rest of the group behind me, Justin still holding the flashlight, but aiming it up in the trees rather than the very dark road ahead. Justin, can I see the flashlight? I asked. Here you go. He said as he quickly stretched his arm out and held it out like the Olympic torch. We approached the wooden bridge. As we came closer, I looked out at the creek, where you could see a pile of dead hogs, perhaps six or more, on the creek bed. The stench from their rotting, bloated corpses fouled the air. On the bridge was a pentagram drawn out near the very center. It had been faded from the elements, but you could still see it fairly well. We gathered around it, not saying a thing aloud. The cemetery is just up the road, I said. We continued across the bridge, and I noticed that Ronnie turned his head and looked back at the creek where the dead hogs were. Did you guys see that or smell it at least? We continued walking, not thinking too much about it. There could have been many reasons for that. Not every little thing had to be unusual, even to young boys who longed for excitement. As we got closer to the cemetery, we noticed a bright light coming from inside its fence. It was a fire. We rushed down the road, trying our best to stay low and keep quiet as we grew dangerously closer to the cemetery. We got off the road and made our way up a ditch, which led us into the woods that surrounded the cemetery fence line. As we lined up to peer through the fence, we were careful to stay low. Embers lingered around the blaze like fireflies in the cemetery landscape, and we watched as these beings that gathered around the fire. They weren't human. There hadn't been a chance they were human at all. They were beastly, savage creatures that were swift on all fours. When they were on the lookout, they stood on their hind legs and perched, exposing their ape-like chests and torsos. The rest of their bodies looked more canine, like a greyhound. Their faces were covered in heavy beaked masks that looked similar to the surgeon makes worn during the Black Plague. But these were more of a ghastly sight on such already terrifying monsters. I knew we couldn't dare trespass on their fiery territory. I watched as one lurked near a tombstone and dug like a canine into the ground. 
I listened as we could hear what sounded like gurgling coming from the plot, dirt being thrown viciously behind the creature. The rest of the pack began to gurgle and click their mouths as they walked around the fire. Three other creatures gathered near the burial plot where the first creature dug, and the other three stood on their hind legs and looked around. I watched as the creature that was now burrowed deep in the ground climbed out of the hole with a rotting arm in its mouth. It sat next to the others, arm between its two hands sniffing. The others gurgled and sniffed in between chirps. Another creature crawled into the hole and came back to the surface with a dismembered leg in its mouth and carried it away from the rest of the group. Justin looked over at the rest of us with a face full of shock and he spoke very hesitantly in an almost faint whisper, trying his best to control his breathing. We've got to get the hell out of here. I don't know what those things are, but they aren't people. I say we leave our stuff at the campsite and get back to my place fast. The four of us backed away from the fence and we got as close to the bottom of the ditch as we could. We knew that any little noise from us could be fatal. The sticky summer air attracted unrelenting mosquitoes that swarmed around our ears and our sweaty necks and arms. We tried for our lives to ignore the high-pitched buzz that rang in our ears as we crept towards the bridge. I heard a gurgling sound in a nearby tree overhead. It rattled and clicked, signaling the others to move in on us. I looked up to see it as, through its frightening mask that covered its disfigured face. It looked down on me with its black dilated pupils as I felt the sweat collect in my eyes and the mosquitoes I refused to away at bite into my neck. The other three were frozen in place, staring at the creature as well. I smelled urine in the air from Ronnie as he couldn't anymore hold his bladder in fear. I couldn't blame him. There wasn't a moment for ridicule or disparagement. The creature stared into our eyes and I heard the fence line viciously rattle as the other creatures climbed and jumped it, closing in on our misfortunate, desperate souls. Justin spoke up. Guys, any ideas? I slowly reached into my pocket and felt for a lighter. In my other pocket was the big can of bear spray. We let them close in on us dangerously to our discomfort, but I knew this was an ample opportunity to quickly discharge as much of the can on them as I could while we still had a chance. I watched as the creatures fell on their backs, croaking and clicking their tongues with this very awful and loud scream that came out in between gurgles and rattles. They nervously clicked more after this. The creature in the tree appeared to fear jumping. It leapt in the opposite direction, scurrying near the cemetery fire. We quickly rushed across the bridge we jumping into the creek near the dead hogs and trudging through the water. It was only five minutes or less to Justin's home. The time we counted down together, not allowing failure to escape the grip of such vile and heinous of creatures. We saw the porch light nearby as we entered into the neighborhood. It had been a welcome relief to know that we had arrived finally. As I reached Justin's patio under the floodlight, I took a moment to catch my breath. I turned my head to look around and I realized I had been the only one who reached my cousin's backyard. I called out each of their names, but without success. I waited around five minutes when I saw the beam of Justin's flashlight shine into the backyard from over the fence. I watched as him and Evan and Ronnie boosted each other over his fence as I continued to walk over to them and ask them what exactly kept them so long. I watched them and something seemed different about their demeanors. They each had a look in their eyes that unnerved me. Justin spoke up. You left us behind. You didn't even let us catch up with you. What the hell were you thinking? He said angrily. I walked in circles, looking up at the three of them as they stared at me with unequivocal disapproval nonetheless. After the three of them refused to talk to me that night, I finally decided to walk home. As I got to my room, I quickly stripped to my boxers and fell onto my bed. I woke up around 8.30 in the morning to my father calling out to me from his office, and he said, Tyler, come in here right now. I walked into my father's office. I watched as he held his bald fist over his mouth, leaning back in his leather chair. He ran his other hand through his hair and looked at me. Your cousin and your friends are missing. What happened last night? I thought about it for a moment but hesitated on giving a full disclosure. We just hung out till early this morning and then I came home around 1 o'clock this morning. They were there when I left. 
Did you go anywhere with them or did they have somewhere they wanted to go? He leaned forward. The only place we went to was the cemetery on Werewolf Road. I found a VHS tape with this bizarre title in a cardboard box, along with dozens of others, that I picked up at a local garage sale for a dollar. The first time I watched it, I wasn't sure what I was looking at. The second time, I knew I had to transcribe what I'd seen for this community. What follows is the content of the Mr. Pause tape, as far as I understand it, with my impressions highlighted in italics. The interior of a van, the resolution isn't as clear as modern video, but also isn't too faded or grainy, suggesting that the tape was recorded in the late 1990s. A stubbly man with black hair checks his dazzling teeth in the camera before focusing on the van's driver. Her thick eyebrows contort as she focuses on the road. The man zooms in until she rolls her eyes, laughs, and pushes the camera back, giving us a view of equipment, luggage, and travel supplies. Man. So, Shelly, are you ready for our first house call? Driver, Shelly. Can it, Travis? You're wasting video. Man, Travis, I, but what about capturing these special little moment, hey? The video cuts off. When it resumes, we see a small ranch house at the end of a tidy gravel driveway. As the camera zooms in and out, we get the impression that there are no other houses nearby, only low forested mountains. The sun blazes overhead, but a hazy fog still lingers in the shadows between the trees. Their dark presence contrasts with the brightness of the yard, which is a mess of flower beds, lawn ornaments, and colorful plastic toys. The camera pans to the gray exterior of the van where we see Shelley, the driver, in closer detail. She's a stout, muscular woman with a round face and black framed glasses. She wears a yellow sundress and doesn't seem to know what to do with her hands. Shelly. Hi, I'm uh, Shelly Bledsoe and we're in North Carolina today investigating some strange, um, behaviors that, um, wait, fuck. The recording ceases, then resumes. Shelly looks into the camera with a confident smile. Shelly. This is Shelly Bledsoe with Travis Rittenhouse. It's a hot July day here in North Carolina, where we're at the home of Heather Crutcher, one of our readers. She's asked us to look into some strange behaviors she's noticed in her daughter, Cynthia. Let's see what she has to say. We follow Shelly as she crosses the lawn and taps on a screen door. A loud television program clicks off, and a woman with hoop earrings and a wide grin appears out of the gloom. Ma Heather, Shelly, I can't believe it's really you. I had no idea you were coming so early. Heather wraps Shelly in a hug, wreathed in cigarette smoke. As Shelly winces and tries to break free, Heather checks her reflection in the screen door glass and adjusts her hair a bit. Shelly, it's good to finally meet, Heather. You've sent us a lot of letters about what's been happening with Cynthia. Would you mind to sum up for our viewers? Heather's grin fades and her expression darkens. She glances quickly at the line of trees behind her. She whispers something to herself before turning back to the camera. Heather, a few months ago, Cynthia started spending more and more time out in the woods. At first, I was glad she was getting out. She'd been so clingy since her dad run off, but then she started to change, talking to herself, acting out. I know she's walking around at night because I can hear the floorboards creak. Sometimes she comes into my bedroom and just stands there, breathing. Shelly looks nervously at the camera or maybe at Travis. Heather takes a deep drag on her cigarette. Her hand is shaking. Shelly, have you tried anything to keep your daughter away from the woods? Heather, oh yeah, it's useless. I lock the door, but soon as I turn my back, it's wide open and she's out there again. Shouldn't even be possible because I got the only key. If I try to hold her back, she gets bitey. She won't let nothing keep her away from Mr. Paws. Shelly, Mr. Paws? A snort of laughter from Travis. Shelly frowns. It seems she's wondering whether or not coming all the way out here was a good idea after all. Heather, well yeah, that's who Cynthia's spending all her time out there with. Mr. Paws, the dog. Mr. Paws this, Mr. Paws that. She won't shut up about him. Shelly, and have you seen this? Um, Mr. Paws? Nah. Heather, oh yeah, biggest dog you ever seen. Thought he was a black bear at first, he's so big. He gets spooked if anybody other than Cynthia goes near him, though. Runs right off. With a final glance toward the tree line, Heather turns to go inside. 
Well, you better come on in. I got a room ready. We'll see if you experts can tell me what's going on with my girl. When the recording resumes, we see a small bedroom with wood paneled walls and a bunk bed. We hear the sound of unpacking in the background and suspect that the camera was turned on by accident. Travis, supernatural creature my ass, what a shit show. We need to call Child Protective Services, not the Ghostbusters. What kind of parent lets a seven-year-old play in the woods with some mangy dog all day? Shelly, it's not easy being a single mom, Travis. We'll know more when we talk to Cynthia. Travis, and if she doesn't try to eat us first, she's probably got rabies. Shelly, keep your voice down. Hey, is that thing on? The film goes dark. Slowly, a sunlit patio with the same yellow wood paneling comes into focus. The furniture and carpet have the style and color of the late 1970s. The remains of a light meal sit on a wicker coffee table in front of Heather and Shelly, who are discussing Shelly's magazine and her plans to finally go audiovisual. Without warning, the conversation stops and Shelly covers her hands with her mouth. And Heather, here she comes. Through the patio screen, the camera zooms in on a tiny figure skipping along the tree line. She has the same wide mouth and dirty blonde hair as Heather, but it is matted and full of twigs. Mud covers her hands and bare feet, and we know this must be Cynthia. As she approaches, she swings a one-armed teddy bear and whistles a hissing, high-pitched tune, almost like a dog whistle. She freezes when she sees the visitors and their camera. Heather. Cynthia, sweetie, this is Shelly from Mommy's Favorite Magazine. She's come a long way to see you. Cynthia, Mr. Paws is hungry. And Heather, Mr. Paws can wait, honey. Why don't you have a seat and say hi to our guests, huh? Cynthia, Mr. Paws is hungry now. Cynthia pushes into the kitchen and grabs a trash bag nearly as big as she is. With a terrible sense of purpose, she shovels the remains of Shelly's meal and any other edible things she can grab into the bag then drags it out the door. Heather stares, petrified, but Shelly springs to her feet. Shelly, Cynthia, I'd like to meet Mr. Paws, is that okay? Cynthia, Mr. Paws doesn't like strangers. The recording wobbles as Travis follows Shelly, who is herself following Cynthia as she drags the trash bag full of refuse toward the woods. Cynthia scowls and bares her teeth at her pursuers, but doesn't otherwise interact. She moves alarmingly fast for a child, Shelly. Cynthia, Cynthia, wait. The trees in front of us are tall poplars with few lower branches, making the space between them appear as an inky, lightless void. There is little undergrowth, but something appears to be moving in the ferns. Travis is trying so hard to keep up that he doesn't notice it at first. When he does, he seems to forget about the camera. Travis, um, Shelly, Shelly, Stop. Hey, don't get any closer. Heather wasn't exaggerating when she claimed Mr. Paws was the size of a black bear. The lumbering, furry thing ahead slowly looks toward the camera, which catches the whites of its eyes. Cynthia charges toward it, nuzzles it, and leaps on its back with her trash bag prize. We hear a low, slow growl as Mr. Paws runs off and seems to merge into the dark forest. Finally, even the light in Cynthia's tangled blonde hair is swallowed in the shadows beneath the trees. The camera drops. We only see the high poplar branches swing in the breeze and hear Travis's wheezing breaths. Travis, oh holy fuck. It is twilight on the patio when filming resumes. The blue bug zapper light gives Heather a ghostly appearance as she lights another cigarette and stares accusingly at Shelly. Heather, Cynthia's never stayed out this late before. It's cause you all are here. Shelly, ma'am, we didn't mean... Travis, why we should call the police. Heather, that's not gonna happen. Those government bastards might try to take my girl from me. Cynthia will come back, you'll see. She always does. We hear a howl from the darkness followed by a child's high-pitched laughter. Heather points at the camera. Heather, do you mind to turn that damn thing off already? Shelly, go ahead, Travis, it's fine. I guess we'll turn in for the night. The screen goes black and stays that way for quite some time. It takes us a few moments to realize that the camera is recording once again. We hear some rustling off screen. Travis and, uh, Shelly, do you hear that? The camera focuses on a small dot of light, a keyhole. A huge black shadow cuts across its golden glow. In another part of the house, we hear a slam, 
followed by something shattering and a choked scream. We hear the twisting and turning of sheets. Shelly, Travis, did you, did you lock the door? Something large and heavy slams into the door. Shelly screams, another slam, the sound of claws raking wood. The image whirls frantically as Travis rummages for a weapon, a light, anything, a rumbling growl. The next impact splinters the door and knocks it halfway off of its hinges as a light overhead finally flickers on. We see Shelly with her back pressed against the wall and Travis approaching the door with the camera in one hand and a knife in the other. Silence. Shelly, do you think it's gonna... Travis, oh fuck. The camera whirls and we see a child's pale, dirty arms shoving open the bedroom window. Travis rushes to close it again, but a giant hairy paw knocks him away so hard he topples to the ground. From where the camera lays on its side, we see a shape as black as the night clamor through the window. Somewhere out of sight, Shelly is screaming. The shape rushes her, and the screams are replaced by wet tearing sounds. We see Travis attempting to crawl away, but he is suddenly dragged off screen except for his feet, which, eventually, stop twitching. A dark puddle spreads across the floor, and Mr. Paws lumbers into view. We listen to those heaving breaths, and observe those bright blue eyes, intelligent and mad and horribly human. We wonder if we are looking at an adult man wearing the skin of an animal, a human somehow transformed into a beast, or something else altogether. As the camera is slowly crushed, we realize that it's impossible to tell. I'll update if I learn anything more about what we just saw. In the meantime, I've got some more tapes to watch. There's a place in the backwoods of the high country where there aren't any towns or villages. It's too remote for all but the most rugged of settlers. For those who dare to venture into the dense wilderness of the frontier, they practice caution and security. No one hunts in the forest alone. It's not a very desirable location to be stranded in after the sun goes down. All of the locals know it. There's all manner of enchanted spirits and wild beasts haunting those woods after nightfall. And not all them are benevolent. The mysterious wolves which roam the forest and howl at the moon are said to traverse completely upright on their hind legs. From a distance, they supposedly bear a remarkable resemblance and the erect posture of human beings. Many hunters swear to have witnessed seeing those unnatural creatures lurking about. They are said to surround their prey in highly organized hunting packs, just like ordinary wolves. The primary difference being that they track and trap their prey from a seven-foot tall, standing vantage point. Villagers in the nearby towns are a superstitious lot and took this sinister canine legend to heart. I never gave their fanciful folklore much credence until I saw one of the feral beasts for myself. It crept around an outlying cluster of hardwoods at the edge of the woods, near the faded light of dusk. My jaw dropped and the hairs on my neck raised up. As soon as it saw me, it wrinkled its snout in an aggressive, toothy snarl. I feared that I was going to have to fend off a violent attack, but in the end, it retreated away slowly. I'll never forget the startling sight of a fully standing werewolf, massive in size, stepping backward into the safety of the tree line. What black magic sorcery or mysterious act of the Lord was this? The fierce look in its coal black eyes spoke volumes. You stay inside your territory and I'll stay within mine, was the message. Being so close to the wretched thing filled me with a chilling dread. Could I really trust that it and its brethren would hold true to the unspoken truce? I had no way of knowing, but from that day forward, I forbade my children from stepping foot into the woods after sundown. Even the most obedient children are apt to misunderstand or not take parental warnings seriously. In the back of my mind, I always carried a lurking fear of the possible consequences. Naturally, my sons and daughters failed to understand the true reason for my strict, unexplained directive. I didn't even try to tell them about the horrible abomination I'd witnessed. Being labeled a forbidden place made it even more tantalizing. I caught all of them stealing longing glances at it from time to time. The devilish mystique of an unfamiliar territory was slowly seducing them. Each day the temptation wore down their resistance a little beat more. The greeter, the opposition I raised to the damned labyrinth of beckoning trees, the heavier, their curiosity bore upon them. 
All too soon, the situation I dreaded came true. I awoke to find that my eldest two children couldn't resist the allure of the woods any longer. They had crept outside to explore it, apparently. Their beds were vacant, the candle box was missing, and the hen eggs were still uncollected from their chicken coop chores. Calling our their names at the edge of the woods proved futile. They had too much of a head start wandering the dense highlands. I gathered up my rifle and gunpowder pack for the unpleasant task ahead. An occasional drip of congealed wax upon fallen leaves confirmed their path. I was relieved to feel that it was still a bit warm to the touch. That was a sign they weren't too far ahead. By mid-morning I had picked up and lost their trail several times. Other things were active along the well-worn deer path. The disturbed leaves and brush I found wasn't proof of their presence any longer. They would have blown out the melting candle with the full rise of the sun. From there the wax trail went cold. I yelled and shouted their names until I was hoarse. Only a mocking echo bouncing off the nearby canyons answered me back. I considered doubling back to the last confirmed evidence of their trek, but an unknown force inside me kept pushing onward. In the blackest heart of the highlands, only wisps of sunlight can trickle down to the leaf-strewn floor below. I was deeper in the forest than I'd ever been into the dense wooded canopy. Suddenly, I felt a significant presence nearby. A dark entity was watching. I turned to face the same ferocious mongrel which had haunted my nightmares since the first day I saw it. This time the standing alpha leader of the pack wasn't alone. I was surrounded by a half dozen other attack-ready wolves. He snarled while the others remained silent in hierarchical respect. I had my gun at the ready but could only take out one of them before the rest pounced on me. He was the obvious choice for my musket volley. When the leader of any rank and file organization falls, the underlings often panic. Regardless, I wasn't likely to make it out of the woods alive. I thought deeply about the circumstances which led me there. I had been the one who violated the agreement and broke the rules. I was in their territory. Against every instinct I held dear, I lowered my weapon as a sign of contrition. The posture of the pack immediately changed. The alpha male stepped back slightly. Then all the others followed suit, breaking the tense stalemate. Eventually, they all fell back out of sight. To much greater surprise, my two missing children appeared from the same general direction. I surmised that the majestic wolves who walk upright had been holding them captive until I came to answer for their careless trespass. I was glad that I found a peaceful resolution to being cornered by them. I am sure there would have been a very different outcome otherwise. My children and I walked back home in virgin silence. No angry words needed to be spoken, nor threats made. I saw the mortal depth of fear and greater understanding in their remorseful eyes. Never again would I have to worry about them or their younger siblings wandering into the Highland Woods. No doubt they would impart the importance of honoring the territorial border with my two youngest children. It was a valuable lesson for all of us. It took me 12 nights to figure out what the littlest werewolf wanted from me. I'd stand in the sheep pasture at twilight and glare at her as she crouched in the sagebrush, her unblinking golden eyes tracking my every step. My old sheepdog Zeus would bark and claw in the red dust, agitated and protective yet too lazy to make chase. But the wolf never tried to steal a sheep. She never moved at all. At least, not unless I broke her gaze and looked away for a moment. Then I'd glance back, and she'd be gone, in an instant disappearing into the pinion and juniper trees of the Hummingbird Hills, that sunless thicket where the less benevolent of the gods were rumored to lurk. I'd stand quietly and listen to her mournful howl bring down the moon, a bee wailing that echoed through the canyons and vibrated the dry grass beneath my feet. Kill the white man seemed to be her lament carried on the cool night winds. Kill him. Her words confounded me. There were certainly no white men around here. Living in a remote pueblo in the desert canyonlands of northern Arizona, the only white men I ever encountered were the occasional sheriff's deputy or government agent, well-intentioned Mormon missionaries promising a marvelous afterlife, or anthropologists fascinated by our complex pantheon. All of these visitors were politely escorted away, 
Even still, the presence of the little wolf bedeviled me, for I quickly understood that I was the only one who had yet seen or heard her. A real wolf, Papa, my youngest daughter Ariadne asked me one morning, as I told her and her sisters the story over breakfast. Or a creature quite like it, I said, finishing my cereal with one hand, stirring sugar into my coffee with the other. I reckon there's a breath of something primate and conscious in there. What makes you think she's not all wolf? My middle daughter Antiope asked. She crouches in the same place every day and never looks at the sheep. She watches me alone, with the saddest of eyes. Her ears flick at the sound of my voice, and her own howl is unusually expressive and forlorn. But a human can't howl, my oldest daughter Arachne declared. Maybe she's a god in disguise outside winking at her, or their half-human child, the daughter of a wolf god born to a human mother who feared it so much she abandoned it in the desert to die. My wife Leah suddenly dropped her coffee mug. It shattered on the floor, and I turned in surprise. I hadn't noticed her there, standing at the stove, listening to the conversation. What do you think it is, Mama? Antiope asked her unconcerned. Leah shrugged and took a sip of her coffee from the mug in her hands. I looked, but saw no broken mug. I blinked, figuring I'd only imagined the loud smash and the fragmented splinters of earthenware. Isn't the Fish and Wildlife Service reintroducing gray wolves around here? She said. They're trying to clear the overpopulation of deer at the Grand Canyon. Maybe one of those wolves wandered across. Maybe, I agreed, but this one speaks to me, I think. Just like Auntie Cassandra, Ariadne said, she hears the wind speak to her in human words. It makes her twitch and fall down asleep, and behind her eyes, she sees the faces of the gods who make the wind. Cassandra's mind is very ill, Leah said. Leave her alone, and leave the wolf alone. If it is a god, it's best not to meddle in whatever task it must complete. Would anyone like some coffee? The brewer steamed and hissed, the radio buzzed and hummed the morning news and the weather reports. I had to admit, I couldn't dispute my wife's assertion, but I didn't want to believe it. I couldn't get the narrative out of my head of the little cub with a mortal mother and a divine father, a child with an uncanny inclination towards turning canine when the moon rose in the sky. It brought a little spark of thrill to the slow turn of life, the life of society's outliers out among the barren rust-colored desert. Letting my imagination run wild, I thought of my son somewhere far from home being cared for by the spider god who called him her beloved. I gazed at my daughters, young and vulnerable, yet so untamed and wild. I thought of the human mother who might at this moment be wondering where her little, half-divine wolf cub was huddling, imagining her child lost among the old trees and the voices of the night. Was she scared? Was she hungry? Was she shivering with cold in these crisp autumn evenings after the sun went down? yearning for the familiar warmth of home. I loved my own children more than anything. I understood that primal, animalistic urge to protect one's defenseless offspring. My heart softened towards the staring and unmoving cub. Her origins were an enigma to me. But, were she my own daughter, I'd certainly hope another parent would be there to keep a vigilant eye on her and listen to her unspoken desires. The next evening, I began to bring small scraps of mutton and elk jerky to the wolf girl. She'd cower if I walked too close, pulling back her lips to show me her gleaming white fangs. Kill the white man, she rasped in a voice like radio static. First you must eat, I whispered affectionately. Then you may kill whatever ghosts you happen to find. I was often close enough to smell her, only briefly. She carried the sweet scent of burning sagebrush and tobacco in her fur. Once, I thought I saw a single tiny glistening tear emerge from her sunken eye and roll down her snout. Kill him, she howled from afar. Kill what man, I asked. There is no white man here, only me, and I'm the only one who knows you're here. Why won't you let me help you? She stared, silent as ever, but she didn't run from me that evening. Encouraged by her sprouting interest in being nurtured, I turned up a few old baby blankets. Within their folds, I tucked bits of fragrant lavender and soothing catnip. I left them under a pinion tree near the border, to the dense forest of the hummingbird hills. I'd taken care of her hunger and her shivering. All I could do now was try to heal her loneliness, to take her somewhere warm and inviting and reunite her with the family 
from whom she surely must have been forced to depart. But that was not to be. On the twelfth day, I was paid a visit by a deputy of the county sheriff. I was spending a lazy autumn day in the kitchen garden, checking the tall stalks of blue corn for ripeness, pulling back the husks to get a swift glimpse of their deep indigo kernels, their rare beauty, as hidden and lustrous as a dragon's cachet of jewels. For a moment, I imagined myself the hero of that story, slaying the dragon and stealing its bounty. He didn't see me watching him as he drove up the winding road that spiraled around the mesa on which our pueblo was perched. His clunky white pickup truck rumbled and roared across the ancient bridge of bones that connected Mercury Mesa to Jupiter Mesa and followed the dusty red road to where I stood. A fat husk gripped too tightly in my hands. Deputy Babbitt got out of the truck and faced me, covering the gun on his hip, watching my hands avoiding my eyes. Babbitt didn't much care for people like me. We didn't much care for deputies. Sir, he nodded, trying to look casual in a place so backward and foreign to a white man. He swept off his sun-bleached cowboy hat and leaned against the hood of the truck, stubbing out his cigarette with his pale leather boot. How's everything going around the farm? How's your wife and that beehive of daughters? I looked over my shoulder to make sure my family was safe inside the house. I remembered then that Leah had taken the children along to see the traveling carnival in Kanab. Zeus was probably asleep in the sheep pasture. Mr. Beartooth, Babbitt said when I didn't answer. I've heard a rumor that you've spotted a wolf nearby, one that's stalking your sheep and eating your food. Rumor, I said, gossip, certainly. There haven't been wolves around here for 50 years. You ought to know that. Who told you I'd seen a wolf? Cassandra Maldonado. She won't speak to me, but I heard her young daughter's gone missing, and I believe the girl may have been dragged away by the woof your kids are telling everyone about. Poor Cassandra. Her daughter was all she'd had, but if there was anyone who craved utter solitude, it was Cassandra. She lived a hermetical life on the dusty outskirts of the Pueblo, with only her cows for company, and we all assumed that's the way she wanted it. I myself had always been uneasy around her, never sure what to say or where to look when I'd bring her gifts of surplus peaches, and she'd begin to yelp and swear and convulse. But we all avoided her back then. We told ourselves it was what she needed. I was vaguely sorry to hear her child was missing. I'd forgotten she had a child. I turned my back on the sheriff's deputy and back to my corn. I've told you all I know, I said to him, my fingers idly digging at the brittle husks, not knowing even what they were doing. I hoped he wouldn't see my hands shaking. I think it's time for you to leave, deputy. Babbitt was quiet for a long moment. Well, I have the feeling there's something else you're not telling me, he said, his voice as low and discordant as a rattlesnake's tail. I clenched my jaw. I waited. We opened and closed a corn husk again and again, entwining my fingers in the gossamer green tassel, feeling the taut bulge of milk beneath the swollen kernels. I glanced at the garden shears on the opposite side of the garden, imagining the crunch they'd make as they sheared off the man's nicotine-stained fingers. There was a sound of a door opening and closing. I turned around again. Deputy Babbitt was dragging a brownish-gray bundle from the bed of his truck. His hands and his white jacket were stained with its blood. I knew right away what I was seeing. Its fur was matted and dirt-clogged, its caved inside was stained with a rust-colored smudge. Its tongue hung out of a mangled snout, and its amber eyes stared straight ahead, into my own eyes, as they always had, never breaking that line of sight. Babbitt dropped it heavily on the ground, and finally stared at me forthright. Don't you ever lie to me like that again, he hissed into my face. I've just done you a favor by shooting this dangerous animal, and now I expect to be thanked, not deceived. I put my life in danger for your flock, for your wife, for your children. You don't have to like me, but you do have to respect me. That's all I ask. There are worse predators out there than this one, and you have no idea what I've done for you. To let you let you people quarantine yourselves up here without interference. My family has lived in Arizona for a century, civilizing this barren dust bowl, trying to guide your people into the modern world, and all we get back from you is suspicion and scruple. Now don't you dare take my protection for granted and ruin it for the ones that want progress and improvement. 
Don't you dare violate that tenuous trust. I've been generous enough to give. Even as I overlook your flaws, don't you dare. I glared straight ahead, our faces so close I could smell the remains of his cigarette and his white mustache. I did not sever my gaze with his. I thought of the littlest werewolf, speaking through the silence, pleading with her eyes. He couldn't hold for long, he kicked the wolf's body with his white boot. So that's all you've got? He growled. No thanks, no gratitude. Does this dead menace mean nothing to you? You are nothing to me, I said. One day you too will lie in the sand, but you won't get a burial nearly as grand as hers. Your mouth will fill with dust and cornmeal. Your tongue will be replaced by a scorpion's tail. Your eye sockets will be the nursery for a rattlesnake's eggs. Your ribs will be made hollow by the sun and will whine in the wind like a bone flute. Is that a threat, he said, backing away, or a curse? Neither, I said. It's an expectation, an aspiration, an invocation. He gritted his teeth and then he turned, smashed his hat back onto his head, and got into his truck. I waited for him to cross the bone bridge before I turned and crouched at the side of the little wolf girl, another father's daughter. My pollen-covered fingers stroking her ears, still soft, still listening to words carried on a wind that blew from another world the land of the dead. I lay there until the sun set, then I carried her down the mesa and buried her at the edge of the sheep pasture, the place where I'd first seen her, waiting, quietly begging me to listen to her wolf words. I smudged her nose and forehead, with all the corn pollen remaining on my hands as one does to both the newly dead and the newly born, as I had done to all my children, and later to my father. Zeus watched for a while, sitting on his haunches, before he finally let out a low, ululating howl that echoed off the hills and resonated through the canyons and reverberated in the craters of the luminous silver moon. He led me back home where Leah and the children had already gone to bed. In the night I woke, feeling as if I'd heard my name whispered in a dream. I rolled over to watch the moon out the window, but the clouds had gathered, covering it in a pearlescent shroud. Hephaestus, a voice called to me into the stillness in the holy dark, a voice that sounded like Cassandra's. Hephaestus, she was pregnant. Too young to be, I said, and could not contain my tears. She was only thirteen. Too young, I said again, too gentle to endure the immorality straight up. Was she, was she born human, not a wolf? Fully human, Cassandra whispered, deeply loved. Who transformed her? The voice was silent. I looked down at Leah asleep next to me, untroubled by the whispers. I wondered if I had only dreamt the conversation, for immediately it was lost in the haze of linear time, just like the coffee mug that had never shattered. Soon I too slept again, a restless doze that allowed my mind to walk barefoot across the desert sands, leaving no footprints, wandering under a swiftly spinning sky whose stars had no names. The following morning, I found the body of Deputy Babbitt at the far end of the sheep pasture. He had been scalped, flayed, and disemboweled, his entrails making spirals and curlicues in the dust. His throat had been torn out, left in bloody tatters of oozing, putrefying shreds of flesh. His genitals had been torn almost completely from his body, left dangling and mangled. His toenails and fingernails had been yanked out of their bleeding cuticles. His mouth, open in an eternal scream of agony, was stuffed with dried sagebrush and cactus thorns. His ribcage, splayed open to reveal a half-eaten heart and lungs, made a wailing keening noise that swelled and receded with the icy wind. I looked at my fingertips, again dusted with corn pollen, then I wiped my hands on my jeans and did not touch the dead man's forehead. From afar I felt myself being watched. I turned. Mm -hmm. Watching me from the other side of the fence was an enormous wolf with green eyes that wept human tears. Its fur was black all over, like a person in mourning. It gazed at me not with fear or caution as the young one had, but with attentive rage. Who are you? I asked, holding its gaze, my hand on the hunting knife at my hip. It ought to be your wife lying there in the dirt, rotting alongside the man, said the black wolf in a voice like the whispers I had heard in the clouded night. Your dispute is not with Leah, I said. She's done nothing wrong. Leah never asked my permission to transform my daughter, said the black wolf. She acted hastily, 
and by the time I found out what happened, she could not undo what she had done. My Ida didn't have to die. She didn't have to suffer in the cold night alone and starving, wondering why this perversion had been put upon her. I don't understand, I said. I loved my daughter. I loved her. She was all I had. I would have loved her baby in a way that nobody in this desert ever loved me. You've all rejected and abandoned me, forced me to live far away from everyone. You hated Ida for her slow mind and slow speech. You hated me for the way I twitched and fainted. Yet still, I had no desire to be a wolf. Magic in the hands of one with an unsound mind is perilous. But when the deputy came around talking rumors about my Ida, I transformed myself anyway to be close to my little one forever. And now it's too late. You've all killed her. The black wolf stepped closer to me. Leah stole something from me in more ways than one. She stole it to carry out her private vengeance on the white man, but my own vengeance is not complete. Warn your wife that when I see her again, I will tear her apart piece by piece. I will prolong her suffering for years as I replace her human body with this wolf's body. I refuse to become human again until I've been satisfied. Then she stood on her hind legs, becoming as tall and straight-backed as the tallest human. She bolted into the overgrown woods of the Hummingbird Hills to where the sun refused to shine. I confronted Leah that night by the fireplace. Don't keep secrets from me like that, I said softly, restraining my impatience, my indignation. I had every right, she said. It's not the first and won't be the last. Why, Leah, why did you turn Ida into a wolf? You're not a shaman or a witch. You have no right to be using magic against a child. Why would you do something so contemptible? Leah was listening to a record of Bach violin sonatas while she drank watermelon wine straight from the bottle. Its sweet smell couldn't overtake the steely scent of blood that saturated the room. She set it down hard on the wooden floor and looked me straight in the eye. I was protecting Ida. When Cassandra showed me the black moth encased in amber, a gift she'd claimed to have been given by the wolf god Whitepaws, she swore it would turn me into a wolf. I could finally kill Babbitt with no consequences, as I had wanted to do for so long. But I found that I couldn't. I had too much to lose. I have a home, and children, and a job. Instead, when I saw Ida was pregnant, I gave the piece of amber to her and changed her into a wolf. I forbade her from telling her mother and I sent her out into the desert to hunt that lowlife scum. Protecting her from what? You seem to have tied a knot even you cannot untangle. I told you Ida was pregnant. Who do you think was the father of her child? And who do you think is Ida's father too? The deputy, I said, suddenly feeling small and simple for not making the connection until now. Ida had always been more light-skinned than the rest of us, and we had mistrusted her because of it. What an abomination for a man to beget a child on his own daughter. I gave Ida a gift, Leah continued, the gift of carrying out vengeance, the only gift I could give that would match the generosity of a wolf god. I would have wanted that privilege for myself years ago. I was younger than she when Babbitt raped me, and my rage had a knife's edge. I raged because I was powerless, and his power is so unbounded that he killed Ida anyway, not to protect himself from the accusation, but because he could. Eventually, he would have found some other girl to victimize, and then... What would we do? Turn all our girls into a colony of bats? Would you want to see your own daughters hanging upside down in a cave all day, unable to live a beautiful life in the sunshine? I admit I used magic that did not belong to me and which I had no right to try to control. But you need to understand that I only intended to protect the girl. I told Ida she must be the one to slay Babbitt, to force him to look into her eyes in the moment of his death to regret his actions to understand that the consequences were finally catching up with him. And once he was dead, I promised Ida I would find a way to make her human again. She never had the heart to kill him, I said. Too gentle a soul, abused until she had no will of her own. Too meek to stain her teeth with blood. Her blood is on your hands. He faced us, Leah said, again changing the subject. What about your role? Ida was begging you to kill the deputy, the white man, the white man in the white truck with the white hat and the white boots. Why didn't you do it once you saw that she had failed to take him down? He was here the day she was shot. You didn't tell me. 
but I could smell his scent all over the ground when I arrived home. Nobody would have seen you cut his throat. Nobody would have known. The gods would have devoured the body and protected you from the consequences, had you asked. Why didn't you avenge me, avenge Ida, avenge all his past and future victims? Why didn't you listen to her cries? You overlooked her human desires and ignored what she was saying with her human voice. You treated her like some spoiled household dog who only wants a bed and a belly rub. Don't lay the burden of shame on me, I said. You misled me. You told me she was an ordinary wolf and to leave her alone. How could I have known Ida would fail? Clearly, I'm not as clever or powerful as you think me to be. Leah scowled. A child is dead, she said, and all you care about is shifting the blame to anyone but yourself. You sound an awful lot like Babbitt right now. You're wrong, I fumed. I have been humbled, Leah, and I believe you are the merciless one. You use magic stolen from a vulnerable mother and left a little girl in a body she didn't want. You forced a child to fight your battle and now Cassandra will be forever stalking you. She has her canine stare fixed on you, on your every move. One day, she'll pounce and take her revenge on you and she will tear you apart piece by piece, year after year, and replace your body with a wolf's. And I will never be powerful enough to protect you. I can't. The blanket around her shoulders fell. She quickly pulled it back up, but not before I saw a flash of the gray-brown of a wolf's furry foreleg, hastily stitched onto the bleeding stump of her elbow with greasy sinew. I looked up from the fresh wound. I met her eyes, and she glared back at me, eyes fiery up, but I could not hold her gaze. I bent my head, and I hid my face in my hands. Play Summer, 1986. We were driving through the Rocky Mountains on our way to Array. There were three of us, Steve, Danny, and me. We were young, dumb, and fed up with what life was really like after college. So we bought some matches, packed a cooler of beer, food and beer, and loaded up my trusty Toyota with all the fixings for a classic camping trip. This trip was supposed to shake up the devastating monotony of our daily life, and shake us up it did, to the very core. Right before we were getting ready to set out, Steve's mom ran out of the house and told him he should take their newly adopted family dog, Luna, for safety. Steve was hesitant. He didn't want to have to look after the dog, especially if we were going to be drinking. And she was a big dog, a mixed husky, and something else. Great Dane, maybe. But his mom insisted until finally he broke and agreed to take her. Luna looked up at him with her warm blue eyes and seemed to smile. Steve sighed and said, I guess I'll sit in the back with her. No, no, I said, walking over and patting her head. Let her sit up front with me. She wagged her tail. Most of the car ride went smoothly, and we sang along to the radio, mooed at cows, and waved at, or flipped off, motorcyclists. But as we neared our destination, and the sun sank behind us, leaving us in a thick, almost tangible darkness, we started to become jumpy, pointing at strange shadows and swift movements. Luna, though, was curled up and asleep beside me, unaware of our growing fear. The sky was covered in big roiling clouds that blew swiftly towards the east, covering and revealing the full moon at random intervals. By now, we were the only vehicle on the road. My headlights barely sliced the darkness around us as we weaved our way through the mountains. The isolation, the darkness, the silence, it was all so crushing. Steve, I thought you said we would be there before the sunset. I told you we shouldn't have stopped at that bar. Nah. Oh, Danny, I didn't know we'd be there for that long. You wouldn't stop your stupid pool game. And I won, come on, it's not that dark out. Would some money make you happy? You ash. Hey, cool it, look, what the hell is that? I slowed the car down to a stop, trying to see what was blocking the road, but the light from the cloud-covered moon was too dim. What the hell? Danny, I whispered as she rolled down her window. I was apprehensive, worried this was someone's attempt to rob us, or worse. I had heard all the urban legends before. I just want to see better. She stuck her head out of the window, and I rolled a little bit closer. Luna, feeling the change in the car's movement, lifted her head and sat up, panting. It's a, oh shit, I think it's a dead deer, you guys, gross. Danny retreated back inside the car and rolled the window back up. Who the hell just leaves something like that on the road? Assholes, Steve said, then leaned forward. Hey man, think you can drive around it? Yeah, yeah, I think I can. 
I approach the thing, now seeing the antlers and the gleaming black eyes. Open, staring, dead. It blinked. I yelped and jerked the steering wheel, sideswiping the mountainside. Shit. What the hell, man? A cow mare, it's alive. What? That fucking deer, it's alive. As I spoke, the deer lifted its head and bleated. The sound echoed around the chasm. We all jumped and watched as it pushed itself up, up, up until it was standing on its hind legs like a man, but uncanny grotesque. Mesmerized, we sat unable to move as the thing walked over to us, slowly, decidedly, as if walking on two legs was a thing this deer did often. It leaned down next to Danny's window, its face so close to the glass that steam from its nose fogged it up. A low noise rang out through the car. Luna was growling, her hackles raised, crouched in the seat next to me a bang. The thing rammed its head into the window, chaos erupted. Danny screamed, piercing high. Luna started barking, booming, persistent. Steve yelled, telling me to fucking go, just go. I, shaking, struggled with the clutch, stalling, 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 bang. The window cracked and the thing starting making an incredible sound. It sounded like a weird, screeching, guttural form of laughter. Finally, the clutch caught and I sped the hell out of there. I checked the rear view and saw the thing standing on two legs looking after us. Suddenly, it leapt forward and began running after us. It ran on two legs instead of four and it was fast. So fucking fast and I drove as fast as I could on that winding mountain road. But, despite my speed, the thing still caught up with us. It tapped its antlers on my window and screeched that weird laughter again. Then it pointed at front of us, bared its teeth and stopped. The abruptness of how quickly it disappeared caught me off guard. Watch out! I snapped forward, and what I saw made me slam on my brakes. A house, a fucking house in the middle of the road. I guess it was more of a cottage or a hut, but there it was, clear, vivid, in front of us. Danny was audibly crying in the back seat, repeating what the fuck, over and over to herself. Steve was breathing heavily, like he had just run a marathon. Luna was whimpering beside me and scratching at the window. Nausea enveloped me, made worse by the vibration from my pounding heart. Seriously, what the fuck is going on? I think I'm going to puke, man. Don't fucking open that door, just back up, turn around, man, let's go back. Towards that thing, no fucking way, man. Well, if you didn't fucking notice, there's a goddamn house in front of me. Just drive through it, come on. No, 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 no. Danny, calm down, it's okay, we're okay, we'll be okay. Danny simpered and started sobbing again. Shut the fuck up, Danny, please. Guys, guys, look, oh God, I the house, it was spinning slowly and stopped when the front of it pointed directly at my car. The door to the house slammed open, emitting a sound like a gunshot. A single point of light emerged from the darkness inside the house. A candle and holding it up was a figure stooped over, covered in what looked like blackened rags. It began to approach us, lurching forward swift then slow, then swift, again. It was making this eerie, deep staccato sound. Are you for real right now? Steve was leaning forward, peering out the windshield. Let's go, reverse. The thing is behind us, on run it over. L look, look, Danny screamed. The stooped figure was now running at full speed straight at us. It slammed onto my hood and we could finally see that it was an old, old woman, covered in wrinkles, completely bald with sharpened yellow teeth. She was moaning and moaning. My she crawled up the hood, opened her mouth and licked the glass, leaving a trail of blood-colored saliva. Luna went wild, barking, foaming at the mouth, throwing herself at the door. Please, 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 back up, back up now. I slammed my foot on the gas, but my tires made a sickening sound and the smell of burnt rubber slipped into the car. It's behind us, it's fucking behind us. I turned back to see the deer's head, teeth still bared, peering at me from the back window. Shit, fuck, what do we do? What do I do? Luna, no! With a final lunge, Luna forced the door open. It sounds shocking, but she was such a large dog and strong. A powerful wind pick it up and the roiling clouds dispatting, allowing the light from the full moon to illuminate the scene in front and behind, use. Luna was as still as a statue, slightly crouched, poised to leap. The hackles on her back quivered, and a single thread of drool spun itself down from her mouth. She began to shake, faster and faster. It looked like she was having a seizure. The old woman and the deer thing were both looking over at her, 
Something strange was happening to Luna. It looked as if her limbs were breaking, elongating. Her snout narrowed, sinking closer to her face. She rose up onto her hind legs, humanoid, and howled up towards the sky before locking eyes with the hag on my car. In the blink of an eye, Luna was on the woman, ripping her away, shaking her to and fro in her jaw like a ragdoll. Luna flung the woman towards the house and she struck it with some force and didn't get back up. The house and the woman vanished in a puff of smoke. Luna turned towards the thing behind us. It screeched, raising itself up to its full height, challenging her. Luna howled again, then licked her fangs. The thing took two steps towards her before turning tail and fleeing down the road, Luna giving chase. They both ran on two legs, instead of four. We sat in total silence for a few moments until I leaned over and slammed the passenger side door closed. Um, uh, I think Danny passed out. I turned to look at Steve. He looked at me. Let's get out of here, man. We got two miles before the thunk, thunk, thunk beneath us. Couldn't be ignored any longer. A flat tire. I pulled over and we eyed the darkness around us, paranoid. I'm not changing it. I'm not going out there, Steve said loudly. Don't worry, there's no spare. Uh, what? I took it out to make room for all the camping stuff. Are you fucking kidding me? Nope. Well, what the hell do we do now? I didn't know. Suddenly, like magic, like a miracle, headlights appeared behind us. A godsend. A car. I hope they're normal. Me too. Should we tell them? We locked eyes again. No. If they bring it up. Maybe. If it's a cop. Definitely not. He'll think we're high. The car rolled up beside us. It was totally black with tinted windows. The window rolled down, and behind it sat a middle-aged man. He looked tired, maybe sad. Need some help? Oh, thank God. Steve whispered. Yes, flat tire, don't have a spare. Well, that's dumb, the man said. You should always carry a spare, always. Never know what could happen. Lucky for you, I think I have one that will fit your car. You joking? The man shook his head and hopped out of his car. He was dressed sharply, black suit, black tie, black shoes, all covered by a trench coat. Come on, you can hold the flashlight for me. I hesitated, then exited the car. What happened here? He pointed to the window next to Danny's head. Oh, um, it's been like that for a while. Dumb neighbor kid hit it with a baseball. Uh-huh. The man nodded, and her. Tired, just tired, we've been driving for a while. Driving where? Meet trees, hurry for camping. Nice place. We've heard. Say, the man said, releasing the jack. Job done. Seen anything weird tonight? My heart sped up and I looked around us half expecting the deer or the woman or Luna to come sprinting towards us. What do you mean weird? Oh, I don't know anything out of the ordinary. Mum, no, why? Oh, no reason, just heard some spooky tales. Tales? That the natives who used to live around here would tell. What tales? The man stood up and dusted his hands off on his coat. Well, he said, ignoring my question. You're all set. You're about 20 minutes out from Uray, and two hours from the sunrise. I'd advise you get a move on. Never know what might be stalking you out there. I'm headed the same way, actually. I can drive behind you if you like. A muffled yes came from inside the car, and we both looked up to see Steve nodding voraciously. Yeah, that would be great, actually. The corners of the man's mouth twitched a bit as he nodded, sliding back into his car. We drove to Ure without incident and as soon as we hit the city, the man in the car behind us flashed his brights twice, then flipped a U-turn, speeding back down the way we came. I thought he said he was going this way, I said, looking in my rear view. Who cares, let's get a hotel room and leave first thing tomorrow morning, Danny said. She had woken up as we were driving towards Ure. We filled her in on the strange man and how he helped us, but she was still spooked and jumpy. And we did just that. We didn't dare camp in the wilderness or even leave the relative safety of the town. On the way back to civilization, we swore to never tell anyone what happened. It was too weird, uncanny, horrifying. Steve was silent, afraid of what his mom might say or do about Luna. We made up some story about how she had fallen over a cliff after chasing a deer. Poor Luna. We did stop for an hour around the area it happened, and called out to her, but to no avail. We never saw her again. 
It's been years since this happened and I'm old now. The three of us lost touch after we returned from the trip, but vowed to keep this secret to our death. Last I heard, Steve died from a heart attack and Danny was diagnosed with stomach cancer. I figured it's about time I shared my tale. Maybe it'll help me make some semblance of sense out of it. In the end though, I don't know if those things were protecting us from her or if she was protecting us from them. I guess I'll never know. Sometimes, late at night, when I hear howling, I like to imagine it's Luna out there somewhere running free in the wild. Or 